Warning. Please be advised. I truly desire that you read my book called, The Divine Secret Garden, Forbidden Knowledge, Children of the Harvest before you read this content. Otherwise this content will either make you angry or fearful. My intention is to reveal the lost knowledge of the good news and not the fearful dogma that has been passed down, which intimates the idea that most will be destroyed by a supreme being called God. The following work is not going to be easy to handle. I am not claiming absolutism in my work I am only presented ideas to allow the mind to operate in a different mode. This information is going to reveal a hidden secret that will lay out the groundwork to illustrate the overwhelming possibility, that our world and cosmos was created and conquered by a race of fallen angels, under the guise of what we may call alien gods, a very long time ago. And from that time forward Earth has been under the administration of fallen spirits, wearing costumes such as reptilians, greys and a whole host of demonic rulers, and yes even their human costume. They are deceiving the entire world using a fallen system called the illusory holographic simulation matrix, while using the ancient writs such as the Christian Bible and many other religious and secular writings to manipulate the world. These beings are war-minded bloodthirsty, anarchists that call themselves, Lord Gods, and they have children stationed on this planet that live amongst the children of the Father. See the Divine Secret Garden, Book 1. Now read and understand this parable that Jesus Christ revealed, in it will reveal the secret of the ages. It is important to understand that the Bible along with other ancient literature was created as a mixture of truth and error, right and wrong, good and evil. It doesn't mean that some of the text was not accurate, or that its history may be incorrect, it simply means that it was designed to deceive people into believing a false spirit, that is an artificial spirit. Matthew 13:24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. It is necessary for you to see how all of this took place, and how it is still functioning even during our time. The parable above has a twofold meaning. The message that is being sent was during the time when Jesus Christ walked this earth where he was teaching the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven until the supplanter, a second Christ or Antichrist was brought in. The mystery that he revealed came in the form of words, these words were called seeds. Thus, Jesus was sowing seeds of the good word. From this time forward this word that was revealed was taken and later added into the book of books or what we call the Bible, which is has a hidden meaning, revealing Babel. The word Babel from ancient Hebrew comes from the root word Baal meaning to mix, mingle, confuse, or confound. Its signature is simply barrel. It literally comes from the root to mix or confuse. Now we can begin to understand the secret of what Jesus was revealing. There is an alternative meaning to this parable also and it implies exactly as to what Babel or Bible really represents. The problem is. Many forgot the warning of this parable in that what Jesus was warning was that another seed, word was going to be planted side by side with the original seed, word. The Bible was not going to ever be the original mysteries spoken of by Jesus, but a mixture of truth and error. Now understand the mystery. The seed has a twofold meaning, the seed is the word of Christ as well as it is the children of the father and mother. When the seed was first planted, it was pure, like a newborn child, later the enemy came and planted a new seed side by side with the original seed. They did not, I repeat, did not completely remove the original seed, word, they let it remain. 
meaning both seeds and versions would appear in the same foundational format to eventually produce the barrel. What this means is the Bible is not, I repeat is not the infallible word of truth, but a mixture of truth and error, wheat and tares. Jesus warned us about this in these parables. The Bible can be used to find truth, seeking for the source of all truth, but it is barrel confusion. And it is not just the Bible, but also the Quran, the Talmud and all other accepted religious faith texts linked with secular texts and history. They have all been tampered with using this same formula, that is mixing truth with error. Now the second fold meaning is, the seed are the children of the father, and the enemy came and planted another seed, and that seed was a race of beings that we term alien, angels, these were extraterrestrials that came to this realm due to their exile from their world, that is dimension. And many of them incarnated alongside humans, but they were not human, yet appeared in every way as a human. And the two would grow side by side until the harvest or separation that comes at the end of every grand cycle or the end of the ages. Now read closely, 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Why would anyone need to divide the word of truth? Because it is mixed with error. It is not infallible, one must separate the wheat from the chaff within the word. This is because it was reseeded with a foreign seed that is deadly poison. Therefore, the Bible has contradictions all through it, because the enemy sowed another seed alongside with the original seed. Your job and mine is to separate the two seeds to access the truth. I Thessalonians 5:21 prove all things, hold fast, too, that which is good. This verse proves that not everything in the word is good, you must divide it and then hold on to that which is good and release the error or you will be compromised. The Bible is part of the mystery of iniquity, of the Babylon, Biblian mystery religion. It was corrupted by the enemy to become a deadly mixture of good and evil, truth and error, God and devil. And if you swallow or download every word as being correct and infallible, then you will surely have drunk of the vine of the wrath of deception and illusion. The Bible was carefully coded to have only 66 books when there were hundreds and hundreds of early and later writings, but only 66 books were allowed in the final script. The creation day for mankind has always been illustrated by the number six, on the sixth day and the theme of the Bible is designed to implant the seed of darkness via the secret code of 66 books, bringing the combined awareness to 666. 666 is the magical Hebraic number for the sun which you will learn much about in this work. It is also a genealogical bloodline that was sown in the earth as an alien race to mingle among the humans of all races, colors and creeds. This race began with their son god Ra which in Hebrew means evil, and in Egyptian, means son, which was also the title of Cain the father to this race of serpents. 666 is a code that means many things, but the code itself is alien in nature, and although it is the number of man, it is not human in origin, it is the appearance of a man, the mixing of DNA to create confusion. This bloodline has ruled this earth ever since, under the guise of God's ruling humans. This race sowed their own seed among humans and part of that seed was used as a royal bloodline, by retranslating our DNA, let us make man after our own image and likeness. This was their code to create vessels or carriers to serve them as slaves. Humanity was then given a reptilian brain engineered through a DNA splicing to mix with our own human brain. And then they separated an entire lineage using twelve races of people that were chosen due to their closer DNA blood via these gods, a group named Israel or Ishrael. This group eventually planted their seed into all humanity as a mixture, while a single lineage of blue bloods from this seed remain purer for royalty purposes. Out of this group of races there was a single individual bloodline that would rule humanity as warlords. This term Israel was about bloodline worship, and it means, men that worship the sun god Ra or evil alien race. Ish is Hebrew for male, Ra is equivalent to the sun and or evil, and El is Hebrew for God. Israel is a code for the bloodline lineage. 
Within this lineage there was a foundational code infrastructure that allowed these alien gods to incarnate into humanity due to a special frequency. We are not talking about a single race of people, we are not talking about Jews here. So get that out of your mind. There are many Jews who are also incarnated as seeds of the Divine Father and Mother. It is a race of aliens that had within their DNA something that could be used to bring in the fallen seed to mix with all of humanity that can be used as carrier hosts for the fallen gods. Remember the seeds would be sown among the original seed and grow up together until the harvest. Understand a mystery, the seed is not flesh and blood but what is implanted within the flesh. We are not talking about a specific race but carrier hosts of the computer program to allow for this nefarious seeding blend to occur. What you are about to learn is that all of this is assimilation. The earth, the people, the universe, the stars, moon, and planets etc. are all a copy reprogrammed in a virtual reality. The blue bloods protect these vessels with all their powers because they need carrier hosts for their spirit essence to reanimate among humans appearing as we are but having some ability of recall which can hold parts of their memory while the rest drink of the waters of forgetfulness. After a very long time all humans have been given this carrier essence through what we call the reptilian brain. Now they can infiltrate all races at any time they desire through what we call reincarnation or reanimation and possession. So therefore, the mystery of iniquity is when the error has been sown alongside of the truth creating a complexity that will misdirect the souls into a lower vibration of darkness, while seemingly following the light. From this point on humans have been under control of the number 322 or 322. A secret order often noted from the Masonic lodges and other secret hidden societies that are represented by this numeric combination. Multiply 3 times 22 and you have their code 66 for their code book. 66 is the numerical code for the fallen angels. 6 is the number code for humans. Together in this mix, we have 666, which means humans and angels are seeded together. But it is even more abominable, 322 is about the seeding of this alien race and when it occurred, and it was placed right inside the Bible slash barrel slash Babel. Genesis 3.22 reveals the scope of this atrocity and why I decided to reveal this dangerous and most powerful plot against humanity and yet in a great retrospective, the plot is going to turn into greatness and glory. Genesis 3.22 Now man has become like one of us to know good and evil. This was the beginning of the great abomination that begins to make desolate, yet it is reversed to make it appear good. Thus, we have the revelation that our world is a mixture of good and evil, angel and devil, children of the Father, and children of Lucifer, Satan, brought to us by the enemy to confuse and compromise. The good news or forbidden knowledge is and always has been, that there will be a separation, the truth will prevail and the enemy will be revealed during the harvest cycle that is about to occur. And so also will the true children of the father and mother be made manifest, unless they are compromised in shame and nakedness and then they must be reseeded and start again. The mystery of iniquity doth already abound, only he who now restrains will continue until he is removed, and then the wicked one s will be revealed. The implanted seed of an alien race will finally be revealed, he that hath an ear let them hear or an eye let them see. The great alien disclosure is not about helpers for humanity but the revealing of the fallen seed, the tares. The following is an attempt to reveal the wheat from the tares, by rightly dividing the truth from error and holding fast to that which is good. Before we enter the very beginning back into the garden, we need to begin to learn some secrets brought to us in the form of allegorical, metaphorical biblical stories. We are then going to slowly maneuver from the world we live in into a world of simulation. For what you are about to read is going to be mind-blowing. We must first begin this story by unraveling the error. 1. Mystery of Seduction Were the gods of the Bible our friends or were they creating an order to enslave humanity? I want to begin this revelation thesis by exposing the kindling wood of this megalithic fire that has been raging against the souls of humanity. 
although many will believe this does not affect them, because many believe they are not linked to the Bible program. However I find that it is important to reveal exactly how a book such as the Bible can be manipulated to rearrange our DNA and to reveal that this program affects every human on this planet whether they know it or not. The Bible is only one DNA program being presented here to manipulate the mind. Yet in stark contrast the Bible does have factual elements all through it, as well as many other religious and secular texts all have facts intermingled with error. If you simply accept what is being stated literally, word for word, then you will have no blocks or filters against the entire program being downloaded within your DNA. Because truth mixed with error is a dilution which leads unto delusion, which creates confusion, which is antichrist. I present the filter in the Divine Secret Garden Book, 1. Please use it before reading this material. It is the required foundation that you need to understand these mysteries. The secret to how this deception has manifested over the ages of time is due to how we as humans accept error internally without question. Often it takes tutors or teachers of religious body, as well as scientific creed, or even a governmental control mechanism to make sure you are accepting the program as they desire. Almost all religions are hierarchical in structure, to make sure the funneling of thought activates your DNA until the mind has been totally whitewashed to accept whatever is being programmed. The thesis I am about to introduce if allowed, will awaken the DNA, which has been negatively programmed to accept faulty material that is being funneled into the mind, to create trust or a belief that it is safe and or inspired. It is time to awaken to the reality that there is a myriad of sources out there that do not have humanity's best interest in tow. In fact, they want you to be deceived and led into error. What you are about to be introduced to will create a burden of sorts as the programmed DNA cells begin to vibrate at a level which could produce fear. The fear is only being activated because the programming is being challenged. The following is going to reveal a script within the Bible that was created by an alien race under the influence of a dark energy called, the Shadow Lord that you will soon learn about. Much of the Bible is a DNA coding to retranslate the soul to accept defective knowledge as well as block avenues to needed sources that would lead unto genuineness. This revelation might be offensive to many, but it is my desire to retrace events of the stories of the Bible along with other works using discernment as well as the spirit of the father and mother, to begin to recognize an actual programming that was created and then hopefully the false indoctrination might be cleansed within the DNA and washed away. I am not asking you to accept my thesis of what I am about to bring forward, all I desire is for you to open your mind to critical thinking and begin to realize that something is very wrong with our accepted world dogma. What I will reveal are discernment keys to allow you to see for yourself that maybe, just maybe what many have allowed in their thinking could be poisonous. And while it is coming under the guise of truth it might be deception appearing like an elixir. It is time to begin. The information I am going to present is based on ideological concepts via the stories that have been handed down to us via the Bible alongside with science, history and spiritual reason. I want you to recognize a familiar setting so that you will be able to see some major underlying tones of potential inaccuracies within those concepts that you may have never even considered to look at a second time, from another point of view. I am not saying that the Bible is false, in fact there is much truth in this chronicle of events, but the error is placed exactly where it is needs to be so that the truths will be erased from memory in the RNA slash DNA as it is being re-translated. As an example, this statement will reveal how this poison can be added as a mixture of how easy it is to re-translate the DNA. I am a loving God that takes his wrath upon all who are against me. Do you realize how this statement will create confusion and slowly begin to change the programming of the DNA, think long and hard about it? What I am trying to do is reveal how we are being programmed using the Bible as one of many download curriculums that have been craftily designed to switch our DNA to accept another format, which is darkness rather than light. If you ever watched the movie, The Matrix, it was shown how the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar ship, 
could download information at blazing speeds into the mind. One event in this show that comes to mind is when Trinity was loaded with the information directly into the brain, revealing how to fly a specific helicopter. This is exactly what I am referring to, information via books, texts, artifacts, paintings, sculptures and other sources or download programs, we just never realize this before simply because most are not aware of who they really are. When the man Jesus Christ was on this earth he gave a warning, a specific caution that has been ignored by many of those that claim to follow him. He revealed that in the beginning of the world the enemy came and planted a seed of tares among the wheat and this bad seed would flourish and grow right alongside the good seed, until the time of the harvest where then the separation would occur. This warning was twofold in nature. The first was revealing that the wheat were the children of the Creator, which are the Divine Father and the Mother. And the other seed was an alien race that separated themselves from the Divine Light to follow the dark energy of the law of good and evil, a duality and polarity law. And they would both live together, humans and the fallen angels inside the avatar we call flesh and blood bodies, without anyone realizing humanity was invaded by aliens. The second manifestation of this warning was to reveal that the words Jesus had spoken would be tampered with, and alongside of the facts would be the errors. The words believed to be from Christ would then become a plethora of both good and evil, truth and lie, right and wrong. And only those that held and used the decipher key could understood and could rightly divide the word of truth from the error. However most never conceived the idea that this word would be an entire mixture in one single book. The Bible contradicts itself throughout, because wherever the truth was planted the enemy also sowed the lie to be planted right alongside. This way the spirit would recognize the truth but when mixed with the lie it would become a deadly cocktail to the unsuspecting, leading them into darkness all the while believing they were following the path of light. Thus, the light was changed to darkness and few realized that Christ and the children of the father and mother were sacrificed from before the foundations of this world. Chapter 2 The Light Sacrificed by Darkness It is not important whether you believe in a certain setting or not. As an example, some may contend that the stories and people of the Bible that I am about to refer to never really existed, that they're allegories. I am not going to debate who may be real or not in this work. I simply want you to see what was prepared for the mind rather than contending with factual historical accuracy. I will tell you right now the entire world's history is mostly a lie mixed with some truth. And these people we are about to read about, many of them did in fact exist but under different aliases via different culture adaptations. It is the program you need to understand and how it was created to take you off the path of internal discernment, not whether the program itself is truth or not but how it is used in the influencing of the minds in general. A television program may be wholly false, but it is still influencing your mind. It is not about who is real or who is a character from someone's imagination, it is about the simulation and how it was prepared and how it functions. The following is going to begin an entire thesis of how a group of alien beings from other worlds entered this three-dimensional realm and what their objective was. When speaking of other worlds, I am speaking of other dimensions, not just our physical matter universe. I will eventually reveal all that we know about is basically fake. More on this towards the end of the book. Aboard this floating satellite called Earth. These aliens have been manipulating our awareness using technology that is still beyond what we have today, at least for general consumption, but we are getting very close to copying it. We are existing in a holodeck virtual reality or what Christ revealed to John in the Lost Gospel, was an artificial spirit. This theory of an artificial realm is not very strange considering this is how life of the material force is brought into existence. Matter is not real. By its very nature it is an illusion of atoms floating in space, just like planets and suns appear to float in space. It is time to recognize the great error in religion and their creative indispensable supporting dogma that matter is not real, that is why DNA is programmable. It is a holographic computer program and we are all files inside of this program. Try to stay with me, 
you will not be disappointed unless your mind has been irreparably influenced by the programming. I know these things are hard to accept, but once you begin to unravel the secret science then you will understand the Babylonian mystery sciences and religion. It is the consciousness that projects into a holographic realm of what we call matter that will reveal this operation of bending light, or crucifying light via dark matter. This world was manufactured by fallen angels and one primary seraphim named, Lucifer. These alien beings from all different species and cultures are calling themselves Lord Gods. They lived and existed in realms beyond anything humans could conceive of now. And you know what's odd we were right there with them, but most do not remember. They existed long before the foundations of this world which was created in error. They lived in different systems, on different planets, and in different dimensions of both time, space and mind. And this leads me to the beginning of when the manipulation began on this planet to deceive the entire world. Chapter 3 The Gods Begin Their Subterfuge King David as most know was known as the man after God's own heart. David is a hero of types for many biblical followers, but whose heart did David really impress? and who was his God? Was David a good man? And who was the God he was really serving? Just exactly who is it that humanity at large is serving, whether knowingly or not? David was said to be a good man, however like all humans, David was not perfect, he at times missed the proverbial mark and committed sin as the Bible contends, or should I say he was evidently not totally obedient to his God. One of the grievous sins that David committed based on the story in the Bible, has always stirred up questions in my mind. When you think of the atrocious acts conceived by God himself, one would think what David did was silly at best, and not worth even a mention, but for our sake I am glad it was declared. David was accused at one time of taking a census, or what was called, numbering Israel. Evidently as this has been explained in many religious sectors, David lacked faith so he wanted to inquire just how many were there in Israel as a possible defense against the enemy in case battle ensued. David requested of Job, which had been the captain of the host, David's military command, to take this census. However, Job was unhappy with the request, because he believed that it was not necessary for his lord, the king to do this thing, yet he followed orders and took the census upon the king's request. David had committed sin by doing this based on the biblical account. It was a sin of disobedience and faithlessness. When the punishment came down upon this griever Sarah committed by David, it was not David that was really punished, per se, even though, he was the one that committed this sin, but 70,000 Israelites were killed because David called for a census, per the story handed down. Here was the great question I have had for many years. Was David wrong or was he maneuvered into making this decision via a higher power? As you will come to realize there is a reason I ask this question. Obviously, the writers of this ancient story must have wondered the same thing because they could not get it straight as to why David committed this sin and moreover who was behind David committing this error in the first place. In 2 Samuel 24, 1 it states categorically that YHVH, the God of Israel was angry with the children of Israel, so he personally moved David to take the census. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, and number Israel and Judah. So why was this a sin? How did David commit a sin if his God was responsible for inciting him to move in this direction, as well as it states God motivated this decision because he had been angry and displeased with the Israelites? I questioned this for a very long time before I had all the pieces to fit the puzzle to reveal one of the monumental biblical, revelation deceptions. The books of the Chronicles and the Bible are a recap through events of this biblical history that had occurred up until that point, based on this saga. An area that I took a deeper look at, is the one that re-recaps the history of David numbering Israel. The book of Samuel made it crystal clear that God, that is why HVH, the supposed Eternal One, moved David to take this census. And it wasn't even done because God was angry with David. It was because he was angry with all of Israel. 
However, it came down to us as an historical event where it alluded that David did indeed commit sin in numbering Israel due to taking the census. We have a major problem, don't we? It appears David only did the bidding of his God, because YHVH was angry with Israel. This is why, when the punishment was to be given out, David did not receive the fierce punishment, but Israel did, by having 70,000 people slaughtered by pestilence. Yet the Bible declares David committed sin by following God's divinely inspired decree. Can you imagine what the editors were thinking when they had to place this into their scrolls? It had to occur to them that a just God would not tempt one to commit sin and then decree a punishment. So why did God move David to commit a sin? When trying to find the answer to this question the entire event gets clouded over by the listings in the Chronicles. When this same story was retold, notice what was said about David numbering Israel. 1 Chronicles 21, 1 And Satan stood up against Israel, and provoked David to number Israel. I had to wonder did I read this correctly, does this say Satan stood up to move David to do what the God YHVH supposedly had done, written in Samuel? Well, which one was it? Remember Chronicles was an historical recap that could have been written by anyone, but Samuel was a prophet of YHVH. Why did the editors give two opposite ends of the spectrum as to which one moved David to number Israel? Why did Samuel say it was God that moved David to number Israel and the chronicled recap revealed it was Satan? How can one incident become so scrambled in text as to what really happened if this is the infallible word? Was this a mistake? Was this an error in the translation proving at minimum more inaccuracies? Was it because the author of the Chronicles could not in good conscience say that God tempted David when God is supposed to tempt no man? What happened here? It is a classic case of contradiction, but what we need to ask ourselves is why? Why would there be such a contradiction in the Bible such as this? It is all due to what I have been writing about for years, it is called the mask of the illusion, the mark of the beast, or the Babylonian mystery religion, where we are being funneled a program to create a certain thought outcome while the opposite is true. When you place contradiction into a specific field or work and then classify that work as infallible, you have what is called a deadly DNA cocktail that will destroy comprehension in the mind if one keeps drinking this poison dot 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 without filters. What is so sad about this entire story is David came back to God after it was stated that God was very displeased with David numbering Israel, and David was filled with total shame about this supposed evil deed. David asked God to deal with this sin and he would comply with whatever the punishment was. Now why would David feel this way? First, David did not know he was moved by his God to number Israel, because God was angry with the Israelites. Or did he, it would seem David didn't understand what motivated his actions. Apparently, David never knew why his thoughts betrayed him, he did not realize that some spirit entity placed into his thoughts to do a deed that would come back to haunt him, and since he believed it was his own thoughts he accepted that he was guilty. Did God ever come back to David and say, well I tell you what David, since I moved you to take this census there is no sin and there shall be no punishment? No, he didn't. Did he come back and say, well you know David you did not commit a sin per se, it was that I was angry with Israel so I caused this to occur so Israel would get its taste of my vengeance? No, once again he did not do that. Why? What even becomes more disturbing in this episode is in the book of Samuel, it does not say that God was very displeased about David numbering Israel, it states that David's heart smote himself and then went on to explain the punishment for this sin. The reason being, if God moved David to number Israel how could God be upset with David? So, the blame simply went on David creating the belief that his heart betrayed him and then God was free of the charge. However, in the book of Chronicles it reveals that God was very displeased, because it states, Satan moved David to call for this census. The writers must have felt when putting these things down in the ancient scrolls. If God moved David to do this thing, 
then why was God angry with David? The writers were very careful not to say that God was angry, referenced within the book of Samuel, because God enticed David to do it, that it would have appeared, very hypocritical. Yet in Chronicles, it was stated that Satan moved David, so they felt it was fine to say, God was very displeased, which was a direct refutation of Samuel. Can you see the confusion even in the minds of the editors, not to mention its readers? So, what was the punishment? David had to choose between three horrible punishments. To add to this strange puzzle, Gad, a stargazer, an astrological scientist for David, which the Bible simply calls a seer. He was the one to break the news to David as to what kind of punishment that David was to receive. God evidently told the seer Gad, to go reveal the punishment for David's horrible sin. This was replicated in the account in the Chronicles also. Now astrologers, seers, witches and magicians were all basically taboo for the God of the Bible. Remember as many Christians would say, witchcraft is evil. But remember it is all a mask. David had his own personal seer, an occultist, someone with above human powers, and God would speak to this occultist to relay information back and forth to David. Are you confused yet? Why didn't God just talk to David himself? Was Gad the seer somehow closer to God than even his own specially selected king of all Israel? This is common throughout the Bible as well as religious societies throughout all time, where the rulers can dabble in the forbidden while the people are told it is evil and sin. To complete this story, finally it was given to David to choose between three punishments that God was to send forth because of this sin. David was totally sick and because of his great sin that he committed, in so much so that he could not make the choice. But why was David ever asked to make such a choice that we now know full well, it was God that moved David to do this thing. But wait, maybe it was Satan? How do we know Samuel's rendition was accurate, maybe the Chronicles got it right? The answer is, you shall know them by their fruits. Samuel stated, God was angry with Israel, and God moved David to number the armies. And who received the punishment after David complied? It was Israel. We were never told why Satan had caused David to number the armies, he just got the blame because the writers couldn't deal with this enigma. Could it be that God was trying to put all blame on David leaving himself out of the equation, in so much so that he didn't even want to choose the punishment, but allowed David to choose, so that it would appear God had nothing to do with this sin? This my friends, doesn't look good for David's God. What David chose was to allow God to make the choice because of his supposed great mercy. Yet it was God all along that wanted to slaughter Israelites and then motivated David to commit this sin. I have a huge problem with mercy as being the mind of God here. First, God inspired David to do something that God himself desired, because he was angry with Israel, unless Samuel was full of hot air. This is what the scriptures reveal. I am not seeing the mercy here, I am seeing deception. What I am seeing is, God used David to do something illegal to get God off the hook so Israel could suffer punishment, and thus not blame God for why it happened, but put the blame on David. God chose, of the three, the punishment of pestilence, which in turn killed 70,000 Israelites, all because David took a census. But then again, God could simply have said, hey, David made the choice to allow me to choose, so I am guiltless of everything. Now some may think I am taking bold license to challenge God here, how dare I? The truth is, as with any character of any play, I am simply trying to fathom the intention being played by the actors. Go ahead and replace the name God for whomever you desire, but the same reality exists. If Samuel had said, Bob moved David to take the census, no one would have trouble blaming Bob. But to say it was God, now everyone jumps back in fear and accepts the decree without challenge because the DNA slash RNA has been corrupted. This is a form of mind control. The king of all Israel made a decree where the people had to obey and follow, and then they were punished for a sin its leader committed, wherewith he didn't receive any personal punishment. And remember, 
There were three choices David could have chosen to remedy this sin, but he allowed God to choose the extermination of his own people. So, the people not even being part of this decision, as well as Job faithfully did what his king had instructed, but David did not faithfully honor his Lord, according to the story, or did he? Confused yet? This story plagued me for years, it never made any sense and yet at the same time it made perfect sense, if one would unravel the massive programming that has been engaged via the process of who and what God or the gods really are, as they wear their masks to deceive. I led with this story to begin to paint a picture that is as clear as a bell if one would simply comprehend what is being revealed. This might be the most controversial work ever written, and the most dangerous to reveal. What I am about to disclose is that the God that three of the most powerful religions worship, no matter what their holy books reveal, and the rest of the world follows via trickeries and hidden subtle decrees, is none other than an alien race of beings that play both parts of God and devil and they reign from one family. If you are waiting for lightning bolts to blast this page out of existence you will be waiting for a long time, because what I am about to reveal will literally knock your socks off and stand your hair on end. For the great God that even David was deceived enough to believe was so merciful, even though without his knowledge he was suckered into a massive deception, by his own God, was the deadly master of playing both ends against the middle. He was indeed the God of both good and evil. David's Lord, was in fact a reptilian alien from the serpentine race of the ancient followers of Lucifer after the rebellion. The writers did not make a mistake, it became very clear that someone knew what these gods were and they were not who we had believed. The writers were attempting to make it known, but you had to have the filter or else you would swallow it all. Samuel declared that the Lord YHVH moved David to commit sin and when the Chronicles speaking of the same exact event was written, it stated, it was Satan that moved David. This is what you call editor's confusion while revealing the plain truth. Chapter 4 The Confusion Begins From the very beginning back in the Garden of Eden, it has been revealed that we have been manipulated to believe the lie that God was good and the devil was evil when in fact it is all the same beings playing different roles in a large holographic computerized simulation game, called the Earth Matrix program. The Bible clearly states that God tempts no man this is the sowing of the wheat, where the Father indeed does not tempt anyone. It is revealing that the Father and Mother would never use sin or temptation to operate a deception. Only the tares, chaff that were added as the false word, and the children of Satan could play this game of duality. James 1, 13 Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil neither tempts he any man. However, Samuel said, God moved David to number Israel. And this act by David was said to be a sin. Thus, God moved David to commit sin. There is no wiggle room here. It is time that you comprehend that God and the fur there are two different presences. However, the editors of the Bible did not make this clear, and so deception is rampant. So, let's retranslate this verse above to see the truth. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of the Father, for the Father cannot be tempted with evil neither tempts he any man. It is important to understand that if you do not use the keys to crack the code you will be deceived. The father and mother never deceive or tempt anyone to sin, but God on the other hand, evidently use temptation quite often in his agenda. If you do not separate the chaff from the wheat you will be betrayed. Understand, it is true that the spiritual divine parents will never tempt their children to do evil but the one called God often in the ancient writs was not the father and mother, but part of the fallen angels, aliens, and they did use evil mixed with good to create confusion. I Corinthians 14, 33 states, For, the father, is not the author of confusion. This represents the sowing of the wheat before the tares, poison was added. But as we shall see, God on the other hand, is the author of confusion. If we go back to Babel in the time of the building of the great tower, it was revealed in scripture that God saw that humanity all spoke with the same tongue and nothing would have been beheld from them to act out their thoughts. 
it revealed that God confused the languages so that mankind could not understand one another's speech, therefore is the place called Babel, and it means, confusion. We just got done reading that the Father is not the author of confusion, however God did author confusion. These are keys you must have to set you free. Now unless we are reading two different sagas, why does it state God is not the author of confusion and yet it reveals he authored the greatest confusion upon this earth, the division of languages, in so much so that he even called it, confusion, that is Babel. Again, these are all manifestations of deceptions to reprogram the DNA and cause people to enter the confusion of fear through bewilderment. Who is this God that at a drop of a dime will change his mind, go against his own rules, yet states he never changes? Are we dealing with a multiple personality here? The answer to that question is a resounding yes, but with a twist. We are not dealing with one single God, but a family of aliens that came from another world, time and space dimension, who rebelled against the Father and Mother the creators of eternal reality, because of pride and jealousy. From the very beginning man was lured by these beings into a trap of temptation and deception that had all been set up by the knowledge of how to use good and evil to obscure. Chapter 5 The Allegorical Garden of Eden From the entrance into the garden, Adam and Eve were given access to everything their eye could see, except for this amazing and alluring structure that stood directly in the center of this supposed garden paradise. Using the simplest of terms, I want to state categorically that in the very beginning, based on the story, the male and female were being tempted with something that was in the very Garden of Eden itself. It never seems to dawn on people as to why something forbidden was in the middle of paradise in the first place. Remember the father cannot be tempted with evil nor will he tempt anyone with evil. This was supposed to be a place of holiness and righteousness as we have been led to believe down through the generations, yet right smack dab on Broadway amidst the garden, was erected the most treacherous and deceitful creation of all elements. A damning tree was supposedly planted that had within it something forbidden, and that Adam and Eve were not even supposed to touch it lest they die. This tree was placed not only in the garden, but right smack dab in the center. It wasn't to be missed. It is interesting to note that the deception was played out when humanity was living in a higher energy density when they were lured into the dark path and placed into the holographic program under the father and mother's grant. However, the biblical account is a physical recreation brought to us by the gods of the shadow to deceive us into believing that this was our origin, when in fact it was all a duplicitous duality of the lower polarity. It was in truth the origin of aliens and their ominous history. We learned that Adam and Eve were placed into a magnificent garden, called Eden. In this garden, there was provided everything that they could possibly desire. Although, something strange and anomalous was added directly in the center of this glorious perfect garden, a forbidden tree was erected for all to see. Once you begin to become more familiar with this terminology you will begin to recognize keys to the code, which will help you decipher the puzzle. The garden was earth and that which was planted was the garden of humanity. Adam and Eve represent the father and mother of humanity, in comparison to our spiritual father and the mother. The garden also consisted of the fallen angels before the fall, called the Elohim, or the gods, as well as some mysterious occupant called the serpent. The tree planted in the center represents the reptilian implant in the brain of humans that allow for both the frequency of good and evil, as well as allowing for the seed of darkness to be seeded among the seed of light, or the tree of death seeded next to the tree of life. However, in a strange twist of irony, Adam and Eve were told not to take of the forbidden tree, which represented the duality of good and evil. Then why was it there in the first place? Why present this temptation in a world that belonged to God, a theoretical perfect realm that was to be totally deprived of evil? Why is the confusion in God's holy garden? It wasn't good enough to simply allow Adam and Eve, in this story, to decide for themselves whether to take of this forbidden tree. No, as the story portrays, 
they had to fight against a serpent in the form of a snake who pressured them to access the tree. Not only was this objectionable tree in the middle of the garden, obviously appearing way out of place, as it was unique and eye-catching, but now there is a serpent to contend with that is also in God's realm, one that is luring these humans to disobey their God, in his garden. These two mortal beings had to wave off the power of evil, in the form of a serpent to be eligible to stay in the garden paradise. Where is God in all of this? Did he take a walk and was simply out of sight? Was he on vacation in another solar system? Just what happened to the great creator God that he stood back while this confrontation took place that by rights, should have never occurred in his own garden? Did he have such lack of concern for his newly created children that he was not concerned about the serpent roaming in his garden of righteousness, knowing that one mistake would add up to an eternal damnation, not only for them, but all their offspring, forever? Was he that unaware that the serpent would attempt to deceive these creatures in taking of the forbidden tree? Why was the serpent in the garden of God? Weren't we told that when Adam and Eve committed this one sin that they were expelled from the garden because no sin could be allowed in paradise of righteousness? Yet a serpent, a deceiver, a beguiler, the great adversary that was the spawn of sin itself was walking to and fro within this righteous domain. What's wrong with this picture? Could the great and all-powerful Oz be that naive, or was it a cunning trap laid out for these poor ignorant, helpless humans? Who really was this serpent? Was this the devil in drag? Was this some sort of black magic? Or was the devil himself speaking through this serpent? Whatever it was, why was the tree either, and what was this tree? If you had a child and placed ten toys in front of them and told them they could play with all the toys. However, the one toy, the most magnificent toy, you had placed right in the center of all the other toys and you tell the child that they may not even touch that specific toy or else they will be severely punished. Now how many children do you know that would ignore that one single forbidden toy, the most luring toy, the one that stands out in the center of all the other toys? We as adults are smart enough to realize that the child is now going to be much more curious about the forbidden toy than all the other toys, because it is a temptation. We left to enticement for our child, so what did we really expect? We already knew the outcome, didn't we? In fact, the other toys will rank far below in significance because you placed that one untouchable forbidden toy right in front of them and said leave it alone. The child's curiosity will no doubt about 99% of the time cause him or her to reach out and at least touch the toy. Now what would happen if we turned the table and made it even more difficult for the child to refuse? What if Uncle Joe came over dressed in a Halloween costume, and when the parents were not looking he began to speak to the child in friendly terms, telling the child to pick up the toy because it would be fun to play with? The child then responds saying, I can play with all the toys except that one, if I try to play with that one, I will be brutally punished. The predator in costume replies, you won't get in trouble, your parents are not going to punish you for simply playing with a toy, a toy that they left right in the center of all your other toys. In fact, they understand that this toy is special, that is why it is in the center of all the other toys that you can play with. Wouldn't this seem to be cruel and an unusual punishment to entice the child with this amazing toy, but tell them they can't play with it? Uncle Joe continues. You however will see how much fun it is to play with that toy. And furthermore, if your parents really did not want you to play with that toy, do you really believe that they would have placed it in the center of all the other toys that you were allowed to play with, while forbidding that one toy? Obviously, Uncle Joe has a good argument, one that could stand up in a court of law under entrapment to cause injury. Why would the parents subject their child to a temptation like this if they truly did not want the child to touch that toy? And why is the forbidden toy placed in the center of all the other toys, directly within the awareness of the children? Would you leave a loaded gun in the center of the rest of your child's toys, so that your child had access to it and then simply tell them not to touch it?
or would you remove it from the center of their perception and get it out of their way, because you love them and do not desire any harm to come to them? Answer carefully. My friends, I want you to understand this deeply, this is the difference between loving parents versus an indifferent stranger, whoever it may be. A loving parent would never subject their child unto a temptation like this knowing it was exceedingly dangerous, especially for the novice mentality of an adolescent. However, if you are not the child's real parent, then all bets are off as to your real intent for him or her. Remember, we are not talking about a gunshot wound to the head because of a random gun left behind that a child may find. We are talking about something that represented the loss of eternal life. Now didn't the odds just jump through the roof here, which would make this story even more mystifying. Are we seeing a pattern here? Just like with the story of David where God incited David to do wrong. Did God place the temptation there to move Adam and Eve to commit this grievous error because of a hidden result that he desired to occur, rather than it being rebellion or faithlessness of the people in question? And what about the serpent being there? Was he nothing more than a revelation of who these gods really were, the tempters, playing the roles of both God and devil good and evil, and they were simply roaming around in their very own headquarters. Remember their forbidden tree was placed right in the center of the garden and this tree was all about the knowledge of good and evil. The story continues where Adam and Eve were forbidden to take of the fruit of this tree, as is the metaphor for something dealing with a forbidden knowledge. The serpent found Eve and enticed her in taking of this knowledge by telling them that God was the one that was not being honest with them. This has all the attributes of someone who was on the inside and decided to spill the beans. For Eve told the serpent, that the day we eat of this forbidden tree that we shall surely die. The serpent reiterated the idea that Eve did not understand, in fact as he stated, if you take of this forbidden fruit not only will you not die, but you will become like the gods. Genesis 3, 5 For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall be as, their, gods, knowing good and evil. The term God here is the Hebrew reference to Elohim. It refers to a plurality. When the name Elohim is used, in a sense it is like saying people rather than a person. The Elohim are the gods, rather than a singular form, El, representing a single god and they all serve in rank, order and file under one powerful God who guides all of them, also called, God and or Lord. The serpent declared to Eve that taking of this forbidden knowledge would allow her eyes to be opened. As we learned in book one of this series, that the term eating has unique spiritual overtones. It represents consuming the word. Remember the word came in two forms, good and evil. Christ seeded the true word and the adversary the devil seeded the false word, all in the same garden. The term eating has a special depiction and it embodies knowledge being consumed and not some fruit of a tree. This implies Eve was blind to certain knowledge that the gods had. Eve needed to be awakened to what was transpiring as to why she was not allowed to eat of this forbidden knowledge. For as the serpent declared, that in the day she eats thereof, she will become like the gods. Why did God not want humans to eat of this tree and yet allow it in the garden along with the serpent? The answer is carefully constructed within a dark mystical secret. The tree was not a tree. This tree represented something that belonged to the gods. It was something they used. It was something they may have even worked around. It was probably the headquarters for the gods who dwelt on earth, in this location. The tree is symbolic of a family lineage, it was not a plant, it was a place to dwell in for the children of the gods. Chapter 6 Just who is God? Why is it that the term gods is used? Where were there any other gods in the beginning? It has long been assumed that only one god existed. The religious world has long declared that the serpent lied to Eve. My question is at what point did the serpent lie? He told her in general 3,5 that the day she ate thereof, that her eyes would be opened. This means she will understand something that previously was not perceived. The serpent declared that in the day she eats thereof, that she would become like the gods, to know good and evil. 
Did the serpent lie? Was this statement false? Was this the sin that Adam and Eve committed to follow a lie that would condemn generations after them? Or was it that in fact, the serpent did not lie he just revealed something that was forbidden for the humans to know about the gods? If this is true it begs the question, why would the serpent reveal this when God refused? The answer lies in Genesis 3, 22. And the Lord Elohim, gods, said, Behold the man has become as one of the U.S., all the gods, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Is this not word for word what the serpent told Eve? Did he not tell her that the day they ate of the forbidden tree that they would become like God knowing good and evil? The serpent evidently told her the truth, but why? Could it be a trick was being played? Is it possible that the serpent wanted the humans to know about the power of the gods and what this tree really represented, or was it something else entirely? Could it be that there was a law embedded even unto the gods where they had to obey? which declared the truth must be spoken to give the humans a choice. Even until this day the same protocols are being used, where humanity is being told the truth in so many ways within so many formats, and then the truth is mixed with the light to subjugate the humans and paralyze them under confusion, leaving them with little comprehension. Why has the religious world deceived us saying that what the serpent had revealed to Eve was a fabrication and have twisted this entire story to be nothing more than snakes and apples? If it was a lie, then why did the Lord God come back saying, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. If this was not true, why did the serpent and God both agree about the same thing? And yet the one said, Do not take of the tree and the other said, do take of the tree. Isn't there a tree called the knowledge of both good and evil? Then why should it shock you that one is playing the role of good, God and the other is playing the role of evil, devil? It is because of the mask of illusion. The lie was believing that the serpent lied. It is a double twist of confusion mixed with fear to disorient humans, in accepting the mask of illusion. All the gods were players of both good and evil, as was their identification marker. The one had to play the role of not wanting these humans to take of this tree, and thus had to conceal himself as part of the good, God polarity due to the law that stated, the subjects must be told the truth. And the other concealed himself as a serpent, to mask himself under evil, whereby he also spoke the truth, but was luring these humans to break the initial restraint so they would be punished by law. Therefore, it provided enough confusion to assure humans would do what they were supposed to do in the first place, that is to take of the forbidden fruit and lock them into delusion. Obviously, what the serpent told Adam and Eve was true because the gods verified it. By law they had to tell the humans the truth, and then having this knowledge caused the humans to be part of a stratagem that trapped their souls in darkness, because they disobeyed the initial orders. Chapter 7 God removed the human from the garden. Before I move on I want to address the second part of the good and evil verse. After they took of the forbidden tree, the gods decided in council to remove the man and woman out of the garden so they could not have access to the tree of life, and eat of it and live forever. The Garden of Eden symbolizes humanity in paradise before the fall. The tree in the center represents the fallen angels in the mask of illusion. Also, called Eden after the fall. They are both combined in the center of the garden, the humans and the fallen angels. Two seeds are planted together in the same garden, the good tree and the bad tree. We have learned about the bad tree but what about the good tree? The tree of life has also been misrepresented. The gods said, they did not want the humans to take of this tree because then they could live forever. This is a misnomer. It is also misinterpreted out of the original language that was handed down to us. There are several keys you need to pick up on. And I will describe the first one. Just prior to the flood, Genesis 6,4 reveals a secret, notice, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare, children, to them, the same, became, mighty men which, were, 
of old, men of renown. Notice how it describes these beings as the sons of God. They describe them as mighty men of old. Why is this important? The key here is the word old, translates in Hebrew to Olam. Now hold on to your hats, before I explain this let us go back to the two trees. Genesis 3,22 And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Take notice of the word, forever, may have believed that the taking of this tree was what removed eternal life away from the humans. They say, the devil lied to them, because now they lost out on eternal life, is their rhetoric. There is a problem, the term forever is also the word olam. It does not mean eternal life. It is an unknown word representing an unknown amount of time. The term was used to reveal who these sons of God really are and where they came from, and how they had extremely long lives. This is a powerful key. First, the correct term for eternal life is ad in the Hebrew and Ioneos in the Greek, it means without beginning or end, ageless, or ages without end. When it speaks of eternal life or eternity, Using this correct term it literally represents forever, all time, without limit, past or present. The word olam does not mean this, in fact it represents a unique time, a special period. Something that was out of the ordinary, but it was not eternal. Like as an example, those who lived hundreds and hundreds of years before the flood. These were men of renown, those of olam, or those that were exceedingly old. Remember when the editors of this material had written this information into the scrolls, either by word of mouth, or from older written documents, humans' lifespans were very short, around 70 years, with obvious exceptions either way. Anyone living to 500 or even 900 years was beyond comprehension. These were the people of Olam, meaning the ancient gods who lived a very long time. They were the sons of God, the Elohim roaming this planet. When it stated, now man has become like one of the U.S., it was using the plural to identify that the Elohim are many gods. These were the sons of God, making them gods also. And they could live close to 1,000 years, until the flood changed everything. 1,000 years is key. Now the tree of life did represent eternal life. However the true souls already had eternal life and therefore, this temptation was fraudulent. You access the tree of life from within yourself. The gods did not want the male and female to understand they were one of the Eternalians, from before the foundations of the world, because now they had forgotten even some of the earlier revelations about where they came from, it was all removed from memory. The true tree of life was an eternal connection to the father and mother. It was not something that one ate such as if they were eating or drinking an elixir that kept them alive continuously. The true children lost this connection because of the fall into error, and through Christ it was then made possible to regain this connection. Therefore, the gods could not offer the true tree of life. This was the deception and the great con. The humans had to fail. Do you understand? There was no tree of life in the physical garden of Eden. Think about it, if all they had to do was eat of it and live forever, then why didn't they just take of it, one time? By the time the true souls fell to the third dimensional earth the true tree of life was hidden within them, and another fraudulent tree of life was offered to them. There was no way the gods were going to allow them access to that tree, because the jig would be up. Therefore, the humans were coerced to take of the tree of knowledge instead as a way of punishment to force them to become slaves to the gods. The verse also stated in Genesis 6, that these were men of renown. What this means is, these were entities that were known by a name. The name they were known by was Shem. Now this is interesting word. Shem was one of the sons of Noah. Genesis 6 is prior to the flood, and in fact it is revealing the flood was going to occur in about 120 years from the time that Noah was to start building the ark. Obviously, this cannot be referring only to the son of Noah, but the term Shem was very important and no doubt why Noah named his son Shem, as you will learn in a while. The name Shem has a special meaning, 
it comes from the word name as stated above, but not as we might understand this term. Today we would call someone by their name as an identification of the person. This is not an accurate representation of the name Shem. Shem comes from the idea of accomplishing a great feat and making a name for oneself. I am sure all know of the stories of the ancient Greek gods, like Zeus, Apollo, and Hercules, etc. These were ancient gods that were written as mythological characters yet they were some of the gods of Olam just under different names and titles. Each of these gods had a special characteristic as to their fame and glory, so they made a name for themselves, of greatness and glory. These were the gods of Olam who were renowned or given the name, Ashem. However, there is another root meaning to this word Shem, it represents something that was set erect, such as upon a monument, or a tower, something that was a representation of these gods and from where they came from, which gave them the status as men of renown. Genesis 6 is revealing, that there were sons of God that came down from above, the usage of the term sons of God, comes from the root word Nephilim, and it does not mean giants per se as we have always been told. Yet many of these entities prior to coming to earth, as well as through an illegal interbreeding with humans as well as test tube machinations, became massive and gigantic, but the word Nephilim that is being used here represents, those from above that were cast down. In fact, the actual word comes from Nephil, meaning, to fall. What we are seeing here is that these gods came down from the heavens or other dimensions, or better translated were cast down, or forced down. So, what was it that they were known by? They were known as the gods from the stars, and they were noted as Shims, aliens and their craft from outer space. However, based on the ancient Sumerian cuneiform tablets, the name Shem represented a rocket, or some sort of flying machine to travel into space. And what is a rocket or even its platform, it is an erect object that is pointed to the stars. Therefore, these gods received their name from being space travelers, something no other human at that time could accomplish. They were simply aliens flying in their UFOs, just like what has been reported, even till this day. There is very little doubt that prior to the flood the tower that was being built in the city of confusion, called Babel, was a platform for a rocket to the skies, or a spaceship. But the gods had forbidden this because they did not want humans in their territory or they would then become like one of the gods. Now getting back to the root word for living forever, as was noted, we now recognize the term does not mean eternal life, it means the aliens that could live for a very long time. If the male and female were to access the tree of knowledge they would then appear like the gods where they would be like them, living as they do, because then they would know the truth of whom they are. They never had an opportunity to access the tree of life. It is important for you to realize the great taboo that the gods feared was that humans could become like them, knowing all they know, and then the humans would not be servants and slaves to these gods, because then they would perceive themselves as equal. Then why were the male and female cursed along with all their generations to follow? Was it because they rebelled, or was it they found out something they were not to be privy to? a secret. Meaning this information was for the elite only. Or was it also the plan all along? What really was the forbidden tree that was erected in the garden? Was it really a tree that had fruits such as apples and peaches, or was it something else? Was the tree in the garden the god's spaceship to the stars? And within this ship, was there knowledge about all things good and evil, via their technological computers? Was Eve given a tour around the inside of the ship where the gods lived and worked? Is this why they hated Babel because the people figured out how to back-engineer their flying machines? Chapter 8. Fallen Angels Transformed into Elohim From the very beginning we already see a major interpretation problem dealing with the concept of God. The gods here are being identified as a plurality not singular. We see this from the above passage where the term Elohim is used along with the term, U.S. This implies multiple beings, not just one. Earlier when speaking of God, about David, King of Israel, the Lord of David was YHVH, and it appeared he was one of the top gods, 
but as you will see later the name YHVH also has a parallel meaning. It might have been any one of the gods, but we don't know which one at any given time that is speaking. YHVH can imply a singular version of God, however this name is a title and not a personal name. The name translated means, Lord, and many of the gods had taken this attribution. Yet it can also refer to one god or person. The name YHVH is used most of the time for Lord when it is dealing with multiple gods. For all the gods were called, Lords. Obviously, there were many entities of this race known as gods at the time, and one of them obviously could have taken upon himself a personal power title of YHVH as the leader of the gods, but it was in fact a title of authority, for any of the gods to use. In Genesis 2,4 it speaks of the heavens and the earth being created by the Lord God, yet it is using the plural YHVH Elohim, Lord Gods. Seldom is the singular term L used in referencing one God in the first five books of the Bible, where the entire foundation of the one God theory was laid. Now learn a mystery. In the beginning the father-mother a dual androgynous energy power created the heavens and the earth. Here we have the one God concept because it is an energy force of the divine world. However, the heavens and earth that they created were spiritual domains, they were not material worlds like we are experiencing here. So therefore, we have been in a sense hijacked into a fake illusory cosmos universe, making us believe it is real due to the masks being worn or copies of the real thing. There is a real heaven and a real earth, but what we are experiencing is only a copy an elaborate program. When the fallen angels, aliens created the computer programming of a holographic universe, they desired everyone to believe that they were in fact a god using the knowledge that was once known and then using it for deception. They used the notion of one god as in parallel to the father, even though there were many gods, because they felt they were the true energy source, and the sons of god were their children. Remember they were trying to steal away the authority and power of the true creator and rise above their supremacy. Why? Because their leader Lucifer was jealous and demanded worship, and was angry anyone was looking back towards the father and mother, and he demanded full worship to obey and follow him and denounce the father and mother. Let there be no other gods before me. Thus, he stated, I the Lord thy God I am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Remember from the first book, the divine secret garden you shall know them by their fruits, jealousy is a sin of Satan and not an attribute of the father and mother. Chapter 9. Lord Gods, YHVH Elohim. Obviously, if the passage states, Lord God, which in Hebrew is, the YHVH Elohim then how can this be referring to one God? The fallen angels reprogrammed the truth and created an error using part of the truth or a mixture of truth and error. One of the secrets of how they created this mixture of confusion was blend languages that had different meanings for similar words. Remember Babel, God confounded the language so they would no longer be of one mind. So today we read, Lord God in the English translation, when it was, Lord God's. The YHVH Elohim created the heavens and earth, not YHVH L. The Lord Gods created the heavens and the earth. One might say that there were many programmers for this simulation. Do you see the confusion? The truth is that but it was mixed. In the beginning, all the gods were responsible for the lower creation or faulty programming of this lower universal system that in itself is stuck in the lower astral or fourth dimensional regions where the third dimension is being projected from, using the Luciferian sun or 666, Antichrist. What we have here is the entire foundation of the name God in Genesis is based on multiple beings all called lords, with a seldom exception of YHVH being used to identify a singular higher entity in rank, file and order, but only because it is a title of many, not just one. We have learned a very powerful piece of knowledge, one may call it the forbidden knowledge of truth mixed with error. We have learned that in the very middle of the Garden Paradise of Eden, the gods had a secret knowledge that was stored and it was comprised of both good and evil, God and devil. When we are given the terms God and or devil, 
We already know where these terms comes from, and from whence this bizarre tree originates. Both God and devil are from the tree of the ancient Olam, gods from the stars, men of renown, the Shem spaceships. Chapter 10. The Appointed Serpent. Getting back to the previous conjecture one needs to seriously ask the question as to why God placed the man and woman in a situation where something of this magnitude was set as a temptation? And why did God allow the serpent to be in the garden in the first place? These are important questions that need serious answers to. The ancient Hebrew language described Satan as an adversary. The Bible also suggests that God created the serpent in Genesis. Genesis 3,1 Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God's had made. So, the Elohim were responsible for making the serpent. I want to center your attention on the term made. It does not mean created. The term for created is bara, the term being used in this case is, asa. Notice it does not say created. The term made is broken down to mean, appointed, to appoint, ordain, or to institute. This spills the beans on what is going on here. The gods did not create the serpent, they appointed one of their own to become the adversary as part of their god and devil scheme that is the devil's advocate. The name serpent comes from the Hebrew word nadiarisis middle dot cash, with an accent over both a's sounding like na, cash. We have been told it represents a snake. The Hebrew word does in fact seem to reveal that it is a snake, but throughout the many ages, we have come to believe that Eve was conversing with a leg-born snake with the possibility of having legs, because under the curse it began to slither on its belly, not being allowed to walk anymore. Did Eve really converse with a snake? Come on people, what is this, Alice and Wonderland? Well maybe so. In the minds of many it is easy to get people to accept that Eve was deceived by a snake, for who in their right mind would allow a scaly reptile? which most are afraid of anyway, to speak against the great creator and then accept its horrendous accusations, against said creator. She had to be insane, right? One of the absolutes I will prove in this summary explanation is often words are changed and meanings become of none effect, simply by adding a slight error, the mask, to throw off the intended subject meaning so that we won't be able to understand the situation. However, there is another representation here that has been missed using the term Nakash, it comes from the original name of the same exact spelling, however it is N-A-Diaresis middle dot cash, the accent is only over the first A-Diaresis both spelled the same and even pronounced alike. Interesting, an easy and diabolical tiny little change that could be used to confuse. Now of course it may seem like I am splitting it hairs here. However, once you begin to comprehend the difference between these small markers, you can better understand whom Eve was speaking to and it was no stinking snake. It was easy for the devious and nefarious charlatans to add one of the accents over the seconder to make it nakash to literally and completely change the meaning of this predator. It was believed since it implied that God created the serpent from all the beasts of the field that it only made sense that this was referring to a snake, you know like amphibians mammals etc., just throw it in the mix somewhere. But God did not create this serpent, he appointed the serpent, that is ASA. This was just another program deception to change our DNA comprehension and be reprogrammed. Being Italian there is a phrase often used especially in the mafia that when someone is appointed to a higher office it is noted that they were, made. The truth is, the serpent was not a snake he was one of the Nephilim Elohim. Based on the true original word, Nakash, the serpent's identity was a snake charmer. The serpent was a magician, a spell caster, a divine enchanter, a magi, an extremely powerful El of the Elohim or Lord of the Gods. This serpent was a powerful being most likely being one of the top gods, sons of the YHVH. And he was appointed to become the divine enchanter to lure Adam and Eve into the trap. Now the question is why? This magician cast the woman under a spell, a whisperer of magic seduced her. 
there was little chance without protection that she was not going to disobey the initial orders. Now keep in mind on the term I used called, seduced. It is very important to understand what is occurring. The simple elimination of the accent over one of the A's changes the meaning of the word, serpent, entirely. One of the definitions of serpent in Old English means a treacherous person. We need to ask the question, where was the protection from God over his human creation? Adam being forewarned of this magician could not resist the temptation either after Eve was seduced and he also partook of this knowledge. Obviously, the gods were playing some sort of cat and mouse game where one would say one thing and the other would say another, that is good cop, bad cop. They were both lured and tempted to do what was stated was forbidden, therefore, they both took part of this mysterious tree. They took of the tree of God and devil, or what is called the artificial simulation experience, so they could be set between a polarity, and for the rest of their lives and many ages to come, be captured in a lower density to be deceived and remain slaves, unknowingly stuck between two trees or separated from their internal tree of life by adhering to the tree of death. Why would the great God of justice and reason allow such chicanery and dishonesty? Why would God so severely punish this man and woman and all generations born unto them for an act of indulgence that chances and no one would have been able to withstand? And what really was the indulgence in this grievous act in the first place, what did they really consume? If indeed the woman was placed under a spell, then how could it have been ordained as a sin? She had no ability to withstand this type of beguiling. And realizing that this sin originated right in the middle of the garden of God, shouldn't God have taken responsibility as a wise parent would, to have protected his children against this deception, since it was in his very domain where it took place? If you left your children at home but knew that a murderer, Rapist and kidnapper had snuck into your house, but you left your children unoccupied anyway. Are you not responsible? And even worse than that, what mindset must one be in to allow the thief to enter knowing full well that your children will be harmed? The problem is, this tree belonged to the gods, and it represented what these gods truly were, and where they came from. It was the very knowledge they lived by called the polarity duality of God and devil. It was the science of simulation or antichrist. It seems to me that the reason the humans were shunned due to their sin, is that they were part of a trap set by the gods themselves. And it becomes somewhat obvious that their tree of knowledge had something to do with the simulation program of this false world. Chapter 11 The DNA Switch and the Law The tree of the knowledge of good and evil belonged to the Elohim gods, the YHVH Elohim. The true tree of life belonged to the father and mother. The reason both were offered was because the fallen ones must by law tell us what they are doing and what the truth is, so the true children have a choice. Sadly though because of the reprehensive beasts these entities are, they mix the truth with error to mislead. However, if the true seeds would simply go within themselves to discern right from wrong, they would uncover this nefarious trap. The way the gods have deceived this world is still very much occurring the same exact way even till this day. Going back again to the story, both Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit and it states that their eyes were opened, General 3-6. Immediately because of this knowledge they perceived they were naked, and the Elohim began to sew fig leaves together to cover them. Now this is starting to get interesting. What appears to have occurred is, Eve was reprogrammed from the original DNA to accept a new course of programming from the serpent via a dimensional shift of mind, which the father and mother had allowed to occur. Adam upon learning that his wife was reprogrammed gave in also and became part of the new program. But what really happened? Could it be that the gods said, hey, do you want to play a virtual reality game? The fig leaves were an obvious allegory as to what was taking place. I mean for crying out loud, these gods had technology that supersede even ours of today, and the best they could come up with was sowing fig leaves? The fig leaves represented the human avatar form that we all take on via childbirth that a soul consciousness was made to wear to keep them locked into a mighty deception of the third density, 
blocking out reality. It was sort of like throwing on some virtual headgear and becoming absorbed into the program. Prior to this the male and female, as well as each of us at one time were energy beings that were not as limited. I believe our first form when he came to these lower levels was more ethereal, or what we may call a ghost-like appearance. Our energy bodies were a much higher vibration and not limited to matter, illusion as in the third dimension as we are now. Above our world into higher dimensions is an etheric realm where we once existed before we fell into matter, simulation. This is where we were enticed by the serpent prior to coming here. Obviously, clothes were not an option. Our bodies if we chose to appear this way were etheric, without clothing and sexless. Otherwise we were probably orbs of light energy. Although the fourth dimension is not our true home, it is higher than the matter world third dimension. The fourth dimensional realm is a thought energy realm that we felt are from the fifth dimension and above, whereas everything below the fifth dimension is an illusory realm of the mind. I believe what we are witnessing was the first time energy beings became human beings inside the facade of the veil of deception seeded inside the human body or virtual reality mask. This is when we left the spiritual garden and fell to the third dimensional realm of the fallen angel's mind creation. What we are witnessing here is an unbelievable holographic program that is being projected from the energy thought realm creating the matter illusion. Whatever the tree was, it was inside that tree where the humans were transformed from a higher density being to be wrapped inside a super techno virtual reality simulation to cover not only their true awareness, but their souls. This was their nakedness, they were unclothed of their reality and forced to be naked in illusion, via the simulation. Whatever this tree was I would be willing to bet hands down that it was a dimensional transport ship to carry the soul mind which is now asleep from one dimension to another, leaving them clueless as to what took place. And instead of one dying to leave a body, we all died, slept to enter these bodies and have been in the virtual techno world ever since, yes even beyond death. Chapter 12. God and the Serpent The Grand Play Coming from the Hebrew word we learn that the term beguiled is nasha, meaning to deceive or seduce with great power. This was not some dumb slithering snake, this was a being of great resources and temptations having the ability to cast spells creating confusion and disorienting the subject. He was a magical king of tricksters, and he deceived this poor woman whom, now was being seduced. Simply stated. There is no way in this grand old green earth that she could have withstood this lure of deception, the deck was stacked against them both. The religious world contends that God was testing them to see if they would obey, but it states the Father tempts no one with evil nor can he be tempted with evil. So why would God do this? Now some in their ignorance would proclaim, that God didn't tempt them, Satan tempted them. Do you see how the mind is easily tricked? to keep the conformity to the illusion? Obviously, as I have stated continuously, this was not the Father, this was not the true Creator, these were aliens who claim they were gods using fourth dimensional thought transference technology, which is a mask of reality to cover the true soul. Technology is an illusion. But, did God care? Did he once say, oh I am sorry for this? I left that gangly ole serpent in the garden and I should have realized he would do this? No, not at all. In fact as the story plays out he was more than willing to dish out retribution, not only to Adam and Eve, but also to all her offspring, which meant every one of us. Now please think about this for a second. If this was an eternal damnation, then why even allow other generations to even be born if they are lost before they ever started? Why even go through the steps? Because they needed slaves. Chapter 13. Satan the Adversarial Con Artist The term Satan is derived from the word enmity, it simply means adversary. Satan is not God's adversary, he is humanity's adversary as one of the gods as was appointed by God to bring enmity between the two. Why didn't God place enmity between himself and Satan and kick his ass out of the garden before he had a chance to tempt humans? 
why place the enmity against his own children and Satan? Obviously, it doesn't appear that God is all that willing to divorce the adversary, but is willing to divorce his own children. Think about it logically and then spiritually. Satan has been there for ages and ages, maybe even millions of years. Humans were reported to just come on the scene recently, comparably. But as soon as the humans sin, they are tossed out of paradise and sentenced to death unto all generations, but the fallen ones continue to roam and do their dirty deeds as humanity's rulers. Who is really running the show here? I was reading about a story not too long ago where a woman claimed she went into hell with Jesus, obviously being transported in mind back to the fourth dimension. While she was there she witnessed humans being tormented, burning with fire as their flesh dropped off their bodies. However, they could not die, they just suffered in horrible torment. They went to some of the victims as they were suffering and these poor souls were crying out to Jesus who was with this woman. These souls were explaining how wrong they were and why they wanted a reprieve because they know now that they sinned horribly and made terrible mistakes. However, Jesus walking along with the woman wouldn't have any mercy. He said I tried repeatedly to warn you but you rejected me so now you must suffer for all eternity. Now what was odd as the woman was standing there with Jesus, she said she saw demons of all types walking to and fro going back to the world of the living and deceiving them so they could capture more souls to bring them into hell for their torment. Here they all were, demons beyond number just having a party deceiving and torturing souls. Yet it very seldom crosses anyone's mind, why are these demons allowed to have a heyday and party over the lost souls? Why are they free to roam and do whatever they desire, when humans are banished for much lesser crimes? Here Jesus is supposedly in their midst and he condemned the poor souls but ignores the error and wickedness of these soulless demons. What is wrong with this picture? Well first, this was not the true Jesus. The father and mother would never allow anyone to suffer for all eternity for mistakes made in a single lifetime. If you believe they could then you are not of the true seed. Chapter 14 Enmity Between Two Races God then talking to the serpent said this. Genesis 3:15. And I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Stop the presses. If you haven't done so, you need to read my book, The Divine Secret Garden, Forbidden Knowledge, The Children of the Harvest. We need to ask ourselves, who is the serpent? Did we not learn that he was one of the gods, so is this not saying, they were going to place enmity between humanity and the gods? What is interesting to me about this verse is that it is stating that God set up a polarity, an opposite interference like an adversary. The term enmity simply means hostility, hatred, antagonism, animosity, rancor, and ill will. God set up rancor, which means a bitter, deeply held, and long-lasting ill will or resentment between the serpent and his children, versus Eve and all her children throughout all time for generation unto generation. Is your mind not spinning yet? Why would God delve into this basement of emotions and set this as a conflict between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed perpetually for generations to come? Let's get real. If this was the devil did we really need enmity placed between us and him? I think there was plenty to go around before any of this occurred. Well of course God had to do this because these were the gods of both good and evil, right and wrong, truth and error, God and devil. It is simply their playbook. As the old twilight zone revealed where aliens came down with a book that said, to serve man. Everyone believed these entities came for benevolent reasons until they learned that to serve man was an alien cookbook and humans were the delicacies. From this point on it is saying that hatred, animosity, ill will was placed between humanity and the gods. These were not benevolent beings, they were mentally askew perverted tyrants. What this reveals is that the serpent's seed would have hatred against the woman's seed perpetually. Do you understand what this is implying? It is saying the gods can't stand us. We are deplorable in their eyes. It is clearly stating that the woman along with all children born to her and the generations to follow, 
including you and me, unto perpetuity, eternally, are now made enemies to the serpent slash gods and their children. What the heck did we do to deserve this? Suddenly everything becomes clearer. The seed is the offspring born to these entities. This means the serpent has a family and will have generations of descendants right alongside of the woman and her generations. Does it still sound like a slithering snake? The woman has now been set at odds with this magician so that he will now be allowed to hate, that is rule over her and her children for generations to come. The knowledge of good and evil was revealed to them, but only partially. They needed to place this division between the gods and humans. Did you learn this in Sunday school? Did your minister, priest, bishop or rabbi ever tell you this? How does a snake's seed have any comparison in this revelation cursed to human offspring? From that time forward the Adam, the male would work for his living in difficult situations as part of the curse. However, the woman was cursed also and in some respects even greater. The woman even took upon the curse of painful childbirth, greatly multiplying her sorrow. And then to make things even worse, he made the man to rule over the woman as part of the punishment because she was deceived. How does not being deceived as it reveals of Adam, where one recognizes the evil and then breaches the law anyway, gain greater respect than a deceived person who was tricked into error? Yet the man failed in his responsibility because he knew what was going on. He was not deceived. Eve however was sent forth a snake charming magician, a god, and she was deceived and yet she became the ridicule of this sin for all generations. Adam was never to rule over Eve because spiritually they were DNA equals that is go heirs. We are all in our true state androgynous, just like our divine parents which means, being neither male nor female but having similar masculine and feminine qualities and traits giving the impression of duality, yet being one. These lower gods based on their idea of, ruling over others, created castes and classes to teach humans the law of subordination. One ruling over the other. It is the law of being bonded servants and slaves. What's wrong with this picture again? The answer is simple. The curse was the desire the gods had the entire time. It was never about Adam and Eve obeying God. It was about making sure they didn't. Just like in David's case, it was not about David committing sin against God for numbering Israel. It was because God was angry with Israel and seduced and tricked David into this disobedience so God could punish Israel. If God was angry with Israel, then why not just take it out on them? Why use David? Because the gods need humans to comply with their deceptions to enforce the law of both good and evil. It is all deception. It is the mask of illusion or the dark energy veil of illusion aka, d.t.v.eel. The mark of the beast equals technology simulation or an artificial spirit. As for the serpent and what he did to Eve, I will just say that the reason the curse came between Eve and the serpent and her offspring and his, is obvious. She discovered something major about the gods and learned they were not what they were led to believe, at first. Chapter 15 Rule of Law is the Operating Key If the gods had so little regard for their new creation, then why play these games with teaching laws and then demanding obedience? Why go through the process when they could have simply created the human and send them into the fields to do their labor? Think about it. It was not that simple. They also had to follow certain protocols which allowed the people free will choice. One of the areas I had difficulties in putting all of this together was this very point. Yet where I found the answer did not lie with the ancient text. It was discovered by viewing how the gods and their children are still operating today. Clearly the gods have always created laws and rules to appropriate their power over the people they governed. They call it the rule of law. However, their rules of law never apply to themselves, it seems they believe they are over and above all law. Whenever you hear a politician use the term rule of law, they are of the mindset of the Elohim gods and are obeying their creed as Luciferians. The rule of law means contravention of law will indeed occur, and the law will be contravened one way or the other. 
for it is law that defines sin, without law there would be no sin. However, sin is also created by there being more and more laws. The law was created so sin could accumulate, and the more laws the more sins, not the other way around as all religions teach. Sin did not bring in the law, the law brought in the knowledge of sin. There is only one true law, loving the father and mother with all your heart and soul and loving one another as you love yourself. What is their fixation about law when they don't obey it anyway? They can change the rules at any time and play whatever nasty game they desire, but don't any of us dare break any of the laws or else we will pay bitterly. The answer that I came up with is that if they give us laws as our fleshly progenitors and we break them, which we will be seduced to disobey, then they have every right to do what they want to us and no one could interfere. As an example, you do not want your children to have premarital sex, you realize this tears down the family roots and family tree. So, what do you do? You hand them condoms. The excuse is, it is better to be protected than not. The problem is giving condoms to children only entices them to do what you desire for them not to do. And they are going to do it, just like Eve took of the forbidden tree. All the excuses and righteous dodges of this avenue of thought is never going to change the outcome. If you do not want your children playing with a loaded gun, remove it from their presence. Don't hand out bullets and say, we do not wish you to use these, but it is better to have protection. The question is, who is that to interfere? This is the question that everyone should be wondering knowing these unlawful gods seem to love law, but instead they have chosen to follow the lie. While everyone has been spending all their time worshipping false gods, doing their bidding, making sure all their interests are met, they have forgotten that we are from another realm where true divine nature and spiritual natural laws of love really do exist. These are not rules of law, they are rules of love. And they are programmed within us as divine children. But when we fell we lost this precious knowledge of service to one another and fell into the trap of service to self, and now we are easily maneuvered to follow a dark ritual of law and sin, and we have all but forgotten the rule of love. These alien gods that are on earth and have been ruling for a very long time, know very clearly about the powers that exist well beyond their puny minds. They are afraid of these powers, and they know that each one of us have these powers as conduits of the true source, once awakened. For we are the true seeds. However, they believe that they are without guilt if they give us laws as our progenitors, then we must obey, and if we fail to do so, then they have every right to treat us as they like. Part of this deception comes from divine love and guidance, which they are misusing to control us. Christ did not tell us to be disobedient to law, he told us that we should see the law in the spiritual light. It was said in the olden times, Thou shalt not kill. I am telling you not to even hate. You see if one has love, they would never be led to kill. Think about it, nearly every alien race that has ever been queried from the UFO sector via research stated, why is it that aliens won't intervene to help us, knowing we are being controlled against our will? Their answer is, we are not allowed to interfere in your subjugations based on divine law. We were trapped indeed. But now we must find the keys to this puzzle for freedom, but not by ourselves as some believe, but seeking the originators of our true heritage, the father and mother. This is our only way and potential for real freedom. The world has been lied to, most do not even remember the father and mother anymore. Sure, they follow their gods, they follow their messiahs, but they do not seek the father and mother, because they have forgotten who they are and how we are connected. Even Jesus Christ said he came to reveal the father and mother, but what do the people do? They place all their attention on the messenger and never listen to the message. And this is the problem we still have today. People won't listen to the message they always go after the messenger, and either destroy them or set them on a pedestal, but damn be the message. It appears since no one has come to our aid that their game plan has been flawless that we will forever be subjected to these fallen gods from antiquity, because of our sins, which no one seems to be able to conquer. No matter how long we are here in our many lives, 
sin will always be with us individually because the law is always there. And our very body is a body of death via sin. It is programmed this way. And the idea that someone came to cover your sins in blood is also part of the fallen agenda. Blood is part of the corruption of this fallen program and it cannot cover spiritual flaws, it is only being used by the gods to placate their programmed artificial spirit. The father and mother do not ask, seek, or need someone's blood to be spilled to have them do what comes naturally, and that is to love, forgive and instruct, teach as any normal parent would do. Which one of you if your child disobeyed would you require a blood offering to present before yourself to forgive your son or daughter? It is absurd to even think about it, isn't it? It is not human no more than it is spiritually divine. Then why do we believe this of our divine parents? The term enmity really means we have been subjected to the law of polarity, the tree of good and evil. We are placed between arches always being pulled in two different directions making it impossible to live the requested spiritually righteous life. Therefore, being without sin is simply not possible, for we are not justified by the deeds of the law, because within the law there is no justification beyond death. We are justified by faith. When the curse was to bring enmity between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed, it was to set up a love-hate relationship as once again a polarity, that is masters and slaves that will always drain the slaves of any good within them, making it even more impossible to adhere to instruction. Therefore, when more laws are created more destruction evolves. Chapter 16 The Gods and Satans Were at War Enmity was the mindset of these gods. What happened was, the gods and the satans all of which are the same family went to war with each other. Read the stories of Enoch and Jude. I believe they went against all divine axiomatic law of service one to another and began to follow the dark force and path, which is the rule of law that denies the love of the father and mother, and it became the law of service to self. They rejected the ultimate law of perfection and chose to honor a fallen law of polarity that could only be executed on lower densities, where a fallen norm miscalculated science became known as God and Satan while living in masks covering the divine awareness. Thus, Lucifer had a big problem on this hands. In all his wisdom, he did not understand why the Father will never allow darkness or evil to invade their higher realm. It is because once evil is mixed with good there is no longer truth or life anymore. Everything is destined to destroy itself. Today we on earth are getting very close to the technological know-how that these beings had back then, and maybe in some higher circles we already have it. This is by no means an accident. These same beings are around in both the third and fourth density levels still operating and governing this earth and beyond to an extent where the computer projection program allows. 17. The Gods of War For an extremely long time mankind has been at war seemingly with themselves. Yet this is the ruse the gods have pulled off on us because we have failed to let go of the party mind, which divides the people. We are not at war with one another as it appears. Gods and their offspring that are war-minded are using war to govern this world and stage agendas to continue to keep that control. Therefore, we are at war with God, that is the gods. Some have come to wrongly believe that because they do not belong to any group or faction that they are using their own mind. This once again is often proved to be laughable. People are inundated with group mind thought all the time, even if they personally do not belong to any group. The media is a powerful tool that keeps people constantly up to date on what is expected of them and how they are to think. Our religious institutions and educational academia no longer teaches people how to think, they teach you what to think, there is a megalithic difference. Our minds are constantly being bombarded with ideologies so fast and quick that it is easy to believe it is your own mind thinking the thoughts. However, the proof is usually in the action where the individual succumbs to the hive mind whether they are aware of it or not. I have watched people literally parody some other point of view nearly word for word, yet they defend their action with their life, saying it was their personal belief. Just like parties and factions, they do not even know they have been manipulated and brainwashed. 
These gods have spawned violence and hatred via the law of enmity and they continue to use their sickness as a weapon against humanity to fire up resentment and hatred towards one another. We live in a world where no matter what side of the planet you exist on, you have an enemy that you may not even know of or realize. But you have been assured that this other group hates you, so in return you need to hate them back. The sad thing about all of this is, is that all warring factions have a leader that sits at the top calling the shots. These leaders are being used by the Blue Bloods to make sure we are continually in a war frame of mind. Humanity has been divided in multiple regions not because of race, creed or color per se, but because of creating the ability to have more war. It is all about setting up parties, groups, factions, religions and multiple other ideological concepts creating sectional environments that oppose one another. Of course, none of this works unless good god and evil devil are the instruments of value. Most all groups believe they are the good ones fighting for their principles against the evil ones. Few want to see themselves as being evil, even though at times the actions they take and allow are extremely wicked and satanic, it is being done in their mind to destroy evil. They create the concept that sometimes you should accept the ideology of evil to conquer their evil. And this is the first polarity lesson given to them by the gods to allow evil as a part of God's expression. This is how war is created. People are convinced that killing another is alright if you are doing it for the party, good God, cause. Now we can better understand what the thought process of these fallen gods is. That is exactly how they reason around their poisonous mindset. And that is why so many have followed these gods even though they recognize them as warmongers. It is because they believe God sometimes must stoop to low levels to defeat the enemy where there is no human enemy. The enemy are the gods that lead the people to war using their own law of enmity against one another. When God says, Thou shalt not kill, this only applies to you if the gods don't change the rules or add a subheading in the rules. In this case the subheading is, Thou shalt not kill those that agree with your party view. Otherwise, kill slaughter, obliterate and destroy, is their motto. Chapter 18. Close Encounter of the Untoward Kind Now it is time to get into the brass tacks as one might say and not hold back any longer. The serpent raped Eve impregnating her with twins. I use the term rape because it was an illusory magical seduction, not exactly a voluntary response. Eve was not in her right mind when she gave in to the devil. She was cast into a trance state awareness. I am sure what she witnessed when she went inside the tree really blew her away and she fell into an amorous trance and simply gave in freely. The ancient scrolls of the fragments of the lost gospel of John, declared that Laldabaoth aka Yaldabaoth, one of the lords of the ancient ones, or Alam as we have learned, raped Eve. Under the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, Inki was the first lord of earth and he was the serpent and master at the DNA complex. What had transpired is Adam was not afraid because he and Eve were naked per se, although it has something to do with it in a greater sense metaphysically. As we have learned the nakedness was losing one's awakening and entering simulation, but there is a little more to it. Their nakedness was revealing how they fell. They had lost their white robes of glory, which simply defines their spiritual world of perfection and how all the true children had belonged to the father and mother and are now fallen into this state of decay and death having to serve demagogues. When God called out to Adam, the term shame of being naked had a twofold meaning, Eve began to show that she was pregnant in this new third dimensional realm, which was different from the fourth dimension. And this created the shame between Adam, Eve and the serpent because, sex was introduced for the first time with a resulting consequence. There are no children born in the fourth dimension, it simply has souls or soul minds of the father and mother as well as the spirits of the fallen angels. In the third density where they now found themselves within, a whole new pattern of how things were about to change was revealed. Children became the vehicle or avatar bodies for other souls who were also set in a trance state coma to be immersed into the human program. Chapter 19. The Alien Impregnation 
it was not who told you that you were naked, it was who defiled, tempted you and impregnated the woman? It is very important to understand that what occurred with Eve was rehashed in the full story of Mary, Joseph and Jesus to create another mask of illusion to cover over the truth. Remember we were told that Joseph did not impregnate Mary, that Jesus was a direct son born of a deity. Of course, I explained in other writings how this entire message was a deception by the Shadow Lords. If Jesus was not born of humans, as the Son of Man, then the result would be the Antichrist, as one of the sons of God. Therefore, it was used for the offspring of the false Christ, and there is little doubt that this may have occurred that one of the Shadow Lord aliens impregnated a Mary, not necessarily the Mary, to have a reincarnation of an earlier Shadow Lord and the eventual Holy Bloodline that may have spoken about. It was not the true Christ, but the fake one, the supplanter, the dead added together with the wheat. Therefore, Cain and Abel were the firstborn sons of the serpent, they were not Adam's seed. This began the enmity process between Cain and Abel, but there was a problem. The Bible states Adam knew Eve and she conceived and had a son. Many have tried to say that the term knew meant sexual intercourse. Well of course that was the implied meaning as part of the programming. The key to this verse reveals the deception. When it stated, Adam knew Eve and she conceived and had a son, this would not be the case in a proper historical biblical text. The man was always revealed to beget children, this was the way things were back in those days. Even though the woman gave birth, she was relegated basically to a baby maker and the man was always deemed the one to beget sons and daughters. The fact that this state Eve had the son reveals it was not Adam's son, this was the key inside the deception, and I will prove this. Obviously, Adam knew Eve in a sexual way eventually, but in this case the child or children that were born to Eve, were not Adam's sons. Adam became aware of this woman as being something special for his human desires and wants, which have now greatly been enhanced due to this lower dimension vibration. Remember Adam and Eve just dropped in from the fourth dimension, and while existing there, they were souls living in ethereal thought bodies that existed in the higher realm. Things were much different in how they operated due to vibrational levels, than how they operate in the third dimension. Now it is possible due to some form of trickery that the serpent came in the form of Adam and he knew Eve and had a son. Remember he was a magician causing this woman to fall into a trance, that is Nasha, greatly deceived. However, Eve later knew exactly who the father was and she revealed him. Adam began to realize what the serpent did to her and his eyes were also opened, and he also wanted the fruit. Sex became a propagation tool to expand humanity, and there were reasons for this. The seed was implanted in the egg of the mother to create new homes for humans. The fruit of the seed were children being born. Basically, humans were to become a biological internet a world wide web, called genealogical lineages. There are no such thing as little children per se, they are just young avatars who have recently been seeded again into the flesh while carrying an old soul within. What we witness here in this world from cradle to grave, is an illusion. We do not age, we are not really born, nor do we really die. It is all part of the simulation that presents these misconceptions. Sex was made to be the greatest fruit of all that most desire, because the need for human houses became paramount to the gods in this game of deception. Chapter 20 The Great Dumb Down Can you imagine what Eve thought when she was seduced into a sexual encounter with one of the gods as well as became pregnant by him? How could this be? Of course, the gnosis the serpent gave Eve was much more than just a sexual dalliance. It had to do with quantum knowledge of who and what the gods were and where they came from. This is part of what Eve passed on to Adam and he took of the forbidden tree also. However, evidently, he already knew the truth, as I have expressed prior. The humans lacked certain gene characteristics via the DNA splicing and a new chromosome sequencing took away much of their abilities as well as it dumbed them down enough that they lost access to their higher energy powers as well as other unique psychic abilities. 
More importantly it caused them to forget who they were and they became malleable servants. After we lost these gifts we were told that powers such as these were evil and we were not to have anything to do with them. This was because the gods did not want us retrieving our lost powers of the mind, so they damned it all as evil in their little good and evil game, but they had no problem using these gifts for themselves. Remember it is all mind over illusion that is matter. All governments and religions that claim there is no other life beyond this world have deceived us. It is why certain sciences have been withheld from the general masses such as quantum physics, until recently. Elsewise, we would all understand time travel, and dimensional worlds as a first-grade science. And like the serpent told Eve, we would become like the gods to know the truth about good and evil or God and devil. Those sitting in powerful positions do indeed understand these things, yet they make sure that the peons, the cattle of humanity are never aware of these truths in general. They send out their angels with fiery swords to make sure we cannot gain access back to our tree of life. We have been unable to enter back into the garden, fourth density awake, lest we discover they are frauds. What took place with Eve the day the serpent beguiled her was of great import that has at best been limited to eating an apple. Adam and Eve knew they were in type creations of these gods for they also had many of the same characteristics both in form and image. However, they learned that their soul was divine of a higher glory, belonging to another. Chapter 21. Let us make man after our image. We read in Genesis where it stated that the Elohim, that is the gods created male and female after their image and likeness. Genesis 1:27 and, the Elohim, created the Adam in their image. In the image of the Elohim created he them, male and female created he them. They wanted to do this based on what was revealed in the ancient Sumerian texts, to create a slave race that would do all their work. How did they do that? By underdeveloping the male and female DNA. This resulted from the cries of the lesser gods that were getting sick and tired of having to do all the work. They wanted a helper to do the work for them. In Genesis 1:26, it revealed their mission. And the Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This was the counsel of God stating their mission. Now what is so interesting about this is in the Hebrew based on the word, image, it reveals the truth, it comes from the word tzalem, which means in the image of pagan gods or false rulers. It is even more graphic than that, it means in type images, of tumors, mice, and heathen gods, can you say disgusting? Even worse than that, the term used for image means emptiness, like a vessel that has nothing in it. So, likeness and image did not mean human form per se, it meant becoming like the gods in how they acted and operated. Inki, based on the Sumerian texts, also the second in command was chosen to fulfill this mission. Inki, the serpent that raped and beguiled Eve was chosen among the gods to fulfill their plan. This was the plan to create an inferior clone that looked and appeared pretty much like the gods, but they were being created to become slaves. This was done by making sure their blood was of lower quality than the gods. The DNA was radically altered so mankind would be slow to figure out what had occurred. We would become dumb sheep that would just follow anything and we would believe anything we were told, but still have enough passion to do the work for the gods. And within the plan they created a new rule. Let not the new creation know the secrets of universal order via science and technology lest they become like our children and they no longer serve our needs and rebel and complain that they are being forced to work as slaves. It was decided to allow a pure blood into the race to create a type of ruler that would be a human ruler but carrying more DNA blood from the gods. Thus, Inki planted his seed into Eve whom he had created. They created a royal race to become the rulers of the lower bloods. Thus, we have our enmity between the serpent's children via Cain, and Adam and Eve's children via Seth. More to come. Chapter 22. Were humans formed from the dust? Genesis 2 7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When one reads this verse, 
it has been understood that man was made from the red dirt that is the Adam or earth. Other textual references teach Eve was made from Adam's rib. What are we to make of this verse and others like it? If we take the Hebrew that was spoken it would read like this. Genesis 2-7 And all the gods formed Adam from the clay mixtures of the Adama, red soil, and breathed, Nshama, divine inspiration and intellect of life, Chekai, and Adam became a living, Chekai, Nefesh, soul. Is it not interesting that the soul that these gods created was called, Nefesh, Nefesh Nefash? Whereas these beings were called, Nephil Nafil slash Nephilim. This is way too close to be a coincidence. I believe these terms representing a type of soul are referring to our flesh and blood versus their flesh and blood. However, ours is lower in the DNA sequencing as well as we were of earth. Therefore, we became nafash, whereas they are nafl, those that fell from heaven. Nafl represents those from above that were cast down and nefesh was their creation below, the earthlings. The term soul has been rendered to simply be an animal with no spirit connections, except where the breath of life was given unto the Adam, he then received intellect and divine inspiration, which many seem to ignore in this puzzle. Also, it refers to soul and or spirit for the word nshama. I believe this is our consciousness intellect that the father and mother have given unto us as their creation. There are two souls, the mask and the consciousness, or illusion and reality. The ancient Gnostics taught that this breath that was given came from the Divine Father and Mother, as it is spirit life that was breathed into the Adam to become a living being. The Divine Father and Mother allowed their children to be seeded into the earth vessel avatar human body for the plan to succeed ultimately. Laldabaoth, or the Gnostic first lord of earth, which parallels with Inki of the Sumerian account was angered when this occurred because he felt he had been tricked. Nevertheless, the Sumerian account revealed Yaldabaoth was a mindless being, a false creation by his mother Sophia. Now these accounts may not be purely parallel to each other as close as we would like, but I believe seeing other accounts better strengthens the overall clarification or interpretation of what occurred back in the olden days. The divine inspiration and intellect is no different than when the father and mother passes their genetic codes to their children. These genetic codes are within our DNA, and they are linked to what I call spiritual hidden memory codes. Our physical DNA is from the gods and their evolution and the spiritual DNA marker in us is direct from the divine world, our father and mother creator, source etc. The spiritual memory code or our spiritual DNA is our higher pattern of awareness and intellect within each of us. That pattern is called soul, which is a projection from spirit. As the soul is a projection of spirit, so is the human body a projection of the fourth dimension into the third dimension. When these gods mixed the clay, which was just a terminology of mixing DNA, and splicing genes, that is Genesis or genes of Isis, Isis being one of the female gods. They were creating a computer program using the matrix of what is called the matrical birthing program. They gave unto us what they already had which passed through their progeny except at a lower sequencing level because they are our human parents. Basically, it is all software of a biological computer simulation program. Let me be more precise, they gave unto us their characteristics, but we were already far more advanced than they could ever be, so they had to dumb us down using the matrix. I want you to think about that. What at first appears nothing more than flesh and bone being created out of dirt is a lower replica designed by the mixing of genes and the DNA complex, which also created a shell for the higher mind seed via this integration process for the souls. All of it is possible not because of what the gods did, they only aided in a technological science. What really occurred is life that already existed was implanted back into these lower forms via this vibrational frequency integration program called, the transmigration of the soul. Chapter 23. The Code of a Pre-existent Life. All of this is revealing a code that we can visualize once we remove the blinders. From the Neanderthal in almost instant fashion to the human being, 
a science was used that interspliced DNA genes with the existing much lower race and voila, a new race was born. What was this new race? Was it just some concoction of the gods, or was someone being brought back? Did they do this because they could not have children? I believe it is possible that when speaking of God's children that they were not actually children. They were followers in the great Luciferian rebellion and in time adopted their new status protocols in lower dimensions. Lucifer's followers can be called his children. When the spirit of Satan came to this realm, he engendered children via the DNA playbook via the bloodline. What this reveals is, Lucifer's children are the gods of heaven above, the aliens, and Satan's children are the rulers of earth, below, in the polarity game. More to come on this pivotal point. Therefore, the gods wanted to create a race that had many of the characteristics they had but lacking in mind and power so that they would become good followers as slaves and obedient to the rule of law, which will create sinners for them to condemn forcing them through fear to obey eternally. If I gave a little hint as to what happened and the truth behind the plan and the counsel of gods to create humans, it would be tantamount to creating a virtual reality device that could be given to another to recreate a fake reality or an illusion. Chapter 24 The Gnostic Version The fallen angels, aliens, transformed into the gods of the ancients after the fall. The ancient Gnostics call one of these servants of hell. Laldabaoth, which is a form of Lord YHVH. These beings were called Archons. They claim that Laldabaoth was created by a lower power called Sophia that mistakenly had created this being who became her son. And because of her presumptuousness this creation become a perversion, being totally void of all truth. He then went on to create his own angels, which became his sons and daughters, as well as all the beasts of the field. I don't know if this story is an allegory predating the worlds, or if it is relating to the spirit of Lucifer, or simply one of his followers. Either way, I do believe there is a modicum of truth here. However, Lucifer before he turned was created by the father and mother, whatever Sophia created was unacceptable, but I do not believe it was Lucifer. However, the story itself is fascinating enough to pluck out some additional information. It is important that you read some excerpts from the Lost Gospel of John to begin to formulate the understanding of what occurred long ago. I will add my comments in bold. And our sister Sophia, is, she who came down in innocence to rectify her deficiency. Sophia is the spirit that was responsible for creating this monster called Yaldabaoth and she decided to become human to rectify her error. Therefore, she was called, Life which is the mother of the living, by the foreknowledge of the sovereignty of heaven. Sophia then came down to this realm, and she became Eve. And through her they have tasted the perfect knowledge. I, Christ, appeared in the form of an eagle on the tree of knowledge, which is the apanoia from the foreknowledge of the pure light, that I might teach them and awaken them out of the depth of sleep. One additional point, when it spoke of Eve being called life, Interesting to note in the original Hebrew, the word for Ibor Eve being taken from the rib of Adam, meant life, the word I believe was, T or T. Eve was born out of life, not from the rib Tzila. The sleep is the coma the true children are under while living in death, not realizing they are being tricked. They are being taught by using the friction of evil to awaken the pure light within. Before we go on. Let me explain what the Ipanoia means. It is the spirit that comes from an ancient time before these false worlds were created. It is the spirit of the Divine Mother the second half of the androgynous father, through her son, the Christ. This same spirit came unto Adam and Eve to awaken them to what was occurring. Now what I am about to show you might shock you. The spirit of the mother known as Barbella came into her son to reveal the secrets of the great fall, known as the sleep of death. It was Christ who had Adam and Eve take the forbidden tree, he appeared as an eagle on the tree of knowledge. The eagle must represent the spirit of Christ within Adam and Eve that which is part of them, while their souls slept. I reveal why this occurred in the first book, it shows us that the children of the father and mother were led here via their fallen choice, 
so that they could learn by education through a long process of friction under the hands of the fallen angels never to turn away from the father and mother and then eventually they could return to eternity perfected. Let's continue with this story of Adam and Eve. For they were both in a fallen state, and they recognized their nakedness. The Epinoro appeared to them as a light, she, the spirit of the Divine Mother, awakened their thinking. And when Yaldabaoth noticed that they withdrew from him, he cursed his earth. The earth belongs to the fallen ones, he found the woman as she was preparing herself for her husband. This is the area where we enter the biblical version of where Adam was supposed to know Eve, in a sexual way. But read what happened from this unique account. Yaldabaoth was lord over her, though he did not know the mystery which had come to pass through the holy decree. He was filled with ignorance and did not understand that this was all part of the plan. These gods believed they were succeeding at tricking and deceiving the true children, but in truth this was the planned operation all along. And Adam and Eve were afraid to blame him. And Yaldabaoth showed his angels his ignorance which is in him. And he cast Adam and Eve out of paradise and he clothed them in gloomy darkness. This represented being sent unto the realm of corruption and decay. This is the third dimensional simulation, where we exist now. This is the matrix program called, the DNA matrical birthing program. Notice they were cast out of paradise and sent into dark gloominess, or the heaviness of this denser dimension. Obviously, the real Eden was before they were cast upon earth. And the chief Archon saw the virgin who stood by Adam, and that the luminous epinoa of life had appeared in her. This was her soul that entered her body via the program when the spirit of the Divine Mother entered her. And Yaldabaoth was full of ignorance. And when the foreknowledge of the all noticed, it, that being the father, she sent some and they snatched life out of Eve. Life out of Eve, meant her seed-bearing children. And the chief Archon seduced her and he begot in her two sons, the first and the second, are, Elohim and Yave. Elohim has a bear face and Yave has a cat face. The one is righteous but the other is unrighteous. Yave equals YHVH and is righteous but, Elohim equals Elohim and is unrighteous. Good and evil, God and devil, Yave represented God in the garden in the form of Abel. Elohim represented the serpent, in the form of Cain. The gods were about to produce and direct their human play using the new avatars. Yave, he set over the fire and the wind, just like the god of the garden, and Elohim he set over the water and the earth, just like the serpent, and these he called with the names Cain and Abel with a view to deceive. Yave as Abel equals Lucifer. Elohim as Cain equals Satan. Now up to the present day, sexual intercourse continued due to the chief Arjun. And he planted sexual desire in her who belongs to Adam. And he produced through intercourse the copies of the bodies, and he inspired them with his counterfeit spirit. This is critical in our understanding of this event. The copy of the bodies represented that these entities were those that existed prior, but now are being fashioned as part of the DNA program. Copies of their bodies represent avatar bodies of the original aliens of Cain and Abel. The Elohim came through Cain, the unrighteous one, or the evil one, and the YHVH came through Abel, the righteous one, or good one. And we know the rest of the story, Abel was eliminated. Remember these are allegorical stories set up to teach us what happened in metaphor and symbols. These entities already existed before they came here, therefore, it reveals that through this rape of Eve, she conceived copies of the bodies of Cain, Elohim and Abel YHVH so they could now exist in this realm as humans. Now remember, Elohim means gods, and YHVH means Lord. Notice also that the two sons had a bear face and cat face, they were not completely human, but through the DNA matrix programming they created a seed that began to appear more human-like. Over time, they began to appear like humans as their blood was more properly mixed with the co-DNA matrix program. Let's continue. And the two archons he set over principalities, so that they might rule over the tomb. The tomb is what this world really is, as this series of books have revealed, we exist in a world of death. 
And when Adam recognized the likeness of his own foreknowledge, he begot the likeness of the Son of Man. He called him Seth, according to the way of the race in the Aeons. The Aeons, not to be confused with the Archons, are the spirits of the children of the father and mother, before this world was ever created. Perfect humanity lineage before earth time. Further mother. Christ. Adam. Seth. The Aeons of the perfect humanity were created, as a family lineage which, originally came from the Divine Father and Mother, as well as, Seth came from Adam before the world was. Therefore, the human Seth was also a copy of the original, just like Adam and even Christ. But we know all three were likened under Christ because he was the one who the seeds came from. Therefore, Jesus was a copy of Christ when he was upon earth. Thus, his name was Jesus the Christ. Adam named Seth because the foreknowledge revealed to him who he was and where we came from. He began to have the foreknowledge of the past knowledge of who they really were for a time and season. But here in this world Seth was a copy or duplicate of what happened above, so below. The gods were creating houses for them to live in via Cain and Abel, but Abel had to go because he didn't fit the plan as you will soon see. Humans were the tabernacles that were created for the perfect humanity that began under Seth. Adam represented the Christ via the eagle on the forbidden tree to establish the plan. And Seth represented the first seed among many as it was before the foundations of this world. Likewise, the mother, Sophia Eve, also sent down her spirit, which is in her likeness and a copy of those who are in the Pleroma, which means the totality of divine powers for she will prepare a dwelling place for the eons, that is, perfect humanity, which will come down. This is revealing how all the true children would eventually enter this world in the program as copies of who they were prior. Meaning they are the seed of their true spirit. The spirit of Barbolo, the Divine Mother, which is the dual androgynous feminine aspect of the Divine Father, sent her spirit of life into Eve whom at first was Sophia, which began the program for all the children to pass through. She sent the spirits of her very own children into Eve to pass down through the generations of humanity to have a dwelling place for the souls of her children in this realm of darkness, to continue the process. And Yaldabaoth made Adam and Eve drink the waters of forgetfulness, which came from the chief Arjun, in order that they might not know from where they came from. What's interesting here is this better solves the riddle of who this entity was, because based on the Gnostic information, Yaldabaoth was the first ruler, however, in this content it is showing, Yaldabaoth received the waters of forgetfulness from the chief Arjun. And this makes perfect sense now. Inki was the first ruler also who played the serpent healer, and YHVH was the second who then via Intrigiev or YHVH became top dog via Skullduggery. So now it matches the story. Enki lost his birthright and became second in command which happened to be the first truler, according to the Gnostics. This occurred after Adam and Eve briefly awakened via the foreknowledge of Christ as the eagle. Afterwards, Adam and Eve and all their generations would completely forget who they were and live in darkness until the awakening spirit of the same eagle enters them again via the father and mother. All of humanity has been drinking this water, which is the comatose state our souls have been restricted in until the awakening. Thus, the seed remained for a while assisting, him, in order that, when the spirit comes forth from the holy eons, he may raise up and heal him from the deficiency, that the whole pleroma may, again, become holy and faultless. This is proof of the plan revealing that the goal is to make sure all the children are eventually restored unto perfection. As in Adam all die, as in Christ all shall be made alive. This is the end of the text and my comments. What this is describing is the father and mother had a plan to process their divine children into this world of death, created by the dark legions as a way of perfecting them and protecting them against the darkness that arose from within the fallen angels via a process called friction. And once they go through this process they will once again return to the realm of perfection as the perfect holy eons. Once they enter this realm and learn of the dark ways of the fallen angels, as slaves, 
Eventually over time they will never attempt to fall away once fully awakened. And then they can be returned to the realm of perfection having built the character needed to always remain steadfast within the truth of paradise. Now continue to learn even more about who these Elohim really are. It states that three of the names that this perverted creation had was, Yoldabath, Sklus, and Samael. It stated in the secret book of John that Yoldabath was wicked because of the mindlessness that was in him. For he said, I am a jealous God, and there is no other God besides me. The one that claimed he was jealous was the God of Moses. Now here is where it gets tricky. It seems that the serpent raped Eve, but this is saying that the one who claimed he was jealous was the one who raped Eve. I believe the answer to this is that Moses was speaking to another angel of Lucifer. Read my last book called, The Forbidden Legacy of the Gods. The Bible even reveals, that Moses was speaking to an angel of the Lord at the burning bush. The Lord in question was the God of the garden, but the one who was speaking to Moses was speaking for God. This is why things get so twisted, we do not know who was who via this text. Now Laldabaoth, as it is spelled in many of the documents created twelve rulers and named them as such. 1. Athath. 2. Harmas the Jealous Eye. 3. Kalaubri. 4. The Abel. 5. Adonaios who was called Sabath or Sabbath. 6. Cain whom generations of human beings called the sun. 7. Abel. 8. Abrizine. 9. Yobel. 10. Armupiel. 11. Melchiridon. 12. Bilius the god of the underworld. I wanted to illustrate that names were given to these gods prior to becoming humans. Each one was given a name that suited the ruler and their position of authority and they became the YHVH Elohim, Lord Gods. But remember these gods existed before they came into the flesh. They are known as the Pantheon of Gods. Notice how Cain and Abel are in this list before they were ever born. When Eve was impregnated by the Lord, she conceived a son and named him Cain and then she also had another son and named him Abel. These were gods that simply began incarnating into the flesh through the union of the impregnation of Eve by the Lord, serpent in the garden. Everyone on the list above are the top dogs of this group who served Lucifer and his mindset. And all of them were provided a body and sometimes many differing bodies over the years so they could inhabit this world of illusion side by side with the children of the father and mother, who came through Seth and not Abel as revealed earlier. This is a proof that Eve was impregnated by one of the gods to bring forth more children to the gods in the flesh. So, it appears the gods could be born unto humans and even through human women. Chapter 25. Eve knew who the further was. Eve had no problem believing that her offspring were God's literal children. For when Cain was born, Eve said, I have received a man from the Lord, YHVH. It was not until Seth was born when it revealed that this was the seed of Adam. Genesis 5 3 And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image and called his name Seth. What this is revealing to us is that Adam and Eve did not know each other sexually until after the serpent took care of business. Sort of reminds me of, just Primi Noctis, or what was called the, Rite of the First Night. This is a legend where the king or nobleman of a country could take the wives before the wedding night and engage sexually with them before the husband could take his new bride. This legend appears in the story of King Gilgamesh of Uruk, as well as explained by Herodotus of the 5th century BCE. There is no doubt the gods brought in this practice until it got way out of hand. Adam and Eve were introduced to this intimate moment by the serpent impregnating Eve. And now we know what the seed of the apple really was. It was the incarnation via the insemination of Cain and Abel via the serpent through Eve. Notice it was not revealed that Cain and Abel were after the likeness and image of Adam, for they, like Adam were after the image and likeness of the gods, after their seed. And it does not say Adam beget another son or a replacement son, 
it states he begat a son, and afterwards begat sons and daughters. Cain and Abel were not Adam's seed, they were the serpent's seed. And why you may ask did the serpent want children? Remember, the gods demanded enmity between the serpent's children and the woman's children? The serpent had to have a race of offspring for their purpose to reign over humans. When it spoke of Seth, it was referencing the fact that Adam now had an offspring with Eve after his image and likeness, a human of his seed, thus Seth was the seed of Adam. And Adam's children through Eve became the generations of humanity versus that of the generations of the serpent or the gods. Therefore, the curse supposedly came against the serpent and his offspring, although once you understand this, it was never a curse against the serpent, per se, until you understand about, their war in heaven, which, the forbidden legacy of the gods, will reveal more detail. The curse was against Adam and Eve and their offspring via Seth, to be at variance with the serpent and his offspring via Cain. When you start recognizing the picture, it was Adam and Eve who were cursed, not the serpent. The curse of the serpent was basically that he was stuck here on earth to play God over humanity. In a sense, his wings were clipped and now he must slither on this dirt pile like everyone else. The truth was embedded with error to deceive, unless one understood the key to the code. God told the serpent, that he was setting ill will and hatred between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed perpetually. Remember the curse was enmity. One would receive the master status and the other would receive the slave status, or one would be the taskmaster the other the serf. As the polarity role chimes in. It is important to always recognize when the shadow lords do anything that there is always a polarity and duality and they are always behind this deceptive game template. Could a literal serpent or snake have also been cursed? A story out of England contended that a farmer found the burned body of a snake that had legs. Some believe that this proves the curse against the snake where it was made to slither instead of walk. Listen. This may have occurred by some sort of biological genetic manipulation being used by the gods, but it is not what any of this is referring to. Remember, this was not a snake, the serpent and Eve were made enemies through their common offspring. Chapter 26. In the image of. Yes, they walked and talked with the humans and they themselves also had human form, but were they? A foundation built on feeble ground leads to disaster. I have been long believed that personal study, dedication and desire to know truth will overcome all obstacles in one's way. However, today I realize that no matter how dedicated one is to locating universal answers, it truly amounts to no more than a hill of beans if our entire foundation has somehow been warped and our DNA has been manipulated. You cannot build a secure house if the foundation is in ruins. I left off in the previous segments speaking of how Cain and Abel were not Adam's actual two sons. In fact until Seth was born does it use the defining clues that Seth was in the image and likeness of Adam. This was the defining key to prove Seth was Adam's firstborn. When the Elohim first created the male and female they said they were created in the image and likeness of the gods, the Elohim. Cain's lineage is after the likeness and image of the gods, and Seth's lineage is after the likeness and image of Adam, Christ, which was now being transformed through the earth program process. Therefore, what we can ascertain by this account is that the likeness and image means much more than appearance. It must do with the soul's internal makeup. I say this because both seeds look alike, so image in the fashion of appearance is not important. It is what is inside of the image that makes up the likeness thereof. Therefore, two seeds were planted, the one being the children of the father and mother, and the other being the children of Lucifer, that is Satan. And it is in their likeness, representation, and portrait of who they really are inside that reveals the truth. Chapter 27 The Planned Curse Using Enmity The actual snake being cursed is simply a duality referencing a snake being cursed and its legs removed, versus the true gnosis of an enmity being placed between the master magician and his lineage, family of gods, aliens, against humanity. 
What this is revealing is that the gods that were play-acting, by the serpent and Lord YHVH, along with many more were going to become part of this earth and live among mankind appearing as human or like the Adam. The two seeds would appear alike. The program creators were going to have to enter their own program as part of their plan to take over due to their expulsion and fall. Thus, representing their legs, wings being cut off, and being unable to travel away from this realm or leaving this dimension to go above the fourth dimensions or higher, as if now having to slither like a snake on its belly. Many of the gods were imprisoned into their third minute realm after the war in heaven. The gods and the humans were to live together. Obviously, I have painted this picture so clearly from books one and two that it is apparent what we are witnessing, unfolding. What occurred was Cain and his children would become the tyrannical rulers over Seth's offspring and lineage to keep the division or enmity between the gods and the humans perpetually. This locked in their power play. It was not talking about a slithering or non-slithering snake, but a reptilian origin of a species gone haywire. The reason the name serpent is used is that these gods before they came to the third density earth were established on other worlds and dimensions inside other galaxies in the fourth dimension and higher, before they were imprisoned in their own creation of this virtual solar system. They were known as the reptilian race of a serpents. Yes, they are real and they do exist, as they are revealed by their fruits. Government on earth was created Nephilim style. The reptiles were to rule the humans. From this point on, one occasion after another revealed that whoever these gods are they are constantly playing both ends against the middle. Time and time again they choose to set up people so that they will succumb to their desire whether it be for good or evil, god or devil and then they punish or bless accordingly based on whatever the play calls for at the time. The serpent gods began their control of the newly DNA changed earthlings, which were once the spirit born children of the father and mother divine, but now they are encapsulated into the mask of illusion, the flesh and blood. From this point on a program was created and everyone will have to play their roles accordingly by script. Chapter 28 Ritual Blood Sacrifices why it is that humanity believes some person or animal must spill their blood for the sacrifice of others? Who gave us this concept in the first place? How can spilled blood save anything? Why do the gods always desire blood sacrifices? Death will never give life, only life will give life, death produces more death unless a transfiguration occurs, where corruption must give way under incorruption. It was these gods who devised the idea that blood must be spilled. Abel was the keeper of the sheep and Cain was the tiller of the ground. One worked with the flock while the other became the crop farmer. Both sons evidently believed they were to bring to the gods, part of their labor as a sacrifice or offering. I find it difficult to accept that they just decided to give alms without being prompted by their lords, which makes this story even more contemptuous. The gods desired sacrifice and offering via the fruit of the labor of the humans, why would a god need to eat or be pampered if they were truly gods? One thing that stands out so clearly about these gods is they had an appetite for sacrifice. And they demanded that they were given the best of the best from whatever field of work was being toiled, as good slaves do. The same system of classes still exists today with the kings and queens and elite of the world. It reminds me of the film called, A Bug's Life when the ants toiled for the grasshoppers, and even though there were many more ants than grasshoppers, the grasshoppers used their knowledge to ferment the idea that the ants were helpless and needed the grasshoppers to exist. The gods were acting as royalty that wanted to be served as a higher class by the peasants. In the movie A Bug's Life, it describes this very mentality. Yet Christ taught the act of service, even if you have a title of nobility, you should bow down before others, even those considered being of less importance. I truly doubt Cain and Abel did this as some sort of goody two-shoe thing, simply because, as you will notice, Cain's offering was not accepted, but Abel's was. It kind of reminds me when people give gifts to one another. We may not always appreciate the gift but we surely should see the intent of the spirit of the gift, 
if it truly is a gift and not a request. Evidently not to these gods though. When Cain and Abel brought forth their sacrifice to the gods, they were pleased with Abel's but were not so pleased with Cain's sacrifice. The Christian world has often cited that Abel gave the best of the best, a first fruit of his flock whereas it does not say this about Cain, so they figured he must have just dumped whatever was left over to the gods, from his yield. I have a very hard time believing this scenario. Also, Abel's offering was of the first fruit of the flock and was exactly what the gods have always desired. They were obviously more into meat than vegetables. Well in truth you can't drain blood out of turnips. They always sought out for sheep or lambs to be their sacrificial offering. Abel's arms would obviously be more respected. Cain was angry because Abel's sacrifice was accepted but his was not. It stated Cain became angry and his countenance fell. Why would Cain care so much that his offering was unacceptable, if he was just giving them the proverbial finger? If he didn't even take the time to bring to the gods what was ordered, then what did he expect? The Elohim came to Cain and asked him, Why are you so angry, like they didn't know? Why HVH continued, If you do well you will be accepted, and if you do not do well sin lies at your door. Wait a second, do well to be accepted? If this was just something being done in the goodness of their heart, then what could be defined as doing well or not doing well? And, notice, it doesn't say if you do not do well then you won't be accepted. Strange isn't it, why this wasn't included? Instead it said, sin lies at your door. It should be the thought that counts. Obviously, what we are seeing here is that Cain and Abel were commanded to bring forth an offering to the Lord, and this must mean they knew exactly what it was that they were to offer. For some reason, either Cain was mentally ill and couldn't figure out the request, or he just tried to stick it to the gods, or he knew exactly what to bring, yet, for some reason, Cain's offering was not acceptable. Let's be honest what good are slaves unless you receive of the fruits of their hard work and the abundance thereof? I found the last comment very intriguing in Genesis 4-7 in speaking to Cain, it stated, and unto thee shall be his desire and you shall rule over him. What? And you shall rule over him. The gods were not only wanting a sacrifice they were revealing a hidden royal agenda. Keep this in mind. Chapter 29. Cain and Abel were pawns. Cain and Abel are brothers and I am sure they knew what to offer up to the gods, but for some reason Cain's offering was rejected. And the gods knew that this would incite enmity between Cain and Abel. This is proven when the gods decry that sin was at Cain's door because of his anger. Now does this really sound like Cain was trying to stick it to the gods, or were the gods as they so often do tricking Cain to become angry with Abel? But why? Reason this through, I truly doubt that Cain was that ignorant of the gods' request. I am sure that if he became so angry with Abel because the gods accepted his offering, then that must mean that this was very important to Cain to be approved by the gods or else why would he care and become so angry? Could it be that the gods knew that their denouncing Cain's offering and going out of their way to accept Abel's offering was going to produce animosity between the two, which was the very enmity that was required from the beginning? However, there was a problem. Cain and Abel were blood equals, so the enmity game would not apply here and therefore one of them had to go. In all appearances, Cain looks like the bad guy and Abel looks like the good guy, in the good versus evil program, that is God versus devil. But in truth what we are being revealed is nothing but the same ruthless diabolical entrapment being set up by the gods to fulfill a hidden agenda. And part of those plans was to set up Cain over Abel from the very beginning the one who was to lord over him. So, why would these gods have chosen the evil one? Abel gave them what was required and it was accepted. So, what was the gods' real agenda? Chapter 30. Beginning of the Royal Bloodline. I said that the last part of Genesis 4-7 was very revealing, because the gods were explaining what the real agenda was. They told Cain, that if he did well his offering would be accepted, but if he did not do well, sin will materialize at his door. What was the sin that was laying at his door? 
they knew full well what it was. It was that Cain was going to kill Abel. However, the odd part of the last section was not based on the word if. The word if was already described above, that if Cain did not do well he would end up doing something diabolical. It did not say he would no longer have the right of rule. Now we enter another context of the same sentence, and it is saying, and unto you shall be his, Abel's, desire, and you shall rule over him. Therefore, we can now see the blue blood agenda being established and we are witnessing firsthand that the gods were telling Cain that this was all being set up so that he would become the blue blood royal line to rule over the secondary line. Wait. There was a problem. The plan could not work like this and the gods knew it. Abel had to go. What this tells me is Cain and Abel, born of the same interaction between the serpent and Eve. These were obviously twin sons, born at the same time with one advancing earlier than the other, out of the womb. Read it again and again until you recognize the plan that was set from the beginning. Why was there ever a need for one brother to rule over the other unless what I am revealing about the enmity, using royal blood via the controlling gods is the complete truth? Why does there need to be one that rules over the other? Jesus said, Do not do as the heathen, or the gods of old, had done, where one rules or lords over another. The secondary line could not be Abel or his generations, because Abel was also of the blue blood royal line and he was also of a direct birth of the serpent's interaction with Eve, his mother, giving him her DNA blood of the gods. The very fact that Cain and not Abel was being offered the rule over him speech, especially after Abel's offering was the one that was accepted and not Cain's, seems diabolical, yet it proves what their mindset was in this text. Cain was the firstborn twin, and now he must make sure the enmity plan works as desired. Chapter 31. Abel the Non-Blessed Sacrifice. We now realize that the gods needed to eliminate Abel as the sacrificial lamb, because Cain was already a higher-ranked god before coming here as you have witnessed earlier in the Gnostic version from the Nag Hammadi. Abel became the lamb of God to be sacrificed for the enmity, sin, of all people. That is the lineage of Cain. Does this sound familiar? Abel was sacrificed as a blood offering as the son of God for Cain's sin, which would run throughout all his generations. Abel had to be killed as a sacrifice unto the gods to fulfill their blood royal plan to where the gods rule over humans. Now we see the sacrifice Cain was supposed to offer before the gods. It was not the first fruits of the land, that was unacceptable, it was the blood of his brother Abel, the sheep herder that needed to be sacrificed for the plan to function properly. And this was accepted even though the appearance seemed contrary. And voila, now we know the origin of blood sacrifices, to forgive sin. Oh, come on, God would not desire the sacrifice of a human, oh ye, remember the story of Abraham? Remember when he was told to kill his favorite son, Isaac, as a sacrifice to God? Now of course the response would be, Yes but he did not do it, God stopped him and placed an animal in his stead. All God wanted from Abraham was to see if he was faithful. Faithful? The attempted sacrificing and spilling the blood of your own son makes you faithful, before the gods? Today we would call it attempted murder, by reason of insanity. And furthermore, why in the world would Abraham even consider it unless this practice was something much wider in occurrence, meaning the gods had asked for it before and received it? If someone claiming to be God came to you and desired for you to sacrifice one of your children, would you? Come on I will repeat it again, would you? Yet the greater fact about this story is, Hasn't the Christian religious world believed God sent his only son to be a sacrifice for all humanity, as a blood offering? From the beginning, I stated that the gods made humanity to become slaves. I was being nice, they made the human being to worship them as gods through trickery to become a continual blood sacrifice for their wicked desire of extracting energy through death, something that is still in practice today by the same gods. These were misfit aliens, they were not the eternal flame of love that burns in all hearts of the true children of the father and mother that exists in all universes and dimensions. 
These were the, fallen angels. Chapter 32, Birth of Seth Home of Perfect Humanity The Seth line had to come into existence to represent the slaves of the gods in the flesh, but more importantly to fulfill the process of death until life. There were many other races of humans, and ancient tribes, like the Dogons, Aborigines etc. However I am not speaking of the different races and how they got here over time. I am speaking of the plan and what occurred on this planet in this realm. The other races would eventually be brought within the fold in time. I will reveal much more on this topic in, Their Forbidden Legacy of the Gods. I am revealing how all of this began, and the usage of specific names as to its beginnings, using stories that have been handed down over the ages. Now the question is, what about the rest of humanity, those that are not blue bloods? Does this mean we are only here to become slaves to angry fallen gods with no hope at all? Absolutely, not. We of humanity that are the true seeds are the children from higher realms last long ago because we began to follow a party or faction that began to develop in our consciousness that prescribed to the law of good and evil, rather than purity and love. We became curious about all sorts of things, one of which was play acting in fake worlds and acting out fabricated scenarios. We wanted to be part of simulated virtual realities, almost like, the game called, a second life. I believe the fourth dimension was created as a playground for spirits, but it was misused and abused. We were sucked into this deception long before we came to Earth. However, it was all part of the plan of the father and mother to allow this realm to exist by free choice as a perfecting agent for their children, via the law of friction. Even though these gods believe they are running the show, they have forgotten how powerful the father and mother really are and how their wisdom is so very much higher than the wisdom of the fallen ones. The father and mother are looking down and saying, OK, they want to play these games, then we will let them, but with our rules attached. Let the shadow lords believe they are the ones directing the movie when in fact the father and mother are truly in total control behind the scenes. And the reason they can have this kind of control is because unlike the gods, the father and mother are not external players, they exist within all the true souls. And whether their children can awaken, at any given time, the divine parents can direct the program from within, in a myriad of ways. Ultimately nothing can happen to the true children that the father and mother do not allow. And with embedded rules of the game and their use of this situation to bring about perfection in their own children, reveals their wisdom was incalculable. Chapter 33 The Seth and Cain Bloodlines The lineage of Cain and Seth spawned the same names in the secret bloodline, huh? Seth's blood lineage became the servant, slaves. Now we must get into the core of the bloodlines and the deception that is heralded along the way. It is so very interesting in that the names of the children of one specific line were all the same between Cain and Seth. Now how is that even possible? Notice Cain and Seth's offspring in Genesis 4 and 5. Both Seth and Cain seem to have identical names for their children via one specific lineage down through five generations. This is quite odd when you realize that Cain was forced out into the land of Nod at the east of Eden. Supposedly he was not around his family and seemingly doubtful that he had even known Seth personally when the children of both fathers and the children's children were being born for hundreds of years into the future. Yet, Seth and Cain both have children which begin naming them all the same names in this one lineage. Now what are the odds of this occurring? Let me explain what I mean. When kings and queens have children, usually the firstborn is prepared to rule their kingdom. The rest of the children are not as important and fall away into history as an insignificant prince or princess. Now when the firstborn of the royal king or queen has children the same thing applies. And this goes down through every generation. There is only one line that is special above all the children that are ever born. There could be millions of children from these unions, but only one lineage is important. Each father begat many sons and daughters down through the generations, but it was the blue blood royalty that all scripture concerns itself with, 
which are named in one specific line. Now the chances of that occurring with the entire single lineage being named the same for possibly five or more generations is stunning, more in tune with, impossible. Without either some sort of secret setup between the two groups or they are the same people, there is little chance that the names would be the same. I guess their names were to change to protect the innocent, except, they didn't change their names, oops. The key is, that all the names were the same except for one small problem, in the Hebrew language words were slightly changed over generations as the language morphed in time. And, three of the sons were flip-flopped in the lineage to make it appear as if they existed at different periods, but soon all will know better. Those who were responsible for placing the names of Seth and Cain's lineage onto scrolls did so at different intervals when the language was tweaked over the years. To me this looks like collusion of some future editors and even some of the high priests to disorient the reader on the truth of this matter. Now either you will write this off as a strange coincidence or you will begin to open your mind to grasp a more serious truth here. Manipulation Chapter 34 the mark of Cain. We were told when Cain was sent away that God placed a mark on him to protect him from anyone killing him, and if they did then the killer would be punished seven times over. If Cain was marked in Eden and cast out, how would anyone know about the mark other than his own family or being revealed by Cain himself? That would seem sort of odd that Cain would be telling people that if you touch me then God will mark you and you will suffer great punishment. And the people would reply why? Cain would then have to reply, because I sinned against God. Of course, they may wonder, what was this dude smoking? The facts as we were revealed taught, most everyone left the Garden of Eden and few remained behind, not even the gods. Most left and began to populate this world with both races of children. And the physical Eden prototype disappeared via earth changes. The question is, why did God place a mark of protection on Cain, the disobedient one? Think about it, he was the first murderer, he disobeyed, his sacrifice was unacceptable and yet God places a protection mark on Cain. Why? Geneva Bible, Genesis 4:15. Then the Lord said unto him, Doubtless whosoever slayeth Cain, he shall be punished sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man finding him, should kill him. God set a mark of protection on Cain to make sure no one killed him, and if they did they would be punished sevenfold. Obviously, the gods could not allow Cain to be killed, he was their choice, and he was the royal bloodline. To have to do this all over again would be insane. Cain, had to remain long enough to have children. Eventually Cain was murdered and so was his son, Tubalcan at the hands of Lamech, but by then the bloodline was established. So now we must figure out what trick or game is being played that both Seth's lineage and Cain's lineage are all that named the same. Chapter 35 Did the Flood Eliminate Cain's Line? I find it interesting that none of Cain's lineage are given ages as Seth's lineage shows. There is no way to compare the two as if written like this purposely to throw one off course. When you begin to add the pieces to the puzzle, based on the biblical information, if the flood story was accurate based on what we have been handed down through the ages, then none of Cain's line would have existed after the flood, only Seth's lineage. Only Noah and his family of Seth's line would exist. Thus, Cain and his lineage would have been masked out of existence, or hidden. Kind of shocking since we now know Cain was to be the royal bloodline of the gods, to establish the enmity between the serpent's children and Eve's children. What was the purpose of protecting him if the flood was to eradicate his whole lineage, anyway? Another area we must consider about Adam and Seth. Adam had many sons and daughters that reveal no lineage at all in the Bible. What happened to these people, beyond Seth and his offspring? Seth also was said to have had many sons and daughters. What are witnessing here is a single lineage that the Bible has set apart to become very important for the plan of the gods to eventually set up their false Christ as you will soon learn. One small single bloodline has become so important to the world, 
yet all the children of this lineage had many more children that are not defined anywhere. Now what needs to be understood is it appears Seth was the third-born son of Eve and first-born of Adam. Nowhere does it imply until after Seth had been born that Adam had other sons, although he possibly had daughters. Seth was the third son born unto Eve and the first direct from Adam's seed. So, who was it that Cain married? It states when Cain was sent away that he took a wife, but how is this possible? Where would he have found a wife in the Garden of Eden, given this primal information? Did Cain marry a sister? Was there a sister to even marry? Did Adam and Eve have daughters before Cain killed Abel? I believe it was possible for Adam and Eve to have had daughters between Cain's killing Abel and the birth of Seth, in fact since Adam was 130 years old when he had his first son, there is no doubt that other children were born prior. Because the Bible stated Seth was born after the image and likeness of Adam representing his first real born son, after the death of Abel. But it does not discount that daughters were already born which would not have taken the biblical likeness test of being in the image of Adam, because the daughter was female. Did Cain and Seth marry their own sisters? Like I stated earlier there were other races already on planet earth that the Bible makes little mention of, so it is possible Cain found his wife amongst other races. However, it is more than likely with the information we have been given that Cain had to marry within his own blood. Cain would have needed to marry his own blood sister to continue the blood dominance. If he married out of his blood to a lower race of bloods, then the purer blood, which gave them power would have been diluted. It is also more than likely that daughters were also born via the interaction of the serpent and Eve either at the same time of the original impregnation or a later time that would then become Cain's wife and Seth more than likely married a sister whom was born of Adam's seed. Chapter 36. The Lineage Paradigm Let's start putting it all together. Cain's first son was called Enoch. Seth's first son was named Enos. Some have believed that Enos was Enoch, however another Enoch appears in Seth's line later. What are we to make of this? Just at first glance it is obvious how close the names are with both lineages of Cain and Seth. First under Cain. Enoch, Irad, Mahujael, Methusael, Lamech. Now under Seth. Enos, Canaan, Mahalaleel, Jared, Enoch, Methusela, Lamech. Every name below Cain is the same name in a different order or spelled differently under Seth, below Canaan. Interesting also the name Canaan, is strangely close to Cain. But why is the order different with all the names being the same? Was this to throw people off? Example, Cain's line shows Enoch being the father to Jared, Irad and Seth's line shows Jared, Irad being the father to Enoch. The letters J and I in Hebrew often interchange with each other due to the morphing language. It is the same exact name in two different Hebrew translations, and more than likely being the same person. What would happen if I took a little bit of license here and simply flipped the line under Canaan right side up starting with Enoch in Seth's line, watch closely what happens, they line up perfectly. Cain equals Canaan. Enoch equals Enos equals Enoch. Irad equals Jared. Mahujael equals Mahalaleel. Methusael equals Methusela. And of course Lamech is still Lamech. One may wonder why I would do this, I am simply showing that this is too coincidental not to be a glaring deception, and if someone was trying to hide this fact it would make sense they were playing around with the names to throw us off. What appears is Seth was written right out of history. And this would fit perfectly as to something these gods would have done make Seth look inferior to their royal bloods, and yet at the same time make him the hero. But what happened to Seth and his lineage? So now we see both lines being identical under Cain and Canaan. Could this be where the splicing of both lines took place? Is it possible that Enos being Seth's firstborn son went into a different direction, and then they simply added Canaan as Cain to the list? Or as Enos slash Enoch, Cain's first-born son, but added to the line of Seth to create confusion? 
Once we do a little flipping around suddenly now Seth's lineage lines up with Gaines, for even Enos, Enoch now comes into play. But what are we saying here, was Seth, Cain? Is this a major coincidence? Why are these names the same? What can our conclusion be? Did Seth ever exist? Was he not the firstborn of Adam in his likeness and image? Or is it that Seth was simply relegated to a know-nothing? Nevertheless, the story was changed by the writers to make Seth out the hero and Cain the enmity, evil one to create enough confusion where most would never realize what had occurred, and sadly like clockwork, most haven't. When the serpent, YHVH of the Elohim raped Eve, it began the royal lineage that would become the middleman to the people direct from the gods. In effect the royal bloods would become the enmity of the people, almost like a prison guard. What people fail to see is the Bible centers its attention on one lineage only of important people, and the rest. Well they obviously didn't care. Yet within this lineage there are many more children that are never mentioned and never heard of again. It is because they are not of any importance to the plan. The blue bloods were considered the dominant line. All the rest were considered the lowly sheep that follow, even if they were born of the blue bloods. The blue bloods had to mate with only those of the dominant line to keep it pure for royalty sake, but they also mated liberally and produced children all over the world in all races. Many of them married their own sisters and daughters to keep the line as pure as they could. You will be shocked when you read, The Forbidden Legacy of the Gods, how this continued down through very important biblical heroes. And it is also why Cain probably married his own sister, a female born unto the serpent king. If Noah was all that was left and his lineage came from Seth as we were made to believe, then what happened to Cain's lineage? What if Noah's lineage was spawned from Cain and not Seth? What if Cain's lineage melded with Seth's lineage, and they were connected somehow? Remember in Genesis 6, it stated that the sons of God, Cain's lineage, were marrying the daughters of men, Seth's lineage, it this it, is this the missing link to this puzzle? Then who were the righteous ones? I believe Seth existed and his lineage was melded together with Cain's lineage. Remember everyone always says Cain was the evil one and it was Seth who was the righteous line, but they use the same lineage of people, throwing everyone off the track, and Seth and his children fade away as being unimportant by fiat. Of course, you are not supposed to know this. Therefore, in twisting the facts, they say Cain was evil, but then they honor and obey Cain and his lineage because of the hidden switch. Just more of the same deception. So now it makes more practical sense how all of this began. Yet based on the Bible when the flood came it supposedly killed everyone except Noah and his family. That means all the rest of the Seth line and all Cain's line, were wiped out. So, what happened to Cain's lineage since he was to rule over humanity? If all that was left was Noah and his family, and they were Seth's lineage. Then the gods were removed, but we know this never happened. Obviously taking the word of the Bible it was only Noah, and by his righteousness his family was saved. Based on this information none of Cain's or Seth's children remained righteous. All of them went into sin where the shadow lords wanted to erase everyone, except Enoch, as he supposedly walked upright with God. Noah was accepted as being righteous beyond Enoch who was to have walked with God and died much earlier, or better stated, simply left the program. However, the Bible said Noah was perfect in his generations, that means his bloodline was pure, not his character. It didn't say perfect of his generations. I am sorry I got a massive problem with this, because we know now that the only pure bloodline was Cain's lineage. For Seth's lineage was corrupted often by intermarrying, as stated by Genesis 6. If my theory is correct that this lineage was Cain's, then Noah was in the direct lineage as a son of Cain, but here is the catch-22, he was also in the lineage of Seth. How is this possible? Because both lineages are the same people in this one line. The statement, perfect in the generations proves Noah's blood was perfect from the gods and it was never defiled. How could it have been defiled? Because of the intermarriage of Cain's line into Seth's line. 
revealed in general 6. However, this is saying Noah was pure. His line was never tampered with. Read closely below. Genesis 6 9 These are the generations of Noah, Noah was a man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Remember, God was good, and Satan was evil in the good and evil tree. Noah came from the serpent through Cain, but he also came from the Adam through Seth. Remember it is all the same gods, playing different roles, with humanity interspliced within. Both seeds would appear alike. Noah was a just man, meaning good in the sight of the gods, and he was perfect in his generations. He was a pure blood, Nephilim. We also see Enoch walked with God in the same bloodline, and Enoch was supposed to be the firstborn of Cain and or Seth. And yet even after Noah where supposedly the entire world was wiped out except for these eight people, the world became evil again. Why? Could it be this is the way it has always been in the good and evil plan? Cleanse the evil at the end, and begin again, allowing evil to return. Like a continuous loop in a bad movie. There was no more Cain or his supposed lineage based on the Bible to corrupt the earth. What good was the flood if the people became evil again? If Noah was righteous and he and his family were the only ones left, who could have been the culprit to make the world become so evil again? And then the place called by the gods, Babel, confusion was built in direct defiance of the gods, just a few generations later? The answer is quite simple. No matter who was supposedly righteous, the curse of enmity would always remain. For the curse was given by the gods to last forever. Read my science fiction novel series called The Time Loop Chronicles. Once again, we come to a new story that is as old as the hills. It is all about lineage and royalty and curses and punishments. It is all about a planting and harvesting and a time loop where souls are receded to do it over again. What happened to Noah's righteousness? There was supposedly no more Cain to blame, did Noah's children all rebel from the perfect righteous ones? Or have we been conned? If you have been following closely enough the answer is right there, the gods created humans, they then seeded humans with one of their own. Then the humans seeded their own spawn likened unto themselves. Yet both were still human brought forth by a human mother of the matrix programming. These were not different humans, they were seeded with different souls. The story we were given is an allegory, it is to teach us what happened using stories. The facts are, there is only one humanity, and within that humanity are two seeds of different natures. Chapter 37 Noah's Children and Their Kingdoms did the gods play the same trick on the remaining survivors of the flood, and make sure they failed? Was Babel evil, or was it once again the story of the tree of knowledge where the gods were getting upset to learn that the people were becoming too much like them? Genesis 11 5 8 And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and they confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them abroad the face of the earth, and they left off from building the city. Therefore, is the name called Babel, because the Lord did therefore confuse the languages of all the earth? To insert a thought here, I believe it is possible that when the sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth were separated according to their language and nation, that this occurred after the Babel incident, even though the Babel incident was the following chapter. It was from the lineage of Ham that several powerful cities were created, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt etc. Nimrod was the founder of many of the later most powerful cities in the world. Noah's sons began to represent important figures concerning land, power, mass, and wealth. Japheth became the father to the part of the world we know as Asia and Russia and most likely took over rule of the real Asians and early Indians, which leads me to realize that obviously not everyone was wiped out by the flood as we were told. Because of the differing races that came from Noah and his children this would not be possible if Noah's lineage was pure blood, 
but if his children took other wives beyond their original wives, of other races then it would be understandable. It may have been a local area where the cross-breeding was most evident, and that is why other races were discovered. If that were the case where do the other races that exist on earth come from after the flood since the only family that was left was a single race perfect in their generations? Other races had to have survived the flood. In fact, I believe most of them did with the possibility that a couple of them became extinct. Ham became the father to parts of the Middle East, but most predominantly Africa and possibly parts of Europe where the black people that existed previously must have been brought in by intermarriage via Ham and his children. But what about Shem? Noah had three sons, the royal lineage never continues through all the children, it is only one line that this royal lineage continues. The lands were divided up between Ham and Japheth during this period. However, all the sons were considered special because they were all the same blood, so obviously, they all would rule in some format over the lesser ones or lower bloods. I reveal a mind-boggling thesis in, The Forbidden Legacy of the Gods, and who these three sons really were. Cush's son Nimrod was a builder of Babel as well as many other cities. It was Ham's children that had the most impact on building important cities in the Middle East and Africa, but they were not the chosen blue blood royals, just an offshoot of them, but they were still of royalty. Two of Ham's sons were named Mizraim, which became the forerunner of the Egyptians. The other was named Canaan, which is where Israel stole the land from the people called the Canaanites later. Many of Ham's sons became very important as power brokers for major cities being established on earth. However, with Shem something seems radically different. Why? Chapter 38 Creation of the Babel Spaceport If we continue the royal line that started with Cain here is what we will begin to see occur. Cain Enoch Jared Mahalaleel Methuselah Lamech Noah Shem, Ham, Japheth Shem is the one that was chosen to continue the special royal lineage of these gods. These became the shepherd kings of Seth, and the pharaohs of Ham, over the great cities that were being built. It is my belief that the reason the gods were upset with the building of Babel was because the people were beginning to understand the tree of knowledge again. And the tower they were building was not just a tower as we would think of it. In fact it was a ship that was being built to allow for transportation to space, where the gods hailed from. The Sumerians called these ships, Shims, as noted earlier. It stated in two of the occasions during the building of the tower that the gods came down to see what was going on. We never seem to ask the pertinent question, came down from where? They were upset because if the people continued to go forward with this plan, nothing would have been withheld from them including space travel. Let us begin to prove this, the people moved into the land of Shinar, Shinar was a flat terrain, and a good place to erect a city and a tower. But why did they choose a flat terrain? Secondly, what was it that they were really building and for what purpose? What I am seeing is, the people wanted to get off the earth. It is my belief that Eden was also a transport between earth and space as we have glimpsed upon earlier. But what I am seeing in these verses explains it perfectly as to what the people in Shinar were really doing. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Let us take it step by step, first step, the people wanted to build a city. Obviously, this was not going to be just any city. The reason for the city was obvious, they wanted to build a complex. Therefore, this city was probably a manufacturing plant where engineering and processing would become part of the foundational enterprise for the building of this multiport, towards this city and tower. Notice they wanted to build a city and a tower, but what differentiates the tower from the city? If this was a skyscraper like we have today, it is included in the building of the city. However, this tower was special beyond that of the city, and the entire project was all about the building of this structure, for some odd reason. 
The major purpose for the building of the city was because they needed an enclosed manufacturing plant with many buildings, for technology, science and engineering and probably dwelling places to live, work and eat. All of it was one huge metropolis as the people came together to do three things, and that was to build a city and a tower, plus something else. Notice their ambitions of building this tower was not some idle fancy. They wanted the tower to reach under the heavens. They wanted it to reach into outer space. Obviously, it is impossible to build anything material-wise that could enter beyond Earth's atmosphere into the heavens. It ain't possible, as it stated, a tower to reach unto the heavens. Now based on the Hebrew word for tower it was called a, Mygdal. A Mygdal is a raised platform. A raised platform is not going to reach unto the heavens, therefore the tower itself was not the thing that was to reach unto the heavens. However, a raised platform is perfect for a launching pad, somewhat akin to a ziggurat, where these were flat platformed pyramids with steps leading to the top. Now getting back to the key word heavens, it comes from the Hebrew word shemen, it means the place of the stars, the place where God or the gods dwell, their abode. We know this was not about building a skyscraper, this tower was a launching pad for a flying machine that could reach into the heavens. How do we know it was a flying machine? We'll continue with the next portion of the verse, so that we may make a name, for ourselves, the key word here is name, as related earlier, this word comes from the Hebrew word, Shem. According to the late Zechariah Sitchin, he revealed that the cuneiform texts that were discovered from the lost ancient Sumerians revealed that the Shem was an upright fixture, and it was known to be in type, a rocket or vehicle or ship to the heavens. Even in the Strong's exhaustive concordance it reveals the name Shem is also a monument. So here we see these people moved out into an empty place in the land of Shana as revealed here, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shana, and they dwelt there. They were seeking acreage, lots of acreage and a flat area so they could build the first Nasa, in type. The word plain represented a level valley. The city they were building was most likely a space agency. Obviously, they saw it done with the gods, so they decided they would duplicate what they had done. However, they were doing this for themselves. As we move through the context of these verses we begin to see the reason why they were building a launching pad and a Shem that is spaceship. The last part of the verse is the entirety of the key. Otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Whatever they were building, being scattered about the face of the earth would never change unless it was that they were building spaceships to go to the heavens. There it is, the people were looking for a way to leave the planet, and this is obvious. They were not trying to make a name for themselves, as if they wanted to become popular, they wanted to flee away from the controls. They wanted to become like the gods so they could escape the bondage of earth. And remember most of these people were the ancestors of the gods. They were just trying to find a way to go back home. When you think about it, what was the curse of confusion that God gave unto these people? It stated that he confused their languages to cause them to be scattered all over the face of the earth. Voila, there it is, the gods answered the question, they were making sure the people were stuck here on earth and not allowing them to travel away. The people were afraid of being slaves to earth when they remembered they used to travel the heavens. The gods cursed them and sure enough they were scattered over the earth. Being scattered upon the earth was not the issue, it was being stuck on the earth, and there reveals the true intent of the curse of mixing the languages. This sounds very familiar as when the serpent told Eve if she took of the tree standing in the center of the garden, then she would become like the gods. What was this tree? What was this erected edifice standing in the center? Well, I believe we now have the evidence we were looking for. Eden was also an area for a launching pad, and in the center of the Garden of Eden, they had a spaceship, something very large that stood erect, as a monument. And it was the delivery pod to the sky where the gods came to and fro all the time. It is tantamount to the knowledge of Jacob's ladder which could enter heaven. Genesis 28:12 and he dreamed 
and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. I am sure the ladder were steps that led into a flying ship, and the ship went into heaven. It didn't mean they built steps all the way into heaven. This is what Eve was introduced to, and no doubt she may have even been escorted on a soul assistant trip. So where did these gods come down from? Were they living on a different planet? Could be, maybe, even the moon. Yes indeed, I believe it is correct in both cases. These gods also lived on other planetoid bodies in our solar system. If they were truly using a rocket to get into space, chances are they needed a substation to travel to. And a rocket would be perfect for that, especially to go to the moon. With technology like this, the little people would be way too close to the gods and would stop following them once they understood they had the power to fly away, and no longer be controlled. But why wouldn't they think this way? They were the offspring of the gods, except they were cursed with enmity and spiked with a lower DNA. The gods created the confusion. The gods scrambled more than language. They scrambled the purpose for why this was all being done. Instead they initiated their bloodline of royals to take back control under the line of Shem to become the ruling hierarchy over the masses. The lineage of Shem was placed as the world controllers so that the purpose of humans would never be unified in one mind or spirit, that the enmity would always divide them in confusion. Until this day, no nation on this planet can come together unless the gods deem it so, elsewise there is nothing but animosity and war brother against brother, sister against sister, father and against son and mother against daughter. The Shem line continued and became the ruling blue bloods and most likely the line of the kings of Sumer and the shepherd Hyksos pharaohs, which eventually would lead into the famed Israel. This is truly an interesting story but I do not have time to reveal it here, read my book called, The Forbidden Legacy of the Gods The Most Critical Biblical Expose Ever. The lineage continues. Shem. Arfaxat. Salah. Eber. Beleg. Re. Sarug. Neha, possibly Pharaoh Naka. Terra, possibly Pharaoh Esra. Abraham, possibly Pharaoh Mamai Bra. Isaac. Jacob and Esau. This is where the massive separation began. Seth's line continued through Esau and has all but been forgotten and cast away. Cain's line continued through Jacob, and their lineage rules the earth even until today. Chapter 39, Lord Archon's Rulers of the Cosmos Notice, John 8, 23, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. John 12, 31 Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. There are two keys revealed here and they are powerful. First, the term world being used in these phrases, when Christ said he is not part of this world, also this verse was referencing the prince of this world. The term world translates to cosmos. It represents the entire universe, it is not referring to earth alone. This universe is a fraud, this cosmos is fake. It is not real, it does not belong to the Father nor the Christ, and it is simply a creation of darkness, decay and death, from the mind realm of the fourth dimension. We see the beauty of this earth and the stars in space, and its amazing glory, but this beauty is a copy that we are witnessing, it is a fake, a forgery, not the real thing. Lucifer simply copied what the Father and Mother created from his memory and mind, and use the design for his own cosmos, because he could not create anything eternally, everything he designs, builds and creates, decays, because it comes from corruption of the mind. And then he set it up as a simulation or artificial spirit using the fourth dimensional projection of the copy to create a holographic cosmos in the third dimension to give matter the appearance of spirit, or what would later be termed an artificial spirit. What we have here is a very impressive albeit massive computer mind program. Now I say massive from our limited point of view. We peer out and see stars, worlds and galaxies beyond number, and the distances are inconceivable. Yet it is simply a simulation, there is no time and space, 
it does not exist, it is just a simulated experience to give us a feel of what the programmers designed. We are told that light travels in access of 186,000 miles per second. And a light year is about 6 trillion miles in distance. We recognize the magnitude of this seemingly limitless creation, but it is all a con, a perception that the program is modulating. The term above where it states the prince of this world translated means, the archon of the universe. This gives it a totally unique and different ramification. From the Greek, the definition of archon means, ruler or lord, the lord of this universe. The name YHVH or Jehovah means lord and ruler also, as you already know. The verse above states, now is the judgment of this world and the judgment of the ruler of this world, when he is cast out. The term now does not mean a thousand years later, or even a hundred or even fifty. It means now, contemporary based on these writings. Obviously, the prince and arch and ruler of this universe is still very much active long after Christ spoke these words. Nothing has changed in the universe. What did Christ mean by using the term, now? It reveals the judgment is ongoing, it is a process. The knowledge of this judgment had already begun long before Christ made this statement. This judgment will continue until every true seed, soul has been recovered by the father and mother. However, this is revealing a secret. The polar half of Lucifer, is named Satan, and it was Satan that was cast out of the heavens unto earth where his judgment had begun. Satan is the prince archon of the earth, and Lucifer is the fallen god of the heavens. As Christ said, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And the law is the condemnation, representing, death to all seeds perpetually, until the transformation that was revealed in their, their forbidden knowledge, children of the harvest, occurs for all. It states, heaven and earth shall not pass until all is fulfilled. The statement in the usage of now represents the judgment is ongoing, and will continue long past the harvest that is about to occur again in our day as a repetitive event that occurs in cycles. Chapter 40 Why HVH was an Archon The ancient Gnostics reveal much about the Archons, but this information was masked over in the Bible or simply retranslated incorrectly to create confusion. As above, we see the Prince of this world, it means, Archon of the Universe. This name Arjun is found in the last books of the Nag Hammadi that had been buried and then finally discovered, which revealed an entire library of books that teaches much about the fallen Archons who rule this world from secret places, calling them Demiurges. A Demiurge is the ruler of the three-dimensional matter cosmos and some of them rule from the lower fourth dimension. Therefore, it is important that you finally grasp that the rulers of this world represent the gods of our universe which is a holographic mind-controlled realm. The fall of the angels did not occur overnight. They didn't just treble and then they were cut off or sent to this realm. They were existing on different worlds, planets, galaxies all over the fourth dimension and even the third dimensions as worlds were projected into matter. And so are many of us living on different worlds prior to even coming here. The allegorical Garden of Eden reveals our ultimate fall but it does not reveal the time frame when all of this took place. Sometimes your dreams will reveal just how wide the scope of your soul mind has traveled around the cosmos. Again, I repeat the third and fourth dimensions are not evil, but are often used for evil if the mind begins to warp and begin to allow a faulty character. We have all lived in different worlds different galaxies, and different dimensions. But the rebellion became so overwhelming and powerful the father and mother finally put a stop to it. They realized it was only going to get worse. Therefore, Lucifer and his minions were finally somewhat confined, if that is a viable word in this instance to a virtual world where the fallen angels and fallen children are locked together until the process has been completed. Chapter 41 fallen angels taking on other forms. 
As this content unfolds we begin to ascertain that when the Lord YHVH spoke and said these words, that there were no other gods before him, this revealed that no part of humanity as well as the gods who served him were to obey anyone other than Lucifer. For he controls all. But if he really was the controller of all, then who would be there to offset this reality? God did not speak to Moses at the burning tree, an angel of God spoke to him. This is disconcerting due to the fact how can an angel say, have no other gods before me, if this wasn't truly God? The angel of God that spoke to Moses was a go-between, one who served a higher authority. This angel was the hierarchical leader on earth as one who represented Lucifer from above. Moses was not speaking to some phantom ghost. He was speaking to someone who appeared like a man. Yet this man came in the authority of the jealous God from the heavens. The Bible spoke of angels appearing as men. Moses was introduced to a ritual of sorts where he had to remove his shoes and not look at this being while he was being instructed. Now in the book of Jasher, a book mentioned in the Bible yet was not included within, reveals that the angel or Lord as we have come to understand was indeed Moses' very own father-in-law, Jethro. Jethro was the god of the mountain. 2 Samuel 1:18. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow, behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. One might wonder how Jethro could be this messenger in human form? because these gods in all their various castes and forms were likened unto the form of the human. They indeed became human to rule over lesser humans. This was no mistake since it revealed the male and female of humanity were created in the image of these gods. Moses was receiving his instructions from his father-in-law, his wife's own dad. This would reveal that Moses' wife was indeed the offspring of the gods as Genesis 6 one portrayed was occurring. To interject a point here, in the book of Jasher it reveals when Miriam, Moses' sister, saw what Moses was doing, claiming it came from the God of their fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, she told Moses that his bloodbath ritual of conquering cities, murdering and looting these towns were not from the God of their fathers. Miriam was then banished by Moses because she stood up against him. Yet somehow, she knew that whoever Moses was speaking to was different than the God the people in general were aware of. Remember there were many gods, and often they would reveal themselves as leaders, just like in the garden where two gods existed, YHVH and the serpent. Let us witness what Genesis revealed. Genesis 6 1 4 When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married some of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Notice the Nephilim were also the result of this union, between God and human, and it spoke of how these beings existed before the flood, as well as afterwards. The reason these evils continued after the flood was simply because the gods were empowered by both good and evil. When the souls of the gods returned after the flood and entered new bodies, they continued to operate as they always did minus a few who YHVH sent to prison because they were mentally ill and totally perverse. YHVH under the moniker of Jehovah took to himself a consort based on Jewish history. It is now becoming obvious this consort was a human. Much of the Greek mythology came about due to these type interactions of the gods and humans. Where a god would marry a human woman, and produce children just like the serpent produced his lineage via the human Eve. Hercules was one such child that came from a union between Zeus and a human mother. There is even an ancient law that Alexander the Great's real father was one of the gods that impregnated Alexander's human mother. These ancient myths have some strong teeth in facts, but were cased inside myths so the truth would be kept hidden. These gods as they manifested upon worlds in their own sheaths, or bodies, became a family of gods. 
This was the result of the angels taking on three-dimensional human forms, in their perspective worlds. One could easily conclude then, Moses married a daughter brought about by the union of a god and a human mother. Jethro was much more than a father-in-law, he was Lord YHVH, the one who directed the Israelites out of Egypt. But was he the same god in the garden, also known as YHVH? I truly doubt it. Genesis 6 1 3 describes the gods coming unto human woman and the marrying them to have children. Obviously, spirit cannot interact with flesh during a normal mating. So, these gods were indeed fleshly beings identical in form and race and could coalesce and intermarry with the humans. As stated earlier, they were the offspring of Cain's lineage marrying into the lineage of Seth. When the angel of Moses told him not to have any other gods before him, how could an angel speaking for God, direct Moses' attention only on himself? Because it was a family kingdom? For the true father that was introduced to humanity by Christ was not known as a God, but an energy spirit consciousness that dwells within. God was instilled till this day is an external being that does not live within us but rules us from without. The term God was a reprobation in scripture added to deceive humanity of the true father and mother energy. Here is a little portion from the lost gospel of John in the Nag Hammadi describing the glory of the father and mother. And I asked to know it, and he said to me, the monad is a monarchy with nothing above it. It is he who exists as God and father of everything, the invisible one who is above everything, who exists as incorruption which is in a pure light into which no eye can look. He is the invisible spirit, of whom it is not right to think of him as a god, or something similar. For he is more than a god, since there is nothing above him, for no one lords it over him. For he does not exist in something inferior to him, since everything exists in him. For it is he who establishes himself. He is eternal, since he does not need anything. For he is total perfection. He did not lack anything that he might be completed by it, rather he is always completely perfect in light. He is illimitable, since there is no one prior to him to set limits to him. He is unsearchable, since there exists no one prior to him to examine him. He is immeasurable, since there was no one prior to him to measure him. He is invisible, since no one saw him. He is eternal, since he exists eternally. He is ineffable since no one could comprehend him to speak about him. He is unnameable, since there is no one prior to him to give him a name. The true father and mother creator has no need for a title, for their power is all omnipotent eternal. The name God defines something of lesser qualities that exists and operates in lesser realms. Both YHVH and L is simply a mask to create the illusion of the true divine energy presence of the real creator, the father and mother. And since there was no one before the father and mother, he would never need to say, I am the Lord thy God am a jealous God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Obviously, this is proving whoever this God is, he is not the father. Chapter 42 Combining Aliens and Humans Humans were created via a process, maybe even a type of cloning technology using a simulation program, although one of the female gods who was a consort to the serpent in Key was used to birth these new specimens to begin the process until the male and female could spawn their own. They created the human body by DNA modifications but they did not create the soul within. The Adam and Eve allegory became the final product to build avatar homes for all spirits to dwell in that were sent to this simulated program. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. The father was not creating new children as many believe. Lucifer was using this program to trap the children that already pre-existed before the foundations of this world, in Christ, to become slaves in bondage as souls inside human forms. The process that was used was to make sure humans lacked certain DNA characteristics that the gods had. The true incarnated souls were never pure lard in the Anarchy, or Nephilim. They were a mixture of Nephilim females and the ape, which is the DNA that was assimilated or mixed by the serpent Inki, to create their new avatar vessels. Thus, the missing link. 
The ape was simply part of the Earth program before humans existed. Remember the animals were created on the fifth day and then came the humans on the sixth day. Obviously, the term day did not reveal a 24-hour period. These were massive lengths of time that were unrecorded, from the past. Now the question that one may have is if this world is a projection from the fourth dimension, why do these gods need to use DNA mixing to create avatar bodies, why not just project yourself into the world? The Gnostics understood that the humanoid avatar body was revealed to YHVH by the father and mother. I believe if I recall correctly the human was revealed in a reflection off a pool of water. When YHVH saw the specimen, he desired to create it not knowing that this image was being shown to him by the monad of the Aeons, where the father and mother dwell from. Obviously, the father and mother were playing a role as to what this program would become and Lucifer willingly allowed it. I believe the human was the shape they decided to take after seeing this image. Because this was not exactly their shape, although humanoid looking, they were not humans. They had shapes of all different types of species and some of them were horrifying from human standards. Cain and Abel had a cat face and a bear face. Others appeared as reptilian as well as there were other sorts of alien manifestations, like the greys, and so many more. Remember when I said, that humans were created after their image and likeness? I revealed this did not mean they were of the human image per se, but it represented who these gods really were in character. As well as the father and mother are not humans, they do not have human form, they are formless energy. The form the father showed the gods was simply what he desired to occur in this program. The union of the gods and human woman were taking place because, they wanted to build houses to dwell in so that the gods and humans appeared identical. However, the fourth dimensional appearance of these aliens were radically different than the human. So, entering the matrix birthing program, they then became like the human in appearance. These unions were very closely guarded by the top council of the lords. Genesis 6 is revealing how it got way out of hand where the lower gods were interacting with these women and this was producing negative results. When other lower caste gods were impregnating human women, they were producing a myriad of children of all sizes and shapes, and it got way out of hand. Suddenly, there became too many chiefs and not enough Indians. And the law of enmity was being watered down. Adam was not the first creation. The first creation was a being called the Adapa and also the one called, Lucy named after Lucifer. The problem was their creation was a hybrid unable to produce children so they could have human tabernacles to exist within to continue through the ages via reincarnation. The creation of the Adapa caused them to have to birth this specimen one at a time via the female gods, but since they were hybrids they could not keep creating these new bodies this way, it would take way too long. Therefore, the non-hybrid Adam and Eve were the final result and were able now to be fruitful and multiply. Hybrid means cross-breeding between two different specimens which often results in lacking new progeny. Chapter 43 Sumerian Gods Came Down to Earth According the Kineiform Texts version, the father to the sons that operate in this lower realm was named Anu. Anu was the father that was the greatest power. Anu was also married to Antu. These gods had wives while living in this program as stated prior. The main YVHV operator in the Old Testament, named Jehovah was mostly played by Enlil, son of Anu, which also had a consort named Ninlil. Was Anu known as YHVH also, and was this the Nag Hammadi Yaldabaoth? Anu was the top lord slash YHVH in rank and order he was number one, however, the original god of the Bible was Anu's son Enlil, whom became the local power or god on earth as well as the false Christ, and his brother Inki was the Gnostic Yaldabaoth as the first lord under Enlil. So how is it possible that these can be Lucifer? Lucifer is the top seraphim fallen angel, Lucifer is a spirit, and this spirit is within all that follow him. Lucifer usually only dwells within the fourth dimension, and at times makes his presence known on earth in human bodies, as a false Christ. Enlil was the god of the Old Testament early in the Bible, 
but he passed through many bodies over the ages, where eventually Marduk, son of Inki became the god the Old Testament that the people spoke about later, as Enlil left earth and has never returned, according to some ancient texts. It is very hard to keep track of these gods, because they changed often and appeared as different entities down through time as reincarnated gods in different avatar bodies. Anu seldom ever came to earth, he was too important. He always remained in the mothership that is invisible to the world. The interesting thing is when Inki wrote about their past, he revealed Anu and his children were rejected from their world and they ended up coming to earth. This alone tells me Anu is not Lucifer. For the second war in heaven was the war between the gods, and evidently Anu lost that war and was sent here. Could it be Anu is really the name of Satan, the polarity half of Lucifer? Yes, I believe he was Satan, and Inki portrayed Anu as the son of Satan, or the serpent king on earth. These events described in the Sumerian cuneiform tablets reveal a pre-earth history. This is all part of the fall of the angels as they were conquering worlds prior to a second war in heaven where the battle was between the gods themselves. Chapter 44 The Baalians Here When the Anunnaki showed up into the fourth density earth they came as a race of reptilians from the species of serpents and reptiles from what is said to be the Orion constellation project from the fourth dimension. They had human form but they were not human. There were many types of alien races throughout the fourth dimensional cosmos and still are. Now let's say you are of this species of reptilians, but you want to project into the matter worlds but take on the image of the avatars being used. As in type, if you saw the movie, Avatar, you noticed that the human in this case had to be projected through a simulation machine to become like the tall blue beings that existed. Entering their world as a human was not as productive since you would have been in type like a grasshopper that they could crush. Therefore, you became like one of them via the computer simulation program. What you need to understand is within the mind realm of the fourth dimension is where the false universe that Lucifer created exists. The third dimension is simply the projection of this mind realm via many parallels. The difference is, this world is much denser and slower in vibration and can be controlled much easier. Within the fourth dimension there are far less controls over beings than the third dimension, because you can basically change your surrounding and enter another universe by the speed of thought. This is how most UFO craft and other alien vehicles travel. They are not traveling within the third dimension except for short periods of the space-time quantum continuity. They are zapping out of the third dimension in these crafts and entering back into the fourth dimension. Likened unto the movie Avatar, you can enter the programmed world as you are, or you can enter it like those of the program. In the beginning the Anunnaki entered this world as they were, the reptilians. Over time they began to realize their shapes, forms, Images and likeness were odd to the newly created program occupants, so they simply set up new protocols and the most of them entered the world to appear like everyone else but remain in control by using their blood protocols. Now some do retain their alien image on earth but are usually out of sight. I have stated in other writings that the infamous name alien is broken down from Arabic, Hebrew, and Sumerian. Ali Al is a form of God in Arabic. Just like the Hebrew Elohim or El is God, and En is the Sumerian name for Lord. Such as Enki and Enlil. Thus, we present the full name or title of Alien as Lord God. It is time to prepare your mind that the gods that rule this universe are in fact aliens, of all species, shapes, sizes and degrees. Also, the name in Hebrew for the Most High God is called, Elion and is pronounced, Elion. Phonetically it is almost exactly like, alien, because that is exactly what they are. This was a name to describe that aliens came to earth and established themselves as, Lord Gods, as alien or alien. Elon, El middle dot yon highest, most high. A, name of God or rulers, either monarchs or angel princes. Welcome to the simulation program. Chapter 45 Adam and Eve, Two Dimensions 
It is time to reveal the mystery of the forbidden secret from the fourth dimensional realm is that all third dimensional worlds are projected, all of them. There is a vast network of third dimensional worlds all over the cosmos inside the fourth dimension. Sort of like having a wall of DVDs with many movies, all you do is grab one and watch. Adam represents the fourth dimension as the day or mind and brain, and Eve represents the third dimension as the night, evening or flesh and blood body. This represents how our soul is in two densities at one time not even counting the parallel dimensions. It also reveals we are all Adam and Eve, each of us are androgynous spirits where we are both male and female in characteristics just like our father and mother are. But when we fell, we divided into two categories of male and female due to the creation of the avatars, or human bodies. Eve was deceived being in the dark matter, Adam wasn't deceived because he had been enlightened for a short period. Yet both took of the fruit and entered the polarity, and now the one became two, male and female. When we operate in the slower density it allows for change just like using assimilation, to learn from. As the gods use this to control others, it can also be used for great benefits of learning and acquiring knowledge. It is not all evil, remember. It is a mixture of good and evil, we must learn to choose and separate. Chapter 46 Blood Simulation Laws In the beginning mankind was set up to become peasants and workers for the overlords. So why did God feel it was necessary to place enmity between the serpent, the gods, and the woman, the humans? If the serpent was what we were told in the beginning was truly the devil, there already had to be enmity. So why would God place something of this nature, which is division and confusion to divide between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed? Wasn't it enough the serpent caused the humans to fall from paradise? Do they now have to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with their deceiver and then be relegated as second class? What we are witnessing here is division and separation. This was the separation between the newly created race and the gods that created them. This was by result of having been ejected out of the garden because of the error of being led into taking the forbidden tree, but it was all planned. The gods did not want the Adam humanity to become like them as lords, but to become likened unto them, as servants. The only logical answer to this equation is all the gods were working together to make sure the humans failed. It was never in their desire for them to succeed, but why? The Sumerians were told that the new creation was made to become slaves to the gods to perform the duties that the lower and Yanaki, the children of the gods were sick and tired of doing. This was already in their playbook. So I believe that humans would fare any better. Yet when one begins to realize what is truly occurring in this story, if Adam and Eve did not take of the forbidden tree they would never have had to become slaves. They would have had everything they needed in paradise, the garden and would have simply lived out their long lives in peace and tranquility. This is the story we were handed down, this is what we have all been made to believe. All Adam and Eve had to do was not touch or eat of the forbidden tree and bingo, everything would have been perfect. What they forgot to tell us is that all have already fallen before humanity ever came here, but the soul was not conscious enough to realize what had happened. Now learn the next mystery. Adam and Eve are symbolic of all souls. All of us fell by taking of this forbidden fruit, but it came to us as a story of two individuals. Adam and Eve were an allegory that represented every decision we all had made when we chose to follow the incorrect path and enter in this realm. Unlike what the Bible says, that Adam and Eve's sin brought forth the curse unto all generations to come, this was not correct. All of us at one time have taken this forbidden fruit in our desire to play these simulations in these lower world amusement parks and now we are suffering for it because we were placed into a trance that put us into a deep sleep. Does this mean Adam and Eve didn't really exist? Of course, two individuals did, there had to be two original humans to make this plan work. But their stories were allegorical to provide us with the truth on humanity's origins. However, we are not subjected to the gods forever and that is the key. It sounds simple on paper 
but when you begin to see the catch-22 suddenly one begins to recognize the nefarious scheme that was being perpetrated. It wasn't the game plan for Adam and Eve to follow orders, now was it? The gods did not need a bunch of new creatures roaming around in their world eating from their resources while basically living a work-free life in paradise. No, this is not what they desired so the plan was to make sure that the humans failed so they would be cursed with the plan that the gods designed from the beginning in their simulation law program. General the 17th of March 2019 reveals that, the curse is self-evident that what Adam was punished with was the goal of the gods from the beginning. Adam was cursed with becoming a slave, working to the sweat of his brow in difficult situations until he drops dead of old age and then returns into the dust of earth to be recycled to appear again at a new time, same channel. And Eve was cursed to make sure that all her offspring that were produced would also be under the same curse, whom also would take part of the good and evil scheme. This means every single person born after Seth would be slaves under bondage, except the gods and their children which came from Cain. The gods embodied into human form, would live a life of near work free ease and accumulate great riches, as they do even under today where the elite are the wealthy of the world, and they rule this planet. And you know what is interesting, if this story was accurate the way it was played out to us via the script, which many of the religious organizations of this world has given to us. Once Adam and Eve committed this great error, why even deal with them anymore? They were cursed. Let them go and die, they were already dead anyway. What this would imply is God would have given up on humans because they failed their ultimate test. However, the facts are, this is not what happened. God continued to come back to humanity repeatedly, not out of love or compassion, but to set up new contracts with ever greater punishments, once they were breached. And then as always, place them into positions where they break the covenants continually just to be punished again. And then as always, they were punished throughout the entire history. I mean if you are damned, then let the chips fall where they may. Why keep coming back so that you can bring the rod of iron out to beat and prod a people that never seem to be able to obey anyway? This is mindlessness. Now let's be honest, who wasn't getting it? Was it humanity that had a severe problem being obedient? Or was it the gods that didn't seem to realize, it ain't working? Or maybe it didn't matter to them? Just like a child squashing a bug, does anyone really care about a bug's life? I have explained how the gods seriously miscalculated their objective, a divine presence was already inserted within the true children to make sure we all succeed, and that the father and mother were allowing all of this to take place for something wonderful. All of humanity for generations perpetually were cursed to become slaves to the gods. It had nothing to do with rebellion of two humans in the truer sense, although taking of the tree led to deception. It was also part of the plan due to our being seeded here anyway. The actual fault took place at another time and dimension. It was necessary that the humans became willing slaves and not complain. And today we see it in spades how people believe that slaving for a few crumbs off the table is their destiny. Working until they drop dead is even preached on from the pulpits as being God's will. We just never realized which God? He that doesn't work shouldn't eat. Idle hands are of the devil's workshop. And now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. We live to provide the bulk of our efforts so that the gods of this world can live like kings and queens without doing a damn thing, while the serfs do all the work. And unlike the Anunnaki children, do we complain? Not anymore, not really. We just take it all as part of life's ritualistic sacrifices under the blood simulation laws. Because we have forgotten who we are. Chapter 47 The Gods Created Evil One of the most diabolical scriptures in the Bible state that the one that called himself, YHVH that is Lord, said he created all things, including evil. Am I just inventing these concepts without real viable proof? Yet I wonder sometimes how many realize that these false gods use and promote evil? 
even though the Bible also claims God has nothing to do with evil. Again, more confusion. Some may think I am just creating my own ideas while seemingly blaspheming against these gods and the Bible without a real basis for my argument. I would have to say that if you believe this, then you truly have been suckered into this game, and you have not been able to identify with the word I have written internally, because you have been exposed to deadly spiritual toxins externally. Let me continue now to reveal more of just how the gods of the Bible use evil by their own decree. And you will see with your own eyes that I am not making this up. That what I am relaying is an absolute fact that the God and gods of the Bible are both good and evil and use it whenever it is needed to create their diabolical reprehensive plan. 2 Samuel 12 11 Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. To add a point here often when the term evil is used it comes from the Hebrew word Ra or Ra. Ra. Ra was also the name of ancient sun god. What is this verse saying, in the sight of this sun? Is God referring to himself claiming to be the sun god Ra? Cain was also referred to as the sun. Is Ra a single name and a religion and lineage? These people who are separated as God's chosen were called. Israel or ish ra -el. And if this be so, what is the deeper meaning of the name Ra? Does Israel mean, the followers of the sun god Ra, or could it also represent, followers of the evil one? Being the name Ra in Hebrew, literally means evil. Ish in Hebrew is, man and Ra is evil or as I stated if you use the ancient Egyptian name, Ra is sun. Earlier I revealed about the lineage of Cain all through the supposed line of Seth that these people may have been Egyptian pharaohs, and Egypt was divided into two powers, one of which was being directed by what is called the Shepherd Kings, which more than likely was the lineage of Shem, through David and even to their Christ. This is not surprising. It appears that this God is referring to himself as the Son. And of course, the final part of the name Israel is the infamous El or God. So, what we have here is, men following the evil sun god Ra. It is smack dab right in the center of the name. Sort of like the tree of good and evil was smack dab in the center of God's garden. Ish Ra L, Lucifer standing between man and Lord. My friends what is in the name? When I mention Israel, I am not talking about only Jews, for the Jewish people were only one clan of Israel out of twelve a very small part indeed. Again, this was part of the enmity to set at variance one group against another, where most cannot cut through the deception to realize hatred is being fermented against anything and everything to keep the forbidden tree alive. You must understand, our enemy is not the real humanity, it is the false gods who take pleasure in our ignorance. All blood has now been mixed, and there is no pure race in this world and due to reincarnation, it doesn't matter anyway, where a person hails from or what their roots are. The closest thing that comes to purity is the God's royal blood lineage, and that only represents a tiny segment of humanity, I mean very small. Whoever you think you are or what culture you come from you are simply a potpourri of a mixture of the blood of all races, and you come under the enmity game as being one of the children of humanity, period. The truth is, it is not what blood is within your flesh, it is what soul is inside your body. This is the only thing that matters. Here we see God stating in various verses in the Bible that he will raise up evil. It is not saying he will use evil, he is saying he will raise it up and create a terrible thing by having your wives be taken by their neighbors and forced to be raped by them all in the sight of the sun god Ra as it appears he takes pleasure in this abominable act. What kind of deviant being would do such a thing? I Samuel 18.10 And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. Excuse me. An evil spirit coming from God? We read here that King Saul was given an evil spirit, but does it say it comes from Satan? Absolutely, not. It reveals that the evil spirit comes from God, YHVH. 
how is it possible that God can have possession of an evil spirit from within? God the perfection, God the all-powerful that can never be tempted with evil nor has any part of evil, is saying that he has with him an evil spirit that he can and will send out to harm others? How does evil emanate from the God of love and perfection? Because this is not the true creator that is the true father and mother. This is an imposter. Joshua 23:15. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things, until he has destroyed you? Say what? Does any of this sound like a further and mother of love and compassion? Why is God always affiliating himself with evil? Doesn't it make sense that from the very beginning God was both good and evil, as he claimed in Genesis 3:22? Is this not the God religion has promoted, a strange God that affiliates himself with darkness also? Is this why so many in religious groups claim when trying to tackle this information about the oddity of these gods, their only response is God does things in mysterious ways, or, God's ways are higher than our ways? They have no answer to this ignominy, yet Christ did, he said, you shall know them by their fruits. Evil does not represent a higher spiritual aptitude but a lower perversion of mind. How many verses will it take to finally remove the brainwashing that we have all undergone for ages and generations prior until we will testify that these beings are aliens, but pretend to use good to trick us and deceive us? Psalms 34 16 states that, the Lord is against those that do evil. And yet to the contrary, God himself promotes and uses evil by his own admission. Psalm also reveals that the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And yet, Psalm 78 49 he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble, by sending evil angels among them. Anger, wrath, indignation as well as evil demonic angels all being used and coming forth from God? The key to all of this is to finally realize that good and evil is just like truth and error. And both are being used by the same gods. When we read, that God is against evil, we know this is speaking of the father and mother, the problem is if we do not separate the two, in recognition of who is speaking the truth and who is speaking the lie, it becomes complete and utter confusion exactly the cocktail the gods desired for us to drink. Why would the great and loving further use evil demonic angels to send amongst the people? Why is he so filled with wrath, anger, and indignation, which are all spirits of demons? 2 Chronicles 18:22. Now therefore the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. My friends, do you not understand that the Lord being referred to here is the spirit of Satan, yet he is named YHVH? Here is the same verse in the Strong's exhaustive concordance, Now therefore, behold, the Lord 3068 hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord 3068 hath spoken evil against thee. Notice that the term Lord comes from the number 3068, and if we double check as to the meaning of this Hebrew word being used, here is what we discover time and time again. Yehovah, Jehovah equals the existing one. One, the proper name of the one true God. This is the same God that supposedly cannot be tempted with evil neither does he tempt any man with evil, as well as it states, God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Yet right before your eyes, it states, the Lord sent out a lying spirit in their mouth, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. The Hebrew word for lying under 8267 is, one, lie, deception, disappointment, falsehood. A, deception. B, deceit, fraud, wrong. One, fraudulently, wrongfully as adverb. C. Falsehood, injurious in testimony. 1. Testify falsehood, false oath, swear falsely. D. Falsity, a false or self-deceived prophets. E. Lie, falsehood, in general. 1. False tongue. F. In vain.
Why is it we keep reading that God does not do certain things and yet he does? Because the Bible is the source tree of the knowledge of both good and evil. These gods created duplicate copies of the Father and Christ and then used deception to get you to follow the dark spirit believing it is the true Father and his Son Christ. 2 Kings 22 16 Thus saith the Lord, Behold I bring evil upon this place. Nehemiah 13 18 Did not our God bring all this evil upon us? Isaiah 54 16 Behold I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire, and that brings forth an instrument, and I have also created the waster to destroy. What are we dealing with here? Who is this God that tells us to have nothing to do with evil and destruction and yet he continues to admit that evil is part of his very nature and his creation? Is God just using Satan and his devices, or is he responsible for bringing evil into existence? Or is God, Satan? Read closely, Isaiah 45 5 7 I am the Lord and there is none else, there is no God beside me, I gird of thee, though thou hast not known me. They that may know, me, from the rising of the sun, in the east, and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light, and create darkness, I make peace and create evil. I the Lord do all these things. I, YHVH, create evil. For ages mankind, has read this verse and never contemplated what it is saying. For the Lord God of the Bible is claiming that he creates all that there is, including evil. This states categorically that there is no Satan, no devil, no other God besides the one God or family of these gods, for the one God family creates sight to all and there is none other than these aliens who have been seducing mankind, including creating all that is wickedness. It is important that you recognize that it states, I the Lord, again, this name Lord is Jehovah slash YHVH. He reveals, just like it was stated to Moses, I am the Lord and there is none else. Once again, these verses use the name, sun representing coming from the east, as well as setting in the west. This all relates to early sun god worshipping of Lucifer. He claims to be the sun god. Now this one individual, as God, although calling himself one of the YHVH, is also saying there is no other God slash Elohim other than him. This is the one God touting his glory above all other gods. This is one that claims he is above all, even above the council of gods. And who is truly the sun God that is jealous and demands worship? It is Lucifer and his counterpolarity likeness of, Satan. It did not say, God uses evil, which is bad enough, it says he created it, Bara brought it into fruition, and manifested it. Do you think now that I have made all of this up? Do you think I am in a wrong spirit and I am simply trying to find problems with the Bible? My friends, I have had decades of training in the Bible, I am not a novice here. Sadly, the programming was so strong most do not comprehend what I am revealing, but you should. The Bible is a DNA download program to disorient minds to be deceived. If this be the case in his own admission, then Satan and the devil are just another characteristic of these gods, or any given god of the Jehovah's. If there is truly no other god, and only one created all things, including evil, then the one god or family of gods are responsible for all good and evil, god and devil. Remember Genesis 3:22, the secret code of the Masonic system, for man has now become like one of us, to know good and evil. Keep a watch for this secret code number 322. Now you know the mystery. The problem with this line of reasoning is that the same God said, he knew not sin until Satan sinned. Yet he is claiming he creates all things including evil, thus Lucifer. Satan is the supreme god that was jealous that tried to overthrow the father, and then fell. A Lucifer how art thou fallen? But again though, often the true spirit of the father and mother is indeed injected into the scripture, and you must recognize the spirit or intent to be able to filter out the poison. It was the father and mother that knew not sin until Lucifer, Satan rebelled, and became God the adversarial one who is in enmity against all the true seeds. 
and sin is simply a creation that humans fall into because they were trapped by these fallen angels that make the rules of both good and evil to lure humans to fail. The serpent was the by necessity to make sure the humans failed so that they would be placed exactly where the gods wanted them to be in the first place. Just look at the fruits of this planet, look how every generation sinks deeper into violence and sin and yet we have more laws now than in any time in our history. It was all a trick set up by the gods to enslave mankind and keep them from the knowledge of the other tree, the tree of life, or more importantly, keeping them from the knowledge of what humanity really is. In truth, the gods created the computer hardware that took over this realm making it a complete virtual, simulated hell. Chapter 48 The Sting One story that comes to mind is the story of the poor soul named, Job in the Bible. Now Job was a righteous man, no iniquity, sin was found in Job, which was proclaimed by the gods. He obeyed the gods as perfectly as one could in this body. However, was this good enough? I mean it is a rare thing that anyone could obey these gods because they placed heavy burdens, tricks, traps and what not to make sure you fail. So how did Job slip through this barrage of attacks to withstand the enmity, which is the polarity that the gods set in motion? Want to know something funny? This was the question the gods were also asking themselves. The name Job means hated. Why would this righteous man have a moniker that meant hated? Who hated him? And why does the term Job mean hated? The name Job is pronounced Eov, even though it appears just like what we call our work. Here was Job, perfect and upright, one whom hated evil. This by itself should have been the mark of excellence that anyone should strive for, yet something was wrong. The gods didn't like the fact that one of their humans was obeying and following everything good and righteous, he was a loyal human for the gods and did as he was instructed. Job became a very wealthy man, he had real estate, and flock and all the wealth one could imagine. Job was not only righteous, he was rich and powerful. He also had sons and daughters that were loved dearly. It appeared to be a very close-knit family. Job had everything anyone could desire and he was also righteous before the gods, therefore protected. It seemed Job could do what few have ever been able to do and that was to be exactly what the gods desired of all of us, or did they? On the surface, it would appear as Job had it made in the shade. He had everything going for him, he was good and perfect and hated evil. Every Muslim, every Jew, every Christian should envy Job because he was doing what everyone else from the Garden of Eden until now have found nearly impossible to fulfill. So, what was the problem? Well this was the question we should have all honestly been asking ourselves when we read this account. There is no doubt that there was a problem. Job hated evil, that was tantamount in hating the gods, for the gods were both good and evil, thus his name meant hated. In Job 1 6 and 2 1 read very closely what is being said, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The term present oneself before the Lord represents they were invited, as in like, invited for a meeting with the king or queen. And here we have Satan also going to this powwow where the sons of gods have been invited and it appears Ole Satan was invited also. What is wrong with this picture? Before I go forward let us sort through a few things here. The term Lord in these verses once again is the name, YHVH. And the term God is the name Elohim, and the term Sons is the Hebrew word Ben, but plural. Often you will recognize the name Ben inserted between two names, such as Jeshua Ben Joseph. It simply means son of. Joshua, son of Joseph. Notice here that we are learning that the name Jehovah is being used in a singular fashion, meaning coming before one God, as well as, Elohim is being used as the paternal name. It was, the sons of the Elohim coming before the Lord. Chapter 49 Satan Stands Before God As we continue with this story, Satan comes along for the ride to stand before the chief council and the Elohim leader and great ruler. How did this occur? Wasn't Lucifer cast out of the heavens? 
isn't Satan the dark force that is the opposite of all that is good and righteous? Yet we read above that the Lord had sons. This is tantamount to saying a human father had children, this now makes the children, human. If God had sons, then the sons were also gods. Elohim ben Jehovah. The gods, sons, of the Jehovah, that is, family title. So above we see that God had sons, not just one but many. Also among his sons came the old devil himself, Satan, appearing directly before the great Lord. Again, as I have said so often, what is wrong with this picture? Why is God in counsel with the devil? Why is he speaking to him at all? These gods operated under the law of protocol. They had what was known as varying degrees of authority and precedence. Like a captain is over a sergeant, and a sergeant is over a private. These gods had rank and order, so there was no doubt there were higher ranking gods. The Sumerian text reveals that their ranks were numbered. I believe if I recall correctly, Anu was numbered 60, Enlil was 50 and Enki was 40. All the male deities were given even numbers and the females had odd numbers. As such Anu's consort, Antu, was ranked at number 55 etc. There is no doubt that rank, file and order was in use, as with any military machine. The story of Job was a very interesting story because for some reason no matter how righteous and upright he was, the counsel of the gods made sure that he was to suffer at the hands of Satan. This story is a perfect example of how God used Satan, enmity to do a filthy dirty work of punishing Job worse than any human could endure, and all for what? The story goes on to reveal when Satan presented himself before the Lord, that God asked Satan, have you seen my servant Job how wonderful and perfect and upright he is? This is odd, what was God doing, toying with the devil? It was as if he was saying ha, look at this, I have a great servant that obeys me, ha, you sucker, you don't have them all, do you? Was God making fun of the devil? No, he really wanted to know why Satan did not try to destroy Job. Satan replied, Lord you have placed a hedge of protection around him, there is nothing I can do. Why is the devil submitting himself to God's authority? And why is he admitting that he knew God placed protection around Job, and even if this was true, why would the devil care, why not launch attacks anyway? Does the devil forget to launch attacks against the true seeds because they are protected? Did he decide not to come against Jesus Christ because he was the true son? Or did he not only attack him, he had him killed? Wouldn't Jesus be far more protected than little Ole Job? If this being was the devil as we have been taught, why would he care what God had to say? He hated God, he tried to overthrow God, he rejected God. Could it be he was also one of God's sons under rank, file and authority? Could it be that dear Ole Dad was talking to his son and his son had to comply? This is tantamount to Anu asking Enki his son the magician serpent king, why he has allowed Job to have a carefree life without being punished. Is this what we are to believe in this story that God wanted to know why Satan was leaving Job alone? And if Job was perfect he would have been protected because that was part of the covenant agreement. You will obey God and you will have protection from the enemy. At this point the story should have ended as God defeated the devil and Job was perfect, but it did not end there. God was not out to brag about Job and his perfection, God was upset that Job was being obedient because that was not part of the plan of enmity. Like the adage, we don't need no stinking badges, and in Job's case, we don't need no stinking righteous man. Chapter 50. Job the Righteous One. God then told Satan that he was granted the power and authority to destroy everything Job had including his own children, and inflict terrible bodily harm to Job, but he could not kill Job. My friends this is tantamount to a higher ranking officer giving orders to his subordinates and they then obey. It did not matter what Satan did to Job, because all of it was under the authority and orders of God, the council. As you shall see, once again everyone around the man of God is destroyed and punished, and even killed, but the man in question, he can go on.
yet in Job's case it didn't matter, what God had guided Satan to do him, Job wished he was dead. He wished he was never born. I ask what did Job do wrong to deserve this punishment that God chose to inflict upon him, using Satan? Even Job's closest friends believed Job was being cursed because of some evil he was committing. In a strange afterthought while reading this text, it was Job's friends that also were severely punished for thinking like this. But what were they supposed to think? Job was being beaten down like a rabid dog. His life was ruined and his world was turned upside down. Why did God send Satan out to attack Job in the worst of all conceived ways? Why destroy his family, his wealth, place terrible boils all over this body, and even destroy his faith? What kind of God was Job serving? Some have stated that this occurred to Job because he did have a sin, a sin of self-righteousness. I have heard some clergy state that Satan in his pride was unable to see the sin of self-righteousness, so therefore he did not attack Job. This is so utterly ridiculous to even suggest this, whether Satan would believe someone was righteous or not would not matter to him if he was the adversary, and he witnessed someone that was not in his fold, he would still attack. Was Christ righteous? Did this stop Satan from attacking him? Job 1 1 There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God, and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. It states, Job was perfect and upright before God. God said, Job was perfect. Satan said, he could not get to Job because he was being protected for his righteousness. The entire act by Satan ordered directly by God himself, was to get Job to curse God and die. Job withstood this time and time again. If this made him self-righteous, then we are all in for a frightening time at the zoo. What most have never understood was that in the day we came to this realm we were sentenced under the law of death and there was never any reprieve. This is what the story of Adam and Eve really revealed. We already blew it in the garden. Whether Job was righteous or not is meaningless, because somewhere in his past lives he was already brought under the law of death and therefore not a single ounce of righteousness today would be worth a hill of beans. One cannot be justified under the law, it is not possible. Now going back to the main question that was asked earlier, is why was Satan among the sons of God? And why was he able to go before the council? As stated earlier, what is not really understood here but can easily be derived by what is taking place, is that Satan did not just come before God to have a powwow. He was called up to God, God wanted to use him to punish Job in the most severe ways. A commanding elder general called one of his regiments to play the role of the evil adversary. The proof is in the fact that Satan did not start the conversation. If Satan came to God to query about Job trying to find a way to attack him, then Satan would have led off with the questioning, not God. God asked Satan, as a break into the conversation, have you seen my servant Job? Obviously, this is revealing Satan had no idea why he was called before God. As stated, if this was an outright attack by Satan against Job, then why didn't Satan begin the questioning? Satan did not come to God to accuse Job as we were instructed in many Christian churches, he came to find out what God wanted, and Job became the center of the conversation, which had begun by God questioning Satan, not the other way around. The religious world has stated that Satan went before God to accuse Job. We see this was an inaccurate assessment of the situation. Now let me break this all down for it to be better understood. Satan represents the adversary of good, God, so we have the devil and God coming to a powwow with the rest of the sons of God. What we are witnessing here is a council of the gods discussing matters pertaining to earth and its inhabitants. Amongst the gods were the Satans and the Jehovahs all being one and the same family playing different roles of their tree. Remember why HVH is simply a title meaning Lord. Satan is simply a title meaning adversary. These are not their names, but titles referring to their task or job, no pun intended. They discussed what could be done to stop job, 
for he was doing what they never intended or desired from humanity. Job was fulfilling the law. The council decided to once again to send enmity between Job and his world, to divide and destroy everything Job stood for. They wanted it known that it was not allowed to be perfect. The individual that is perfect cannot come under the law. And it is the law that decides the game is afoot. So, what possibly did Job do that was so horrific? The answer lies in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given the chance to simply live in peace and harmony within the garden forever, or be cursed and sent forth to become slaves to the gods to do with as they pleased. No more could Adam and Eve have fulfilled the law than anyone standing in their shoes could have. It was destined that they fail by putting before them great temptations via a magician and spell caster. In simple terms, they were not to succeed, they were not to become righteous and be separated from the law of judgment. They must be made slaves. I can almost hear the word coming from on high at the council meeting, they must not succeed send the serpent, my son forth. As in Job's case the serpent was sent by God to find out what Adam and Eve were doing and then they were told that they were to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just like in Job's case, it was a sting operation, and afterwards the party in question would suffer horribly for falling into the trap that had been orchestrated by the council of gods. What is so funny in Job's case he never did sin in that life. Based on what the Bible teaches, even after all the hell he was put through, he never sinned, which is hard for me to believe, but that is what it said. The truth of the matter was, is that God wanted to prove his power and authority over him, that it was all a temptation to see if Job would become evil, and yet we are told that God tempts no man with evil, nevertheless, he sends Satan down to play dirty rotten games with Job to cause him to turn to evil and to reject God. If this was only about God using Satan to prove Job would remain righteous, it would make God look a tad bit better. But that was not even the case. He was simply kicked in the teeth and bitch slapped and the answer was, God was proving his power over him. When Job didn't turn to evil, God simply declared that Job had a problem recognizing the power of God and his authority, which was never true. It seemed to be implying that he lacked the understanding that there were no other gods but God. If Job was worshipping any other god, then he would not have been righteous as the claim that God himself made. And T would mean Satan already had him. But somehow Satan didn't even know that. Confusion. How could God have concluded this by what Job did? How could Job have lacked this knowledge if he was perfect and upright and hated evil and never once did he curse God to die even after being severely punished? Job never failed in this sting operation, he always obeyed even during punishment, but it was not good enough. The gods were caught and now they had to scramble to get out of this one. So, they turned around and blessed Job double of everything that was taken away from him. People ignorantly look at this story and say wow what a wonderful God to bless Job with double of everything. Why did Job ever have to go through this in the first place, he was never in error, and even after they stung him he never changed, so why now bless him? Because he did not break the law in that life, when they tried so hard to get him to break their laws. I don't see mercy here, since when does a payoff bribe make someone merciful? Job was bought off because the gods screwed up. They could not force him to disobey and curse their own edicts, so now they had to quickly undo or attempt to change the outcome. Nevertheless, no blessing could ever take away the sting of punishment he went through for no righteous cause. It did not bring back his children that were slaughtered. None of what occurred restored Job back to what he had originally. It was just a large payoff so Job would shut up and go about and live out the rest of his life as a humbled servant. Yea Job was blessed double, but that is like someone taking a bribe. The gods screwed up so they had to make things right. But Job did not need to be blessed double, he had everything a man could desire already. If Job truly had an error within his heart, then why didn't he fail the test? And since he didn't fail the test, why didn't God apologize to him saying I thought you had a different spirit? So, the overwhelming question is why? Who are the gods afraid of? 
Why is it that they set traps so that people won't follow their laws? If they are gods, then why at times do they make sure the laws are contravened, if they are so keen on the law? Who are the gods hiding from? Why is it they want mankind to fail, and not obey these laws? Is there something in this picture that we do not understand? Yes, indeed there is, for out of all the dismay and destruction that these gods promote there is one key to it all. These gods are simply aliens from other planets, and they were kicked out of their home because of their sickness. They were not allowed to be among the divine nature of things and were cast below unto judgment. They know there is a power that exists beyond them, but they want to make sure that mankind does not access that power, nor even understand it. They want to be the power lords and they know once mankind accesses the true divine power then they will have nothing left to control humanity and they will be stuck with their own perversions to play out upon one another of the gods in the night of blackness forever. And I am here to reveal that the once great glory within you must be awakened so that all can comprehend what has taken place in this world. Chapter 51 Christ Revealed the Fallen Gods The true Christos in the man we have been told was called Isis slash Jesus slash Su, revealed to his followers about the false alien gods that roam this earth. He told them that the people of old were following alien gods and not the true father. His message was to reveal the father and mother, which had never been revealed before. Thereby proving the gods of the Old Testament were being led by fallen angels, aliens and not attached in any way with the real Christ. He said that the followers of these gods were children of the adversary, Satan. They are the ones who condemn the truth because they do not have the love of the Father, which should have been in them, if they were a true child. Whenever the truth is spoken via the children of the Father, they would be persecuted and condemned, because this is not their world, it belongs to the fallen ones. The message of the Christ was to never condemn, but to always discern, the children of the fallen ones always condemn yet never discern. They are mindless. It is very important to understand that this world was not our original world, although many of us came from a planet similar in all respects to our Earth. It was a higher vibrational Earth-type planet in a higher density from which we fell in the garden. We fell from our higher vibrational world when we brought into the law of good and evil where we were given human biological clothing to cover our nakedness of the fall. This became our mask that filtered out the waves of reality via illusion. It became the adversary to the very truth within. Our very own bodies became the cover which blocked out the soul, which in Latin is soul, which represents the sun, the true sun, or the Christ within. The human covering is in type an antichrist that is covering the true Christ. Now we are buried within an illusion that masks out our true origin. Chapter 52. The Real Story. One such story that was illuminated by this treachery of firstborns being supplanted was Jacob and Esau. Jacob was known as the one who supplanted and stole Esau's birthright due to the treachery and lies of his mother Rebekah. Together they colluded to deceive Isaac. And the Christian world has taken a blind eye to this deception and allowed the collusion to be acceptable. Jacob was named the one that supplanted, it referenced how he took something that did not belong to him. This is one of the most powerful keys to unlock the greatest deception ever unmasked. Esau, is Esau, which is in type, the name of Jesus. Esau lost his birthright and rightful rule to this chicanery. And then Jacob went on to steal the birthright and his bloodline became the carrier for the rulers of this world. This must make one wonder if Jesus was a twin, or had a brother that went on to become the atypical Christ since the story of Jacob and Esau is allegorical to Jesus Christ as it is with so many of the stories in the Old Testament. Not all in the bloodline are deviant, they are also human and some also of the father and mother because of the mixing that began to take place between the two lineages. You cannot condemn an entire race because of a few reprobates. No more than you can exalt an entire race because of the righteousness of a few. Why is this critical? Because as you or Esau meant Edom, or what we now call modern day Turkey. This is the real lineage of where Jesus came from. 
The story we hear about, which we are told was in Jerusalem in the Middle East occurred in what we now call Istanbul, Turkey. This is the true lineage and home where the true Jesus came from, it was Zedom, Turkey the home of Esau, who then later became Mishu, Jesus. It is in fact where everything began in this world, from the Garden of Eden to Noah's family beginnings as well as the Tower of Babel. Jesus was born and crucified in what was called the first Jerusalem or the center of the known world, also known as Zagrad, Constantinople etc. It was even revealed to the Galatians, with their eyes they witnessed Jesus being crucified. Galatia was also the home of Attis the Greek god who is comparable to Jesus, being identical in many ways. Attis was the myth that grew out of the Christ legend. The reason was, is they were one in the same, even though Attis is portrayed to be hundreds of years before Jesus, they are the same person but a faulty history was added to deceive. History has been so badly modified, that the truth is barely recognizable. Galatia was another name for Phrygia, as well as I point out later in another work that I believe Galatia is Galilee from the original New Testament area of Christ and the disciples. There is no way the Galatians could have ever witnessed Christ's crucifixion, per the story we have been handed down. Galatia was in Turkey and still till this day it is the capital called, Ankara, which is about 217 miles from Istanbul. First, I do not believe Christ was anywhere near Jerusalem in the Middle East. Secondly, the church of Galatia was supposedly the result of Paul's ministry that occurred after Christ had already been killed. Those people called into the church would have never known about Jesus' crucifixion prior to them learning about Jesus, unless his story was homegrown and contemporary. Therefore, the Galatians would have never even known about Christ unless the event occurred right in their back door, of which it did. The ministry of most of the disciples was in Turkey of Asia Minor, because this is where it all began, not the Middle East. Even John and Peter and the most of the apostles ministered in Turkey, and not the Middle East. The true Jesus was most likely in Zagrad which was a type of Jerusalem, but it is not where we call Jerusalem today. There is some strong proof that Christ was born circa 1053 AD in Turkey, and not 4 BC in Jerusalem, Israel, as was reported. Read Anatoly Fomenko, History Fiction or Science. In fact, even till this day, there is a belief that the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, is the rebuilt Temple of Solomon the Great, which ironically enough was built by a man named, Suleiman the Great. Also. There is a burial there that reveals the name of Jesus, but many claim it was Jeshua, Joshua the son of Nun. I have located pictures of this area and have discovered what I believe to be the very hill that Christ was crucified on, overlooking the Bosporus Sea. And even if this was Joshua the son of Nun, why would Jeshua, Joshua be in Turkey either? It seems everyone was in Turkey and yet Turkey is hardly ever mentioned from a religious point of view and yet everything began there. Very strange. And is it just a coincidence that the name Jesus comes from the name Joshua, Joshua? And how is it that we have been given a story that Jesus did not have a human father, but he was the son of God? Could it be the son of Nun, which is the epithet of Joshua buried in Turkey, meant the son of Nun, referencing Christ as falsely proclaimed down through history that he did not have a human father? Again, just speculation here, but there is verifiable proof as to this grave location as well as the area where this Jeshua was buried is nearly exact as to the description of Jesus' tomb in the Bible. In fact, it is more accurate than what we see in Jerusalem today, which is basically hearsay and delusion. There are also many other proofs to back up this theory, more than most would ever like to surface. Our history is riddled with lies, and has been seriously modified to create the greatest lie ever, to promote a false agenda. Remember though, Lucifer was setting himself up as the Christ, and therefore he was mimicking the Christ to steal or supplant the real power. Just like Jacob supplanted Esau. These stories whether allegorical or not are all describing hidden truths of our past. Therefore, Jacob who also represents Satan. Lucifer, was used to steal this birthright away, 
and his children became the royal and blue blood lineage on earth. And a false Jesus Christ was set up and decreed to be in Jerusalem or what we call the Middle East. Yet it may be that none of it was true, it was all concocted so the later generations would worship Satan in that area under the name, Zionism. I did not say Judaism, I said Zionism. The two are completely different. They then used secrets and rituals from within the Middle Ages or Renaissance era to backtrack the time to 4 BC or thereabouts, which was another lie, and the entire world has bought into this fabrication. I can't even begin to reveal how they pulled this off due to lack of space, however the information is out there. Look up Anatoly Fomenko and his massive volumes of proof will begin to slowly reveal the jig is up. Proving complete libraries were created of false works, establishing artifacts, paintings, sculptures and writings, via fraudulent means, and depositing them in ancient burial grounds to give the effect it was ancient history. Remember in the beginning of this book I said these things were DNA downloads to corrupt our minds. Read closely this clue, many have heard about the Knights Templars, but few understand why they came into existence. It was in about 1118 AD that the Templars united to become a force of retribution on this earth. The reason they came together was to search out and kill those who murdered the Lord on the tree. Now forgive me for asking the obvious, but where in the world would they find the killers of Christ over 1000 years later in the 12th century? However, based on new science and Middle Age astrological charts, it appears Jesus did not exist 1000 years prior, but in fact he existed in the 11th century, possibly between the dates of 1053 to 1086 AD. Interesting to note the area we know as Russia today, I believe the story was about the 14th century where it revealed that they had sent a fleet of ships via the Black Sea towards the Bosporus Strait to the area where they were told Christ was slain. Strangely enough they were sent to Turkey around what was called, Constantinople, today Istanbul. Now how could they have been that far off? So now the idea the Templars came together in 1118 AD to find Christ killers, is not so far-fetched anymore. It would have been only 32 years after the fact, not over 1000 years. Jesus was never killed on a cross. The cross was a satanic emblem to represent Lucifer as the physical son of God or the son being God himself, and the cross was the southern cross. The sun reigns in the center of the cross. Crux slash KRKS slash is the smallest of the 88 modern constellations, but is one of the most distinctive. Its name is Latin for cross, and it is dominated by a cross-shaped asterism that is commonly known as the southern cross. Jesus was crucified on a tree not a cross. The tree represented the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It represented the true lineage of the children of the Father that were staked to the false tree and all were crucified, or the light was hidden in darkness as the souls were hidden in the earth avatar bodies. It represented all the children of the Father and Mother being staked to the tree of death to live in what is called the world of death or the false tree of the knowledge of good and evil by being slaves to the false God and false Christ, until the day they are re-established by the tree of life, or the resurrection, that is the awakening. And until the process is over the true seeds are no longer perceived as children and heirs to a glorious kingdom, but bondage servants under the law of death via a false kingdom. Jesus was crucified on this tree because the Lord God's wanted to destroy any knowledge of the family tree of life. And thus, the false Christ took over under the power of Lucifer who was then made to appear as the one slain on the crux. And till this day many in the religious world are worshipping a dead Christ on a cross, instead of honoring the living Christ within, because they worship the cross of death instead of harmonizing themselves with the tree of life. Chapter 53 Jesus the Son of Man slash Adam slash Seth Jesus said that at the end of the ages, the people will be exactly as they were during the time of Noah and the flood. This is critical to understand what is now emerging. So as the days of Noah were. Why was Jesus known as the Son of Man? Because the true Jesus was not, I repeat was not one of the sons of God? 
but the false Jesus was born of the seed of a God and thus he was known as the Son of God. If you do not know how to decipher the codes, you will not understand. Let me break it down again, the children of Cain were known as the sons of God, the children of Seth are known as the sons of man. Therefore, both Jesus the Son of Man and Jesus the Son of God are both in the Bible, but they are not the same entity, but are in enmity towards one another. This group of fallen aliens have been cast off their world due to their warlike nature and everywhere they went they brought this same warlike mind with them, and they destroyed other planets, this was known as the second war in heaven. Heaven is made up of an infinity of dimensions. It is not just one place. As it stated, in my father's house are many mansions. Mansions are dimensions. The decline of densities enabling the polarity field to operate is what the term, falling represents. To fall means leaving eternal reality and entering a decaying corrupt realm called the third and fourth density and being trapped, like and being in quicksand. Eventually all the children of the father and mother will separate from the fallen angels, and will move back to the higher densities where the father and mother's energy is paramount. When it speaks of, so as the days of Noah were so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I have written extensively over the years on this subject. Christ is not coming back to rule this world because this is not or ever has been his world. The problem is two activities are occurring at the end of the ages at the very same time. The first event is when Christ is coming to gather his wheat into the barn, removing them from this realm. And a second event will be occurring at the same time, where a thief in the night will bring great destruction to this world. That second event is the Lord's day, where the heavens and earth will melt with a fervent heat, along with the coming of a Lord. I do not have time to spend on this subject. My other books will reveal more detail on these things. But the coming of the thief in the night or the Lord on the Lord's day is not Christ returning to take over the earth, as many believe. Christ made it plain that the kingdom comes not by observation, no I shall witness his return, because as he stated, the kingdom of the Father is within you. What is coming that is going to be a thief in the night and bring great destruction where every I shall observe, from the rising of the sun to the east and to the setting in the west? It will be a planetary cyclical event. It is none other than Sumerian Nibiru the great lord in the heavens, the Sumerian planet of the crosses. The day of the Lord, representation. Chapter 54. Am I misrepresenting the facts? Before I get into the next segment I want to address one issue, because there will always be naysayers that attack a work like this saying, I am the one that is off base and being negatively inspired. However, they will not search for themselves or simply take a good look at the fruits, they take a blind eye to the reality for fear of the consequences. They condemn the people doing the legwork while they sit there accepting propaganda and then they defend it. They love their mask and they will defend it to their graves because they drank of the mixture of the deadly cocktail and do not even realize it. It has become their faith, and as I will never stand against anyone's faith, because I believe faith is powerful, I will say this much, faith is not the enemy, believing in a lie is. Some will no doubt say, because I have heard it all, that the lie had nothing to do with knowing about good and evil, the lie was telling Adam and Eve that they would not surely die. Before I explain it, this is the type of rhetoric that is programmed into people via the entire DNA download and it's why they accept terror mixed with truth so easily. First, the Lord of the garden told Eve, in the day they ate or touched the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that Adam and Eve would surely die. The serpent then said, you will not die but your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. The die-hard advocates will claim, see, the serpent lied. And then they completely forget the most important part of the story, and that is, why were the gods dabbling in both good and evil? Why was evil in the garden of God? They don't want to touch that because it does not fit with the programming mask. The Lord told Eve, that in the day that they would eat thereof they would shall surely die. The term day here means 24-hour period. Coming from the Hebrew Yam. Question number 1, 
Did Adam and Eve drop dead from eating or partaking of this knowledge in that same day? Nope. Evidently the scriptures reveal Adam lived for 930 years as likened as one of the ancient Olams of the Shims, and why not, they created him. Nothing was said about Eve, but we know she had to be alive for some time because humanity is the fruit of this operation, and we know for a fact that Seth was born much later when Adam was already 130 years old. But wait, if Adam was one of the gods then how can be part of humanity? The entire human race was created by the gods, it is only where the soul is implanted do we know the difference. Humanity is all the same, except for blood. Some have higher DNA blood and some have lower. The vessel or avatar we wear as a body means absolutely nothing, it is where the soul is seeded, and that is all that counts. Secondly the naysayers will claim that God did not mean that they would die that very day but instead of having eternal life, they would die. Wow that is some amazing conjecture. We learned that what was represented as eternal life was in fact, Olam, verifying the men of great renown, people lived upwards to 1000 years. Now they will say, the tree of life was blocked to them once they took of the fruit of the forbidden tree, so in that sense they died and the serpent lied. Listen, I am not defending the serpent. He led humanity into a massive orchestrated plot to control them as slaves. My friends the tree of life was not some aphrodisiac or some elixir to the fountain of youth that would keep people alive forever. The reason they were led away from the tree of life is because they went after the forbidden tree and lost their identity. It did not cause them to die physically, it sent them into living in death perpetually until the trance was broken. It is not possible that flesh and blood could be given eternal life. Humanity was suckered into a trap where they were placed into this realm of decay and corruption, which meant they would experience death as a matter of living in this realm via illusion. Whereas if they remained in their original state, they would never have had to experience death. But you must understand, death is not what we have been told it is. For the soul never dies it just experiences death repeatedly while asleep until it is awakened. We know now that within each of the true seeds is the spiritual flame of the real creator, but the bodies that were given by the shadow lords never had eternal life, they are masks of illusion covering over eternal reality. They are always in a state of decay. And whether they live 50 years or 900 years it is still in decay it can never be eternal. Now understand the mystery, it reveals that the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. It means one would enter the realm of death, yet still be aware even though they are no longer awake, because death only seems real to eternal beings who are now sleeping. When the serpent was telling Eve, you shall not surely die, he meant from an eternal standpoint. Death is not real. The only problem is what he failed to tell the woman was even though you shall not surely die, you will enter the realm of death where one is reborn constantly in a living hell while experiencing the illusory corruption, decay and death in what could be defined as an eternal death, until awakened. The key is, death is not real, it is also an illusion, because nothing the father created in the beginning could ever possibly die including the angels. But when we fell for this trap, death brought on the appearance of reality and therefore, Adam and Eve could now die. But again, was it a lie? The serpent knew they could not really die having the power of the tree of life within them. But they were tricked into taking the knowledge of good and evil and they were symbolically removed away from the tree of life to experience death, but not only is death not real, but they were never truly removed from the tree of life either. Humanity was forever condemned to die and be reborn in a never-ending story always forgetting who they were, by coming into the waters of forgetfulness, that is the human sheath. Once again, those that accept the DNA download will then come back and say, well what this means is God would have given them eternal life if they obeyed, but since they disobeyed they were not allowed to have eternal life and their soul would be condemned. Do you understand where this thinking would lead you? If Adam and Eve were given eternal life, due to obedience, based on the original story handed down, then where would you and I come from? What would happen to humanity? No one else would have ever been born. 
and therefore, no one else except Adam and Eve would ever exist, if you accept this entire DNA download. My friends, we do not have souls, this is the greatest misnomer ever spoken. We are the soul, the body is a container only. If the soul was ever removed it would simply mean that you were taken somewhere else, yet your body could remain. The human body is a counterfeit that covers the real you and me, that is the soul, which is always connected to the tree of life, which is connected to Christ, and connected to the father and mother. However, the human body of flesh and blood is connected to another tree, a tree called death. It is only in the illusion we see ourselves connected to the forbidden tree of death while appearing separated from the tree of life. The big question should have been the entire time when we were told this story from the beginning, even if this story was true the way it was handed down, do you really believe that God could decide a person's spiritual eternal fate based on one decision made in the garden that was promoted by an evil being that should by rights have never been there in the first place? And if they lost eternal life, then what was the entire story of Jesus then? How could he save you if you were already condemned to death? Why keep the charade going? And why would Jesus need to save you from God, if he was the Son of God and as he claimed, Jesus and the Father were one and the same? Why suffer and bloodshed? Why not just forgive? And what was the real reason to spill the blood of Christ to cover sins, when no sin can be covered by blood? Because blood is death of the human body, it has no eternal reality about it. The God of the ancients was never the father and mother, and Jesus proved this continually. The facts as they play out in the literal let reveal, that the serpent told the male and female the truth, but the truth led them into their own kidnapping. So, did the serpent lie? Not completely, except by omission, he simply used the truth about the gods to create bondage, and this is the real story of the garden of the mask of illusion. Therefore, the soul of Adam was the awakened Christ who then sat on the tree of knowledge leading Adam, his counterpart and Eve, his other half to take of this tree because this was now going to be the path to fulfilling the metamorphosis and change. The true seeds via this process would never openly rebel like the angels did and thereby forevermore become perfected like their divine parents through the process of death transmuting unto life. Chapter 55 love covers a multitude of sins. There are just too many variables why people do what they do, but most of it is via deceptions and ignorance being launched at them from these wicked beings. An example may be a young child raised in a household where they are molested and beaten. Their own father sexually abused this poor child throughout their childhood. Then the child grows up and begins to sexually abuse their children. This is abhorrent behavior. But if it wasn't for a loving father and mother who understands why sin and weakness occur, then we would all be tossed into the fire. Grace is all about giving people more chances in different lives. Grace is not a one-time pardon and then the fire. Grace is continual mercy. Jesus spoke of this mercy as to being in forgiveness seventy times seven times for the same sin. Another point is that we may see a child like this and believe they should have changed from what the father did to them, so there are no excuses. Yet this child is no different than anyone else in this world, the problem is they were placed into a damning situation and had trouble breaking free from the insidious attack where it was grafted into their mind. The reason I say no different, is because all humans are like this by program designed. When things occur continually people believe that it is an established reality. Therefore, 99% of humanity follows like sheep, because they have been suckered in by this false world into believing it is all real. The following is a message that comes from the New Testament. There are two terms being used in the following, spiritual law and sin. In this addendum, I have changed the term spiritual law to the bread of life, and the term, sin I have changed to, the program. Read carefully as to fully understand. We begin. We know that the bread of life is spiritual, but I am, as pertaining to the body, unspiritual, sold as a slave to the program. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate, that, 
I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the bread of life is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the program operating, with, in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in, the program, that is, in my programmed nature. For I, the soul, have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the program I do not want to follow, this I keep on allowing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the program living in me that does it. So I find the bread of life at work, although I want to do well, the program, is right the with, in, me. For in my inner being, the soul within the body, I delight in the bread of life. However, I see another program at work within me, waging war against the bread of life of my mind and making me a prisoner of the will of the program at work within me. What a wretched person I am! Who'll rescue me from this, programmed, body of death? Thanks, better the bread of life. Abhorrent behavior is in everyone because of the virtual reality simulation program. So never think you are better than one another. The day you are placed into the same situation as this description of the young lad, is the day we can decide who should throw the first stone. This is not an acceptance of abhorrent behavior, this is mercy being shown when this behavior materializes because we should all know better than to condemn anyone when we all live in bodies of death that can easily be seduced to commit any error. Secondly, remember I wrote in an earlier chapter about the woman who was transported into hell with Jesus. Remember the soul who was asking for forgiveness. If a soul was repenting and asking for help, why would Jesus rebuke him and at the same time, take a blind eye and allow the demons to party along and never issue a warning to them? Is it possible this Jesus like the gods of old is in league with these demons? Here they are, the guardians of hell, butchering, torturing and deceiving, and yet they are the gatekeepers. But the ones who have been lied to, deceived, manipulated and coerced, they are the ones getting punished without mercy. It is the same old story, the gods all work together as a team whether they are playing demons or gods. They are all one and the same, and whatever trick or trap they set, the demons go free, and the humans get punished. This was obviously not the true Christ. Now these places that this woman went to do exist in the fourth dimensional mind realm as I revealed earlier. These souls that are in this place called hell believe they must be there because they bought into the lie of hell and their own unworthiness. They remain being punished and tortured via the mind only, until they awaken. I say mind only, because in the fourth dimension there is no flesh and blood. They think they are still human and that is why they appear to suffer. In the fourth dimension there is also no pain, no sensations likened unto the third dimension, unless your mind creates the illusion of it. Also. Fire cannot harm the soul, the soul comes from spirit and fire can only consume the matter illusory world. Fire can consume the body, but not the soul. Now this woman claims she was with the real Jesus, however I can assure you it was not the real Jesus. In fact, there are more stories of people who are taken to these fallen worlds of hell where Jesus comes to deliver the poor souls, telling them it is not real. It is all in the mind and he lovingly escorts them out of there. Which one do you believe? Who is your father and mother? Answer, you shall know them by their fruits. Whatever you are witnessing, is it from the fruits of darkness or the fruits of life and love? Read book one again, The Forbidden Knowledge, The Children of the Harvest. Chapter 56. Are True Souls Paying a Penalty? So why have we been left unattended to become fodder for fallen gods? Was it because we broke their initial laws and now we must pay? When you think about it when parents have children those children are given rules of the house so to speak, they are to follow those rules via the fact they are the offspring. No one else really has the power or right to interfere. If the children break a law or rule of the house, then they are punished or reprimanded. In that sense, we must follow our parents' rules and laws. When Christ came via Jesus, he did not come to destroy the law, 
he came to fulfill it. This means he fulfilled the obligation of the contract. Once the law was fulfilled it no longer has any power. However, he never removed the law. That law can never be removed until heaven and earth pass away and the process is fulfilled. This had confused so many in the religious world. The ancient law contract only had power because it condemned you, if one was not condemned by that law it had no power anymore. However, if you are not accepting the divine parents in your life via the Son, as the Christ through faith, then you are being brought back under the law and must do these God's biddings. This is the real law of keeping us as prisoners until we change. It is only through Christ that we have access back to the father and mother and then we can also break free from the law of bondage. Being free from the law of bondage doesn't give us the right to sin willfully, if it means harming one another. We must still honor the precepts of love one to another, which fulfills the entire law and the prophets. Jesus said, Love one another, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto to others as you would have them do unto you. If you do these things, you fulfill the law and have broken the contract of bondage and death with these aliens. You see when it all comes right down to it, when we live by the value of service to one another, we won't desire to contravene the laws of the gods, and if they try to come after us on some trumped up charge, we will either be protected or it is part of our life plan, because we are honoring the rule of love via our divine parents. Either way we win. It doesn't mean we don't sin, for until the transfiguration and metamorphosis occurs, we still live inside the body of death, which means sin. But if we are under Christ in faith it means we are no longer under the law. Book 4, The Keys to the Master Code and Spirit World, will reveal this in detail. What finally needs to be understood, is all humanity is of the offspring of these gods, but via illusion due to the DNA matrix engineering that they created via the simulation. Jesus never tried to abort the process, he went along with it so the plan could be fulfilled. We are the children of these beings from a physical, mask standpoint. Just like we are children of our physical parents or progenitors here in the flesh, even though we predate this time and world and have lived with many other families, races, creeds and cultures. This progeny extends back to the gods who first made us like them and brought us into existence via the science of manipulation, the birthing DNA via the holographic simulation matrix. Chapter 57. Factions, Parties, and Religions The gods of the olden days never hesitated to create conflict and war. They were in fact the author of confusion, destruction and bloodshed and today many of the same gods are still promoting war and violence under different names for different games. I realize most of what I am saying is not easy to accept. Most of your cherished beliefs will be hindered, because I chose to reveal this polarity game that has been unleashed upon our minds. I am not here to defend evil I am here to reveal the con. These gods are false gods that have only one thing on their mind, to twist distort and deceive to keep the enmity game going. It is called, Ordo Ab Chaos, the gods create the disorder to establish order, Elohim style. This should not destroy a person's faith if they were truly relying on the divine father and mother within for their guidance. But it is surely a bitter pill to swallow when you have placed your entire life in the hands of frauds hoping they will save you when in fact they are the ones that have enslaved you in the first place. For in the mouth the words taste like honey sweet and tender but in the stomach, it becomes bitter and filled with sickness. Today we still have camps all vying for the auspicious label of being better than someone else. In almost everything we witness on this earth, it has been tampered with to enter the volley between the good and evil camps. Of course, they do not use these terms. The terms used today are usually factions, parties and or religions. Each group considers their mindset to be the most logical and correct mindset. The opposing opinion is usually considered not even worthy for discussion. We all find ourselves leaning to some agenda set up by these gods whether we like it or not or are even aware of it. We allow ourselves to be governed by parties and factions. We tend to gravitate to a personal socially accepted view that idolizes our concepts. 
yet we fail to comprehend that as soon as we give over our power of thought to any group, party or religious orientation, we subject ourselves to the cunning diabolical use of our acceptances carte blanche to lead us any way the faction or party chooses. In other words, if someone else believes as you do, you do not have to sell your soul to them and give over your right to think, simply because you agree on a few points. Most people without realizing it subject themselves to a logic that is so skewed it makes you wonder why they allowed it to occur. It happens because humans have lost the will to learn via personal experience. They surrender their will over to whomever seems to be closest to their mindset so that they no longer do the work involved to grow. Just because someone may agree on a few points does not mean they agree on all other points too, but that is how factions and parties are created. It is to lure own to completely surrender their heart, mind and soul over to another, carte blanche, without asking any additional questions. This way the enmity stays alive and you pretend everything is copacetic. Therefore, a simple agreement can lead to total party domination over the mind. We see today that political parties operate like this. People begin to follow a party because it addresses some issues that they might agree with. However, once you succumb to the party's wishes, then often people surrender all other thoughts to come in total allegiance to the party mind. Where you may have agreed on one or two points, the party now has you in their grasp to follow them and even support them, even though the party's agenda may have nothing to do with your own, and it could be extremely diabolical and utterly dangerous. People become lazy, they do not want to have to think. So they throw all their rights away to an ideology that eventually leads them to the abyss of darkness, stranded and trapped. The division within the law of polarity has been the destabilizing factor for ages. No matter what you think or believe an enemy, enmity will be created thus confusing the world into surrendering their logic and spiritual mind as a defense against the other rationality, at least this is what billions have been suckered into following. I have witnessed in the political and religious arena that may have gambled away their soul on an issue that they will support because their party accepts it. Yet if another party or faction proclaims basically the same thing, the people that have surrendered their mind over to the previous faction will mock and ridicule the other faction for the very thing they already accepted. And it is not being done because of what the concepts pertain to, but simply because they are not of your party. Any group affiliation is, mind control. Yet you could agree on the same exact point or points, but all because the enmity was placed between you and them, you will be of a disagreeable mindset toward the other faction even though they might even agree. This was the type of division the gods created very effectively with the use of enmity. This is the silliness we have been subjected to by extremely violent gods who love warfare and dissension more than peace, love and unity. They are the gods who play both ends against the middle. These gods are supporting all the differing factions, parties, and religions. All of them. These gods have had direct hand in creating all organized factions. They will play all ends and crush the people within the middle, because only confusion, Babel, will rule at the end of the day. And if these gods can further their agenda the people will remain mental doormats. We as humans have been drugged into stupidity because we allow ourselves to place our hope and mental security within a group mind, beehive mentality. Often when this happens we become so polarized that when truth is revealed we simply cannot accept it because it did not come from our party that we have surrendered our soul over to. We have been created to follow what is called a herd mentality, where we are being governed by another agenda rather than our own. Even in religious groups people have admitted that when they were revealed something from within, they tried to tell their group about it. However, they are often met with resistance, telling them that if truth is to be revealed it will come through the hierarchy of the group and not one of its individuals. This is very convenient and yet extremely damning, because it is all part of the blue blood dogma agenda of rule. This is another reason the gods created polarity. It was to keep people locked within the ideologies of a group mind rather than using one's own mind. Therefore, 
if truth is ever revealed it will be expunged from your mind immediately with no questions asked by the affiliations that you have subjected yourself to. This occurs so often it is unbelievable how fast people within said factions are denounced by their so-called leaders when they try to use their own soul mind. Chapter 58 The Technological Debacle They created a simulation to give the appearance of real power but it was all a charade, con game and masquerade. They had knowledge of cloning and test tube birth creation that which we are now being taught by these same entities. They could fly through space in a limited sense using craft that we are close to matching once again today. In all truth, these were the simulation programmers. They can still travel through dimensions of time and space but they are limited as to how far they can really maneuver. Again though, it is not because humanity became so intelligent to figure it all out and now we have the smarts to create these ancient technologies. The same Elohim gods are presenting Earth with these technologies to try to fulfill their ultimate plan of total barbaric galactic slavery, which in times past has always meant the destruction of a planet in the third density. In every manner of thought they appeared to those of less knowledge as a god, or divine beings. This was the forbidden tree in the center of the garden. Technology is not divine it is an illusion. The forbidden tree was the forbidden knowledge of quantum science and physics which were in the hands of the master computer simulation programmers. This is what gives these gods the illusion of power, not because of divine right but because they have mastered the art of certain higher sciences to be used in the matter realms. As stated before they are computer nerds. They created a virtual reality to be their new abode and they live inside of it also. They control the mainframe of the computer at this level. What this means is, they can control this world from both the third and fourth dimensions. That is right, you read that correctly. They are the ones who are sending souls back into this world to reincarnate. Chapter 59 Fourth Dimensional Projection One must begin to deepen their understanding about quantum physics and how it plays in the world we appear to exist within. Let me try to explain a little how this functions. The fourth dimension acts like a repository of thoughts that when focusing your mind, you begin to create an ethereal image not yet manifested. Worlds exist within the fourth density realm just like here but operate under different laws. Your thoughts can bring out of nothingness something of what appears to be tangible, yet it is only an energy creation by thought. However, it is not an eternal reality creation. It is not real per se, it is just your thoughts materializing into a form, using simulations. Within the fourth density, if you focus long and hard enough your thoughts will form into whatever it is that is coming from your mental operations. As an example, if you were to think about a gold coin, it will begin to form ethereally in 4D. It would look very real, you could touch it, taste it, whatever you desired, I have done this in the fourth dimension. Now here is the catch 22, let's say you were thinking about a gold coin and it materialized in the fourth dimension, however, what may occur is that it is complete with detail, which you didn't even think about. An example might be, that your thoughts raised the idea that the gold coin was an American gold eagle, but all you were concentrating on was the gold coin, and yet it formed into complete detail as an American gold eagle. That is a good trick. An amazing feat, how in the world based only on your thoughts could you bring forth a gold coin with complete detail and yet none of the detail entered your thoughts. This is because the fourth density is a thought creation ocean repository. It is carrying all the thoughts of everyone, humans, angels, and demons. If you do not identify detail you will simply attract a closer creation that has already been manifested. When I use the term manifested, this is when the thought creation of the fourth density begins to take on matter form in the third density. What I am referring to is cumulative thoughts from everyone, or common fields of thoughts being produced by everyone is what creates this realm using a programmed simulation. It is not a computer per se as we would understand it, it is more like a mind program that operates from your thoughts and then manifests. The difference between reality and illusion 
is reality is eternal by nature, illusion is temporary. One might say the fourth dimension is a practice realm for creation somewhat akin to simulation games for spirit children. This may seem like science fiction but my friends, this is part of the tree of good and evil. It is all about the power these gods have access to, as well as we all do, but living in ignorance keeps us slaves to those who understand how it all operates. The game itself nor the third or fourth densities are evil, it is just the way they have been used and are manipulated by dark forces. What we see, touch, taste, hear, and smell in this world all comes from a source beyond this world. Everything we recognize using our limited portal called, Five Senses, is first drafted as a blueprint from inside the thought energy realm, called the fourth dimension. Whether it is a mountain, a river, even a sun, moon or stars, it is all coalesced thought energy that has been changed into matter via projection. When Lucifer brought his intentions into this realm, it became a mind realm of darkness supplanting the light. One could say the lower fourth dimension is Lucifer's home. It is where all the lower thoughts began to create lower vibratory worlds that one could easily say is a prison for unawakened souls. Lucifer did not create the lower dimensions, but he uses them to broadcast his mind and spirit due to the fact it is a mind realm creation. The structure of all dimensions was created by the father and mother. However, they did not create the lower vibration, which resulted out of Lucifer's fall. The fourth dimension must exist for the third dimension to exist. For the third dimension is simply thoughts coalesced and projected from the mind realm program. When I use the term program I mean it is being controlled, it is not just a hodgepodge of thoughts. Someone on the other side is making sure it is being controlled at their level of awareness. Chapter 60 we are sleeping in the fourth dimension. We all exist within the fourth dimension, but our souls are asleep. We are living inside a dream world believing we are in these bodies, but we are what some may call, placed in a coma or deep sleep, existing in worlds and believing it is all real via our consciousness awareness. When Adam was stated to have been taken and placed into a deep sleep, this happened when humanity was lowered into the fourth dimension as souls and then rebooted into the third dimensional realm via matter. The problem is Adam never awakened once he entered this lower form, which represents all souls. We simply became aware through another level of mind, like a dream. And it represented how that all of humanity as souls or the children of the father and mother would eventually be placed in the third dimension, sleeping but also being aware. Although some things were twisted around and convoluted so we would not understand a tree of deception, the key for everyone to understand is, this world is built my thought projections within the fourth dimension and then they are projected into the matter world, as a type of holographic universe. The fig leaves that were sown were not clothes to cover Adam's and Eve's bodily nakedness, but it was that they became aware again inside a world of matter that appeared very real, but their new sensations were denser, they were more in tune to feeling pain and sensing things around them from a physical point of view, not spiritual. The fig leaves were the avatar bodies that we have been programmed into exist in a simulated world, like a virtual reality. That is why these bodies operate more like a computer, but they are biological computers. And although we never left the fourth density, our awareness is operating in a lower dimension. Now this is odd, why would Adam and Eve suddenly see themselves as naked? It never bothered them before, unless this was not the literal meaning, now suddenly, they are ashamed? Obviously, something else is occurring here. God then comes out of nowhere calling for them, wondering where they are. Why can't the all-seeing God recognize not only where they are, but also what had transpired? Why is God acting naive? God said, Where are you? Adam being afraid said that he was naked and hid himself. One of the gods replied, Who told you that you were naked? Now this is really getting weird. You mean someone had to tell Adam and Eve that they were naked? as if this was a shock discovery? 
was God really that unaware of the circumstances, or is it how some religious people believe, God just wanted to hear it from their own lips. When Adam tried to throw all the blame on Eve about what had occurred, Eve stated that the serpent beguiled her. That should have been enough for God to have said, I am sorry I will deal with the serpent later. You are forgiven. The truth is, God wanted to know how did the male and female figure out that they are no longer part of their higher world. What God most likely also said was, who told you this was a virtual reality and artificial spirit? Chapter 61. The Computer Program. If this is in type like a computer program why can't they just program the computer to create any shape or being at will for the simulation? Why are they having to integrate inside the program to create the cast of characters? The answer is simple and my book called, The Forbidden Legacy of the Gods, will explain it further. But for right now I will just say, is that the reason that some of the gods have become part of the program was because of the war in heaven, and they lost, where with their legs were symbolically cut off and now they must meander around on their bellies. The last war in heaven, was a war between the gods, and Satan lost and was cast down. But Lucifer remained in the heavens with his angels who are now the many aliens we see often. The gods are now both earthbound as well as in heaven, space as the duality force of good and evil. These gods who lost the war, were having to manifest inside the programmed protocols of illusion. Like creating any virtual reality, they must choose what type body they wanted and how they would enter the virtual world. Now remember the lower virtual worlds were already created. This had been done long ago by Lucifer. However, just like any program there are multiple worlds, types beings, and rules of the game. Each world had their own codes and programming. To integrate upon these worlds, the cast of characters would have to do so through the programmed procedures. Each world had already been added into the program, and they were all unique. On planet Earth prior to the alien and human seeding, the highest form of life was the Neanderthal. A human type entity but closer to the ape. The Neanderthal was part of the original programming of the mind realm fourth density earth, which projected into this realm or third dimension and became matter or a physical type world. Again, let me repeat, all matter universes are simply a projection from the fourth dimension, nothing is here but the mind being projected from within. It is more like watching a 3D movie, or even better yet it is like watching a mirror image of something that is reflecting into a pool of water. When you stand in front of a mirror you see your reflection, the image in the mirror is a three-dimensional image coming from a projection or reflection of the actual source. Therefore, mirrors are often used to connect with the fourth dimension because it is like a connector point between both realms via a projection. Chapter 62. The game is afoot. One needs to begin to descramble these clues before they will ever be able to comprehend this gnosis. One needs to begin to realize that many of these gods are walking around in flesh and blood just like we are through the Omniverse holographic program. Others are wearing alien costumes, and still others are either imprisoned in the fourth dimension or they exist inside the Earth and possibly other planets of the fake solar system. Those that come into the flesh, they are born, they live, and they die and they are reborn again as is their tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It must be noted that they are spirit essences that dwell within human bodies via the computer simulation program. I hope this is not too confusing. This was part of the fall, they fell into a lower realm which I will designate as the third and fourth densities or dimensions, whichever will be easier to understand. I speak of the computer program and I know it does not make total sense yet. Our human bodies are nothing but a holographic projection and this body is simply a file in a computer system that is collecting data all the time, both text, audio and video on each of us called the Library of Remembrance or Book of Remembrance. All life is first spirit form that uses other forms such as matter. Consciousness is spirit. However, the religious world has had us believe that there are only three forms of life, spirit evil, spirit good, 
and flesh and blood. Or demons, angels and humans. Spirit is the first energy, and flesh is just a form spirit can use via the program, whether good or evil. And although the Archons created the computer matrix mindless system, they cannot control it completely. They are limited as to what they can do by the true father and mother, which when all is said and done are ultimately in control of everything. Demons, angels and other entities can use fleshly form via downloading or projections into these avatar bodies. Many times, the Bible refers to angels as men walking amongst the humans. These can be the static units walking among the interactive agents and they are simply referring to the fallen Nephilim who were also born in the flesh, but are being controlled by another spirit. Static units refer to a spirit of malevolence. A static unit is basically a Borg as we have learned on the TV shows called Star Trek, a biological robotic organism that has no mind of its own, it only follows orders by the degrees handed down through its mainframe. Plus, there are actual divine angels from the father and mother, and are still active and often play roles in our lives to further our potential and plan. Angels are messengers, guides and protectors. Angels from the Father, watch us from within the program as external agents, being aware of everything around us, whereas the Father and Mother observe us from within. The Elohim were called both angels and demons that used the flesh as a biological computer. When their fleshly counterpart passes on, they then leave the virtual reality and simply exist at another level or density without physical form in the fourth density, although they do have etheric form or what we may call ghostly. Often their etheric form is very troubling indeed. Their minds concoct an evil beyond imagination and their forms are often forms of monsters and grotesque aliens. Can these beings affect humanity from another level and density? Yes. They can but not nearly as powerful as they can when they use a physical veil, mask under law. There is a place for the fallen angels deep within the recesses of the fourth density. From there they can control people by thought transference, which can lead to demonic possession or inspiration as a doorway for them to enter if allowed. The astral realm was sometimes referred to in the Bible as going inside the earth. This was the only way writers could explain this transition. However, there are entities who dwell inside the earth, as part of the program, that may be aliens from other dimensions, along with humans, which are their prisoners or slaves. Overall though they have better control when they are hands-on. They can manipulate much greater and with far better precision when they can appear to exist among the humans and then use their mask of cover which disguises their identity to deceive. Chapter 63 Lights Camera Action there are vast numbers of alien travelers that exists within the fourth dimension and even higher. Many of them can project into these third density worlds to take a peek and leave again without ever being spotted. I believe the father and mother created the fourth dimensional mind realm to be able to think or become anything you desire without controls or limitations. It became an amusement park for spirits. Lucifer then used this creation for his own benefit to steal souls away by deception, by projecting his fallen mind into parts of the third dimension. The fourth dimension is literally the Star Trek holodeck, it becomes whatever you want it to become. Each dimension is in type of density. As you move up in density you are at a higher vibrational level. As an example, when you jump from the third density to the fourth you simply disappear from the lower vibration as the human body cannot go with you, only the soul mind, because you are now operating at a higher vibration. You could still be in this realm, but now unseen. This is where ghosts come into play, whereas the soul mind moves on. You might be a tad confused as to what is meant by the soul mind. This is the mystery of the soul. Our soul is not here. It exists in the fourth dimension while the mind of the soul is projected here. Our earth is at a level of third density as a projection. If you were to jump into the fourth, you would vanish from here. If you left the fourth and entered the fifth, again you would disappear from the previous. And on and on it goes. However, what remains in all densities is consciousness awareness. 
those of the fourth density can see you in the third, and those of the fifth and higher can see within you as if living inside of your mind, but those of the lower densities cannot see above them without some sort of aid. Our planet we call Earth exists in the fourth dimension and higher, but we cannot see it in that dimension, because we are also projected into the third. The Earth in the fourth dimension is a mind realm Earth. And it will appear very much like this Earth except without all its flaws. The errors and flaws are a result of the programmed rules of the third dimension. The Earth is also in the fifth dimension and beyond where reality begins to form in its perfect state. Understand, dimensions are levels of density or the building blocks of reality. The lower dimensions are illusions or mind creations, the higher densities are forming reality. You have all seen pictures in science class where they try to say man evolved from the ape and you see the procession of development of the ape into the man. This is a crude way of revealing how spirit reality begins with steps of progression. It is showing how we develop or are born again in spirit. As we develop and build fruits we move through a progression from one step to another until we are formed into that diamond of perfection. However, the fallen angels never moved through a progression, they were created spirits from the beginning and they fell as spirits who then formed into something grotesque. They did not go through a progression. In a sense, it is like blueprints to a house, which are two-dimensional. As it moves up in density it becomes a three-dimensional model of what the two-dimensional blueprint reveals. As it continues the move upwards it begins to form into a fourth dimension until it reaches reality. Before it reaches reality, it is not real, only an illusion. You might ask, well if our soul is stuck in the fourth dimension, does this mean we are not truly real? Our soul is not the reality of our true nature. Our soul is also a projection from our spirit. You will learn much more about this in book 4. So why is the third density realm decaying? Because this is what is being projected via the mind as it contends with dark forces of the fourth density. The reason decay occurs is due to the consensus mind of the character actors and the rulers. Read closely, this is a massive hidden secret, as we succumb to a dark mode of thinking. Our thoughts that are being translated in the fourth dimension begin to recreate our surroundings and then it is manifested here within our third dimensional world. As the mind is overcome with the spirit of darkness and futility it begins to assert its influence over the surroundings and then it is projected downwards. Now you may understand why faith is so very important, because it counteracts these unnatural damning effects. The earth and all this exist in the fourth dimensional mind realm. We are there right now existing on a type of earth in the fourth dimension as the projected soul. But we are being projected to a lower density using some sort of mind technology, where we have been compromised. And as our minds are enveloped with a daily bombardment of negativity and dismay, we are helping to recreate the earth in the third density, to reshape it by our troubled thoughts per our mental view, and thus it is being projected back here again. This is what causes decay via corruption. Our world is a cesspool of thoughts unchecked and gone awry because we are sleeping. We are under a trance state illusion created by Lucifer because we took of the forbidden tree and fell into this dimension of the mind. Are you beginning to understand this yet? The fourth dimension is a mind illusory realm and none of it is real. It is all an amusement park for spirits to think and automatically create worlds at the speed of thought. How far must one go in vibration to get out of this mind realm? From what I understand, it is beyond the fourth dimension, as we climb up the ladder, the higher we go in density the closer we are to our divine parents, the higher we move up, the less we have form and the more the consciousness takes over completely. At the highest level, it is pure perfected consciousness, without form. As an example, even our human body reveals this at another level. On the surface of the third dimensional body we see flesh and bones. As we move deeper within, we see blood flowing, this is the life of the body at another level. Then as we move deeper we see organs that are used to control the body's every action. 
and then finally we see electrical signals firing like neurons. And this is who we really are, in type, at the highest level. Simply energy sparking like neurons. Chapter 64. Our Projected Universe. Each third dimensional world is a projection from the mind realm and all of them are separate. They are not located in the same time space solar system, galaxy or even visual universe. Therefore, one cannot travel beyond the local solar system and into the universe and other galaxies, they must go back to the fourth density and enter that realm first, to enter the various worlds. What we have is a copy of the fourth dimension in total as a singular time-space continuum being projected onto the third dimension to view these various worlds and yet they do not exist within this local third dimension, it is only a projected image. Our probes that we have sent out into space that have now entered beyond the furthest point in our solar system, are being blocked, and scientists do not understand why it won't move forward. It is likened as some of scientists have commented, that it is stuck inside a corridor. Many have existed on other worlds in our universe but via the illusion there really are no worlds out in space in our time-space continuum other than the projected holographic planets inside our own solar system. The rest that which we see is a two-dimensional projection like a live video or movie screen. Chapter 65. Afterlife and the Reprocessing Centers. Many souls are stranded on the other side of the veil, of what we call ghosts or spirits. Again, this is only the soul mind, the actual soul is somewhere else. These are mostly deceased humans that are now back in the fourth density aware, but still not awake. However, it is more than that, they are stuck between worlds because it is not yet time for them to be reprocessed. Most of the time they are stranded due to a shock or violent entry back into the fourth dimensional mind realm. They become stranded because their thoughts are locking into what just occurred to them and they reenact these thoughts in the mind realm where they cannot control them because they are still sleeping. These spirits often seem to be interacting in this 3D world, because their thoughts are still here and thus are being projected, yet they have no body anymore, it is only their soul mind. They remain at the lower fourth dimension, bound, yet they visualize themselves as still being here, but because of the veil that separates the two dimensions, those of the third dimension cannot see those in the fourth, most of the time. They are often in a very confused state of mind not realizing they are locked inside their own minds, and trapped. Not even the gods of the other side can reason with them, so they remain trapped until a time where they can be removed and then sent back into the tunnel of light to be reprocessed. The clue is, the gods can easily control souls in the third dimensional realm, however the only way they can control souls in the fourth dimension is to deluge souls with thoughts that lead to an agenda. Like being in hell or even being in heaven. These are things can be reproduced in the fourth dimension, but again none of it is real. So yes indeed, even in the afterlife, the soul is still sleeping, and the soul mind is dreaming, yet still being aware. So, as it says, in death the dead know not anything. And that is so true for those who are still asleep. Now some have even entered a hell in various degrees in the fourth density and they believe they are being tormented all because their accumulative thoughts have created this illusion. Others have entered what they believe is heaven, all because their accumulative thoughts have convinced them it is so. Yet again, it is all an illusion of the mind, the soul is still sleeping and trapped in their own mind realm. The gods not only want us in the third dimension, but they want to be here because they can control this world as a god, whereas on the other side the controls are tricky at best. 66. Tickets please all aboard to earth. Not all the gods incarnate, there are those who still operate from the other side. When people expire from here, they are often met by these gods and often they believe these are angels or past family members that have moved on into the light. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, if one is met by a deceased family member or loved one and they are coerced to follow into the light, it means you are coming back here for another round trip. The chances are poor that it was truly a family member or loved one unless they were already compromised. 
otherwise they are simply an alien taking the projection of your loved one and deceiving you with their image and voice. You will be compromised into believing that coming here is all about paying karmic debt, which in truth can never be paid. Because one broken law only creates new broken laws continually. Once the law is broken it can never be justified. Now the mystery to this story is, we are here to overcome the dark powers, this is true, but we are also being controlled by nefarious entities that do not want us to overcome anything. They want to be able to send us back here eternally and will do whatever it takes to convince us that this is our home. If we do not awaken to what is transpiring that the world we exist in is a lie, we will be overcome by the artificial spirit and we will believe that we are to return for our own good. As if we are evolving or something, yet none of it is true. We are not here to evolve per se, especially under their agenda, we are here to learn to separate from this evolutionary hell by changing our internal being pushing through the dead cocoon, into the magnificent butterfly. As stated earlier I reference the progression from the ape to the man and how it is like what we are going through. However, the big difference is, what we change below is automatically changed above. There is no progression for us, the entire process is happening all at once, but we do not realize this at this level. Remember what was shown earlier, that we lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. The good fruits we obtain always remain with us at the higher level. When we produce fruits, they are attached to our divine spirit automatically. It is not an evolvement, it is an instant attribute. The idea of evolving is thrown out the window when one recognizes the progression of humanity has never changed, it continues to enter evil and wickedness seemingly, eternally. With all the time that we have had before us, looking at our world now, if this is evolvement, we have done a terrible job, because it more appears as if we have gone backwards. We cannot evolve in the flesh, we can only evolve in spirit. Our world is in a horrible mess, because the same gods are still ruling over us, using the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, playing their enmity game, which keeps us forever stuck in their power, until we awaken to go home. Chapter 67 the Great Illusion and the Watchers. It is important that everyone realize why I found it necessary to expose this scandal of the ages. I found it necessary to open the mind to realize what we have been allowing or accepting in this world has been a cocktail of compromise. The world in general is totally unaware of the strange diabolical controls that are going on behind the scenes to force everyone into compliance via the dark way. Although most understand that something is terribly wrong with this world, few are ever willing to admit how deep this rabbit hole goes. As stated earlier, the accuracy of this work is always up for debate because we just do not have all the facts, this has been one aspect to living in this realm that should at least reveal to us that something is gravely wrong. I do believe whether the thesis I have given is exact or not. There is enough information here to at least begin to open the mind that our world is under the control of the fallen angels, and this was part of the message that Christ came to reveal to all of us. Isn't it interesting how Christ could state several times in different settings, that neither he nor his father have anything to do with this world, and yet so many believe this is their world, that they are in a battle of wits against the devil from hell to continue to control this world that each believe belongs to them. John 18:36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Zionists, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Again, as stated above, the term for the world here is universe. Neither Christ nor the further are part of this entire dark-minded universe. It is much more than this world. We are existing in a great illusion a dream world, and a virtual reality, and scarcely does anyone understand this except the few that have recognized the science behind this world. Even today true scientists realize that the five senses which gives us what we believe to be a reality is simply an electronic circuitry board that is pretty much like a computer. As example, our eyes are what gives us what appears to be external light. That which we see and observe, 
we believe is outside of us. This is simply not the truth, there is nothing outside of us. Because there is nothing here. Everything we observe is coming from within the computer brain. Light, matter, time and space is all within us. The eyes are simply projecting it onto our awareness. Lucifer controls the human brain mind function and he lives within us also. The difference is, the father and mother, via Christ, live within us so via the spirit. And Lucifer lives within our reptilian brain. The five senses are fake, there is no reality about them. If we did not receive the electric signals that allow these senses to function, nothing would be here. If we went inside our brain and disconnected, sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste, what would we have left? Well first, the only thing that would remain is consciousness awareness. We could still think, as Descartes March 1596, February 1650, said, I think therefore I am. Interesting thing about Descartes is he understood that our world was an illusion. Of course, he was ridiculed also as being insane for believing this. Outside of consciousness awareness we would be existing in an empty black space floating in the ethers. I want you to visualize that for a second. There would be nothing outside of you, nothing external if the electrical output of the senses were blocked. It would all be gone. You might want to believe it is still there, but it isn't and it never was. All sensations are programmed within you to accept what is being sent through you. It is called fourth dimensional mind programming. As an example, if you removed all your files out of the computer, the computer would be useless, it would not function. Removing the senses, we take for granted is like removing files out of the computer. Picture in your mind that all sensations are gone. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything, and you can't taste it, smell it, or even touch it. Nothing will allow you to be aware of what is around you, because nothing is there. It is an artificial spirit. It is not real. It is an illusion of the mind. This is an undebatable fact that what we call reality is simply a program within attached to our consciousness from another realm called, imitation. We are existing in what is called a simulated world. And what is so strange is, we are not that far away with computer technology to create such a world for ourselves to experience right now. If we can create this type of simulation, how do you know that you are not in such a simulated world today? Everything that we believe is real including death, life, the world, planets, moons, Stars, galaxies are all simply artificial creations inside a mind realm that we believe is real, but it isn't. We believe we witness time and space. We think there are vast distances in space that are now mind boggling. Yet from where do we receive our perspective? If you placed an ant on a football field, and you began to walk the entire hundred yards, to the ant it would appear as miles not yards. And yet it is same football field. A movie that came out years ago, called, Men in Black, had a scene where a specific galaxy was inside a marble that was set inside a cat's collar. An entire galaxy inside a marble? Perspective is a strange word because it can be modified based on how one sees the situation. What we call distance, length, height. And width is not based on anything more than the perspective of our surroundings, which have all been programmed to elicit a virtual reality. If we were one inch tall then everything around us would take on a completely different reality. If we were a hundred feet tall, again, things would be completely altered in our perception. In a simulation, you can recreate a different perspective from a single perception. A simulation can recreate an entire vista of spectrum, and yet it is all nothing more than camera, lights and mirrors. Let's say you were a programmer for computers. Obviously, you would consider yourself to be of a higher realm than the computer. You can program the computer to create a simulation of what you are doing at that very moment, yet you are not inside the computer, you are in another world programming the computer from the outer realm. You might say, where you are as the programmer is the fourth dimension, where the functioning of the computer is, is the third dimension. 
Now you can program the computer to simulate thought, you can control it to simulate touch, taste, smell, hearing and sight. A programmer can do many things to simulate reality. But the computer that is simulating this world is not in the same dimension as the programmer. Now being the programmer you decide to meld your consciousness into the simulation you have just created in the computer, it would appear now that you are of the realm of the computer. Your consciousness, as your mind will all be affected via the simulation. After a while being locked into this simulated world, it will begin to appear very real. And the longer you are enmeshed into this new world, it will begin to become your only reality. I realize what I am saying may seem radical, but in truth it is just quantum science. We are living in a world that soon we will have the ability, technology and knowledge to recreate a simulated universe as a virtual reality. We are not the yet, but we are very close. We already live in a world where technology is being used by nearly everyone, and it is expanding every day. Cell phones, computers, iPads and Bluetooth, etc. We are completely wrapped around technology as a race. Where do you think it will end? Even online there are dozens if not hundreds of games now popping up that can recreate a different type of lifestyle. Now of course our technology has not expanded to the point where we can be absorbed into the actual gaming mechanism, but we are only years away from that occurring at the current progression and speed of technological advances. Very shortly simulations could be created that will appear so real you will not believe that you are being simulated. A little more time after that, there could be simulations where you won't be able to tell the difference between this world and that world. The idea that is a race of people that we would never go that far is ridiculous, we do, as we have always done, because we are curious. It is our innate curiosity to experience things that are different or unique, which will always cause humans to view things differently. And as they say, curiosity killed the cat. Even now we live in a world where unmanned drones can fight wars. This would have seemed impossible or even insane to contemplate many years prior. Now the question you must ask yourself that leading scientists ask themselves every day. If we can create simulations like this in the future, how do we know we are simply not part of a simulation now? We know time and space is not real. It is only an awareness created by the construct of the world that we appear to exist within. Like in the movie The Matrix, when Neo was taken inside the Matrix controls and he learned that the real world was in the future, but the Matrix version was recreated to allow one to experience the past or what was simulated as the past. More and more we are living in a society where our toys are becoming our gods. You can't even walk past people anymore and not see them playing with their tech toys. Whether texting, talking on gadgets, watching their handheld videos, we are becoming a mesmerized race of robots. People are spending more time on computers, millions are staring at their screens in whatever format for hours and hours every single day. We are being robotized. Communication is a lost art. People do not know how to communicate with others anymore. Even in family households, often to communicate they will text one another in different rooms of the house to ask or tell what is needed for the other to know. What has happened? We are becoming manipulated into a technology that is controlling our minds, actions and life. As we get deeper into this technology, as it expands, do you really think the people will decide to stop and not go any further? Absolutely they will not. Sooner or later, we are going to unmask simulated worlds via technology that is mind-blowing if time would allow. The problem is Lucifer will never allow us to move into the future like we have done in the past. It all that now programmed, there is no future in this movie. If people could walk into these virtual worlds, their businesses will be directed via this false reality and their contact with other humans will all become a thing of the past. We will connect online, no one will have to leave their homes or cubicle for anything. One will be able to eat, drink and sleep from one place. They will be able to simulate exercise, and human activity and yet never move an inch. Sooner or later people will be nothing more than a simulated electrical spark as they interact with the simulated world. 
what did I just say? Isn't this what we really are anyway when we remove the facade called the human body? Do you think this is far-fetched, that this is unreal? My friends we are already almost there in our own sense of reality, and the people are already being prepared for this fall into deep illusion. A fall that has already happened long ago, we just forgot. We are simply recognizing now what led us to where we are today, which already happened in the past. Now I am about to ask you the one million dollar question. Is it possible this is exactly how Lucifer created these simulated worlds? Is this how he deceived us to play the game? Is this how they became gods over humanity? How do we know right now that we are not living in a higher dimensional world but we decided to use this technology to create simulated worlds where we could experience them as if really being there? How do we know the third dimension is nothing more than a simulated world that we are projected within via the mind? You can't be sure, can you? Yet the facts seem to reveal, that we are being projected via the mind awareness into a simulation and this world and universe is all in our computerized brain. Science has revealed, as stated earlier that when we use our eyes to see, there is nothing outside of us, we are simply seeing what is being projected from the mind. If you do not believe me, do the leg work and prove to yourself what many scientists are saying about our simulated world. Is this how Lucifer has created these worlds? Is this the best he could come up with? Is this the artificial reality that he brought into existence, that Jesus the Christ revealed in the lost books of the Nag Hammadi? Did we fall from another higher world by entering a simulation which projects us into these false worlds? What are aliens? Who is it that millions of people see flying around in spacecraft that appear and disappear instantly? How can these aliens abduct people? How are they able to enter homes right through walls and windows? Enoch once wrote several books dealing with what are called, the Watchers. We were told that we are being watched, that there are beings that can watch everything that is occurring in this world, and sometimes these beings even interact with the people. The question is, who are these beings? Where are they really from? No one seems to understand where they come from, and who they really are. These aliens claim to come from other worlds, and yet they vanish out of existence as if not really being here in the first place. It is time to reveal the truth of the fruit in the garden. What was the knowledge of good and evil or God and devil? My friends, the knowledge of the tree of death was simply that a simulated world was created and we were asked if we would like to play the game. When we accepted, we were then lost to all reality, and now subject to the game programmers. And every time we die, we are released from the simulation, and then we are asked if we want to play again. This is all part of the law these fallen entities must follow. They must have our acceptance. Therefore, we are under such strong delusion to return to this world in what we call reincarnation which is re-simulation. We are tricked, trapped and deceived into thinking we must return to fulfill some contract. This contract was what the fallen gods made with us called the Old Covenant. It is a decree that we are forever bound unto death because we accepted their forbidden knowledge. The sad part is, we never fully awakened from the simulation, we have become so accustomed to it that we believe it is our only reality even when we exit this simulated experience. Christ told John in the Lost Gospel that the simulation or artificial spirit is so strong that many are forced to return and be reborn here because they believe in this world. My friends, the gods are frauds, they are no greater than computer programmers. And we are those who fell into this trap because of our curiosity to experience lower dimensions called, simulations. Our experience in this fallen world is teaching us the non-reality of this realm, because we are constantly moving through cycles that keep repeating what we have already done. What is truly happening? We are in a flight simulator. We are being educated using this simulation that Lucifer believes he is using to control us for all eternity, but we are here to break free from the controls. Not so much to fly jets, but to become eternal beings of love by having to resist the friction of this world that is at war with our very souls. 
it is time to learn the real reason we are here, and why the father and mother have allowed this. If you have not read them yet, it is important that you read all my books, all seven of them, even the Time Loop Chronicles, fiction series because they will begin to paint a picture that is so obvious that one will be forced to awaken. Read these books repeatedly, and the more that you read them, you will begin to feel the contact of our real father and mother, and begin to awaken to the simulation and who the false gods really are, that rule this world. This is their, alien seed the virtual world of gods and humans. Truth is never easy to accept, it grains against the internal lie that we have fed on our entire lives, but once we awaken, it will sustain us in all things. Thus, the truth will set you free. Chapter 68 Message from the Father and Mother I know my children this has all been so very difficult, but my promise stands, I will never leave you or forsake you for any reason or cause. I realize the difficulty your progression has been through life with all the deceptions and false bearers of iniquity. However, my child, my plan is perfect even though while living within this dark world, it seems so futile. Yet there is a glory which is being manifested within you by your many sufferings. I didn't send my firstborn to save you, you do not need saving, I sent him to awaken you to the truth of who you are and where you came from and why you are going through this draining, as even he did. So be of good cheer my child, I am always with you. Like the suffering of a mother in labor to bring forth that magnificent bounty, the pain is unbearable, but the reward is always glorious. Thereby, you know the truth, we are suffering in travail for you so that you will be reborn unto glory. This is our desire and so shall it be manifested with unconditional ever-loving attention, with great uncompromised and unconditional love. Your Father and the Mother